The esteemed Dr. Thomas Morstead entered the cell of the anomaly. He'd been warned and even chastised by his colleagues. But who in the Foundation could tell him what to do? He was the best at what he did, maybe the greatest in the whole history of the Foundation. As he entered the room, SCP-049 bid him welcome, cordial as always. So polite, in fact, that you'd never guess you were talking to a killer. Dr. Morstead knew the truth of what he was dealing with, but he also believed he could get through to 049. Calm him, exercise the devil from him. It was the meeting of two great minds, one of them human, one of them part human, part something that has never been clear. It was to be a battle of wits, and like so many great battles, this one would turn into a massacre. Before we get to that fateful meeting, there are some things you should know about the anomaly known as SCP-049. If you saw him in the street, the first thing you'd think of is playing, because 049 always looked the same, a man dressed in black robes with a plague doctor's mask. But this wasn't a costume that could be taken off. In fact, it wasn't a costume at all. It was him. The robes had grown out of him like an exoskeleton. That horrible mask with the pointed nose wasn't covering his face. It was his face. A kind of shell that had seemingly sprouted from bone. The first reports came during World War II. In a picturesque town in the south of France called Montauban, people had begun going missing. Children disappeared from their beds in the middle of the night and weren't seen again. Adults went to the market and never returned. Local authorities searched high and low. They scoured nearby woods and dragged the rivers, but nothing was found. Because what was happening wasn't criminal, there was no clue they could stumble upon or eyewitness who would break the case. No, this was something else. Something that the townsfolk could never understand. Word spread, and that's when a search and discovery team was sent from the Foundation. It was a cold, dark night in January of 1941 when the team found what they were looking for. They walked through the open door of a small house located not too far from the Grand Chateau de Richelieu to find a masked man sitting next to an open fire. And he wasn't alone. The floor around him looked like it was moving. Upon closer inspection, the team saw that the floor was covered with writhing, grasping bodies. It's patience, as it called them. Bienvenue chez moi, said the thing. Welcome to my home. Those so-called patients crawled towards the team, intent it seemed to cause harm. The hostiles, now known as SCP-049-2s, were deemed dangerous and had to be eliminated. A sight, it seemed, that didn't bother 049 in the slightest. It just sat there, occasionally looking up from writing notes in a leather-bound book as his patients were gunned down. Once the carnage ended, it simply closed its book, stood up, and allowed itself to be escorted away. And that's the story of how 049 ended up at the facility, becoming a guest of sorts, staying in a standard secure humanoid containment cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19. The few that came into contact with 049 remarked that it was a pleasure for them, with its impeccable manners, vast knowledge of medicine and human anatomy, sharp tongue, and stinging wit. They almost became spellbound listening to it, caught in the throes of its charms until, with the simple touch of its hand, it would drain the life from them. That's why SCP-049 was classified as a Euclid. That's why armed guards were always stationed outside its cell. It's why doctors took great precautions when in its presence, and it's why Dr. Morstead should have known better. Remember, when 049 was discovered in France, it willingly went with the team, like it was happy it had been found, as if it had planned its own capture. When it arrived at the facility, it didn't act like it was contained against its will. It was like it was returning home. Initial findings as to the biology of 049 were that it didn't require any sustenance at all, not even water. It seemed content to be left alone with its notebooks. It did not object when it was asked if it could share some of its notes and gladly handed over its journals. But upon examination, it was discovered that they were written in the language that no linguist or cryptologist has so far been able to translate. It's apparent that 049 derives much satisfaction from seeing so-called experts struggle over its text. Unable to read those notes, a long line of doctors visited 049 in its cell, each fascinated by what they beheld. It was learned that it has traveled the globe. It speaks many languages, but prefers to speak what it calls les langues de l'amour, French. It asked for only one thing, warm-blooded animals. The facility agreed to supply 049 with various kinds, including rabbits, cattle, and even an ape on one occasion. Just like with humans, it could kill the animals with a mere touch of its hand. 
sucking the life right out of them. But that wasn't even the most incredible part. Soon those animals would rise again, as if reanimated by 049. They would become, for all intents and purposes, the living dead. And they were hostile. After several unfortunate incidents, they were taken from the cell the moment they arose and disposed of in the incinerator. This was not to the liking of 049, who would claim it had cured the animals. For it, the world was sick. It saw plague and pestilence everywhere, and the meaning of its existence was to rid the world of disease. Humans, it said, contained a virus and had to be cleansed. In the first days after arriving at the facility, 049 didn't seem to pose a threat to humans. He was quite friendly, in fact. It seemed aware of the fear it caused in staff and would often go out of its way to make them feel comfortable and safe. This was a ruse, of course, or a canard, as 049 liked to say. It had no intention to help humans. Hmm. No, it had come for humans. It wasn't trapped. It had set a trap. One of the first people to truly upset 049 was Dr. Raymond Hamm, a well-respected physician that had twice been a contender for the Nobel Prize for his more mainstream work. What had confused Dr. Hamm the most was not 049's clothes like exoskeleton, or even his ability to reanimate the dead, but the bag that it used. 049 was somehow able to pull a seemingly endless supply of surgical tools from that bag. Sometimes it would even pull out objects that were somehow larger than the bag itself. It was as if the bag connected to somewhere else. And that's what Dr. Ham wanted to talk about on that fateful day. With 049 on one side of the cell and Dr. Ham on the other, he asked, how is it that you can produce a great quantity of tools from that bag? I've observed you, and it seems to me that you are doing the impossible. Dear doctor, replied 049, the scourge, the great dying, cannot be fought with a handful of toys. My bag is merely the product of my imagination. It gives me what I require. You, dear sir, it seems, are limited by your imagination. It stopped for a second or two and stared at Dr. Ham. I detect you are unwell, it said, in a voice not as amiable as before. It's just a cold, said the doctor. Ah, just a cold. If you had seen what I have seen, you would not utter such insulting words. Dr. Ham pulled out some papers from a briefcase and approached 049, holding them close enough so it could read them. You see, said Dr. Ham, pointing to the results on the paper. Those animals you say you cured, they were not diseased. They were perfectly healthy before they died. And your so-called cure, it turned them into something quite terrible. We found that if they were left alone, they began to eat each other, and then themselves. 049 did not respond, and after a brief pause said only, A good day to you, doctor. Please close the door on your way out. You should get some rest. Ham refused to go and instead turned the conversation to this real interest, the bag, demanding that 049 let him see inside of it. Very well, doctor, 049 said, in private. 049 began to pull a series of long metal poles out of its bag, followed by a rolled up curtain that it hung between them, creating a kind of medical tent around Dr. Ham. It seemed to stare for just a moment into the observation camera outside of itself before whipping the curtain shut. Dr. Ham was discovered three hours later, crawling around the floor of 049's cell, now another mindless undead. When he was retrieved by security, 049 didn't even look up from his notebook. Dr. Ham didn't get the incinerator treatment, but he did receive a fatal dose of drugs, a mercy. A removal team was sent to 049's cell, but it had said there was no need for special extraction techniques. It would go willingly, wherever they wanted to go. It was not, it said, an enemy of the people. The Hippocratic Oath forbids me to hurt a human being, it said while walking to the interrogation center. My only desire is to offer you my services and expertise. The floors and walls of the interrogation center room were painted a bright white. Even the table was white, which contrasted with 049, a mass of black sitting in the middle of the room. During the interrogation, it refused to admit or even accept that it had killed Dr. Ham. I cured him. I removed the pestilence from his body, it said. It was later asked if it regretted its actions, to which it replied, Well, good sir, one always regrets the loss of a colleague for any reason, but I stand by my actions. The pestilence must be abated before it is too late. Every two weeks from that point, 049 was given animals. The scientists at the facility observed it time and again, touching the animals, killing them, before producing a saw or a scalpel and opening them up. Organs would be carefully removed with perfect precision. It was astounding to even trained surgeons just how talented 049 was. 
I require a close relative of yours, said 049 one day to a young doctor, who expressed shock that it was asked for one of the doctor's family members. I mean a great ape, said 049, not your dear aunt. There were several instances of 049 displaying a crude sense of humor. Staff would almost forget that the thing that they were talking to wasn't human, almost. And it was Dr. Thomas Morstead that had supplied the great apes, orangutans in fact that had been rescued from the rainforests of Borneo, only to be taken to 049 South. Then one day something changed. 049 told Dr. Morstead that its work was done, that it accomplished what it had wanted to do, and could someone remove the cured animal from itself. I think you'd find that it's quite the work of art. A triumph, 049 said through the intercom. When the removal team entered the cell, they found the orangutan, or what was left of it. It was lying in the corner of the cell. The top of its skull had been removed, leaving its brain exposed. On its face was the expression of relaxation, and from its mouth it issued very soft squeaks, like that of an infant. 049 said, Tell Dr. Morstead that its rage mechanism no longer exists. I've removed the amygdala and made some changes to the hypothalamus and limbic system. It is cured and quite harmless. The next day, Dr. Morstead announced that he wanted to visit 049's cell himself after which he heard a chorus of disapproval from his colleagues, all telling him that 049 was now too dangerous. Dr. Ham was sick, replied Morstead, and 049 has assured us that he would never take another human life. He's never lied to us, and I'm going to take him at his word. It appeared that 049 had created the perfect specimen, so what was next? Dr. Morstead had to know. Everyone is sick, 049 told Dr. Morstead after the two had talked for a couple of minutes. The great pandemic has started. Fear not, doctor. I have a cure. No longer will you humans spread your disease. I'm afraid you are wrong, replied the doctor. This pandemic you speak of does not exist. We can happily live with our pathogens. We have done so for millennia. Dr. Morstead became angry that he couldn't get through to 049. I'm afraid you are suffering from paranoia. It is you who need to be cured. You have no idea, said 049, standing up. What are you doing? shouted Morstead. You promised you wouldn't hurt a human again. I'm not hurting you. I'm healing you, 049 said and leapt across the room in a flash. Placing a hand on the doctor's head, Morstead slumped to the ground. They were being watched in the observation room, and this had gone too far. He had to be moved to the containment cells, permanently. Mobile Task Force Epsilon 11 was right on the scene and burst through the door. Now imagination, 049 said to himself. Those humans have no imagination at all. He began walking towards the task force who opened fire on the anomaly, but the bullets bounced off its black coat and mask. SCP-049 calmly touched each of the members of the task force one by one, draining the life from them. The last one standing stopped firing and attempted to run, but again 049 leapt across the room, black cape billowing out behind him, and gently touched the man causing him to drop to the floor. 049 stepped over the bodies of the fallen team and walked out of the containment cell. The full details of what happened next are available only to the O5 Council, what are sometimes called the Overseers. The redacted report that is available reads, Standard Secure Humanoid Containment Cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19, Subject, SCP-049, Date of Breach, Redacted, Euclid Class SCP-049 Breach Cell and subsequently gained access to adjoining rooms and nearby buildings. Breach lasted approximately three days and five hours. Total casualties? Redacted. With redacted number of survivors requiring incineration therapy. Course of Action. Department of Science Alchemy Division suggested injecting anti-transmogrified disinfectant into Class D former prisoners who were transported to site and allowed them to come into contact with SCP-049. SCP failed to reanimate injected prisoners and cure them. SCP-049 acknowledged this failure and surrendered to Mobile Task Force Alpha-1. SCP-049 then requested to be contained. Present containment under responsibility of Redacted, Redacted. Present location of SCP-049, Redacted. This is impossible! The SCP site director wasn't normally a calm or cheerful man, but the researcher had rarely seen him as angry as he was right now. His face turned a deep beet red as he scanned the documents on his desk before he asked how months of valuable research on this subject had suddenly gone blank. The data was completely gone. The researcher gulped nervously, hoping a demotion wasn't in his future, and nodded. How could this be possible? This was an experienced researcher who should have been taking all of the necessary precautions. 
Could the being they were studying somehow have erased all these documents himself? That's just what the researcher had been trying to find out for months, with hours and hours spent trying to learn the extent of its abilities. Well, where are they? The site director asked. I want everything you have! The researcher dropped a printout of their research on the mysterious subject's abilities on the director's desk. Every relevant line read, Data lost. The director let out a deep sigh. He wanted to hear everything the researcher knew. Well, everything he could remember, at least, from the beginning. The researcher sat down and began to relay everything he could about SCP-343, which some of the other researchers had started to refer to by the nickname, God. SCP-343 was first sighted in Prague, just an unassuming older man wandering the streets. He seemed completely normal to everyone who passed him by until he decided he was tired of staying on the ground. An SCP agent stationed in the area noticed the old man disappear from the streets, as if he was blinking out of existence, only to appear on a rooftop nearby. The local SCP teams were marshaled, and they had soon tracked down what seemed to be a very powerful specimen. But SCP-343 didn't seem concerned. He reacted calmly when detained by the Foundation and went with them willingly. He was detained in a standard holding cell for interrogation and examination, but he seemed completely at ease with his sudden confinement. It would soon become clear that this ordinary old man was anything but. Doctors Beck and Nidlovu was brought in to consult on the SCP's classification, and that's when the first anomalies began. Their assessments matched initially, but when it came time to describe him physically, things took a strange turn. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features. Caucasian in appearance. Dr. Nidlovu was confused by what Dr. Beck was describing in his report. This man was clearly black. The two doctors quarreled, unable to square their differing perceptions. They decided to bring in a third impartial view to settle it, their fellow researcher Dr. Wan. She didn't take long before coming back with her assessment. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features, Asian in appearance, possibly Chinese. Whatever SCP-343 was, he seemed to be perceived by each staff member as close in appearance to their own race. But that was only the start of the anomalies surrounding the old man in the holding cell. Dr. Beck started making regular visits to the mysterious man, and in their first interview, he asked the old man who he was and how he came by his abilities. The old man had a simple response. I created the universe. Dr. Beck stifled a laugh and decided to indulge the old man's delusion. It was a fascinating claim, but could he prove it? Without another word, SCP-343 got up from his chair, laughed, and turned around and walked through the solid wall in the holding cell and disappeared. Dr. Beck was about to hit the panic button and marshal the facility's security to find him when the strange man reappeared, walking through the solid wall. The only thing that was different? He was holding a hamburger, which he sat down and enjoyed. The facility quickly went on lockdown, and a full investigation was done into how SCP-343 breached containment. But there was no evidence of any security breach, no failures in containment, and no evidence of any other cells failing. SCP-343 hadn't broken through the security, he had just ignored it, as if it wasn't there at all. When questioned about how he had gone on his hamburger run, he simply repeated his belief that he was God, in between bites of his fast food treat. This would be far from the only time strange things happened around SCP-343. SCP containment cells are as secure as they need to be, but even the least strict containment isn't known for its decor. Which is why Dr. Beck was in for a surprise the next time he paid visit to SCP-343. The bare-bones cell now looked like a comfortable home, decorated in old English fashions. The scientists assumed that SCP-343 had been making many more trips out of his cell to get accessories to feel more at home. But that didn't explain all the changes to the cell. No one could explain how he had installed a roaring fireplace in the containment cell, and everyone who entered could swear the cell looked many times bigger than any other cell in the facility. SCP-343 wasn't just breaking containment, he now seemed to be breaking the laws of physics in the facility. The rules of the SCP containment facility didn't seem to be a concern to SCP-343, but there was one thing he didn't seem to want to do, escape. 
After every sudden exit, he would always return to his personal cell and treat it as his home. When interviewed by staff members, he was polite but vague, and everyone seemed to enjoy talking to him. It was decided to keep him on site, not attempt to increase his security, but restrict access and keep his room guarded at all times to ensure only researchers with level 3 access and above were allowed to meet with him. But God works in mysterious ways. Minimal Security Site 17 was one of the least restrictive SCP containment sites, hosting anomalies that could be safely contained and weren't likely to mount violent escapes. But as in every SCP facility, security was still taken seriously and only those with proper clearance could interact with the subjects. So why did SCP-343 seem impossible to guard? While only level 3 clearance and above were allowed in, the guards assigned to protect the entrance all seemed to fall down on the job. Security Officer James, who was supposed to be keeping people out of SCP-343's cell, had instead let in multiple visitors, in addition to dropping in several times himself. When questioned on why he had gone against orders and done so, he simply replied that 343 seemed lonely and was so happy every time he got company that it just seemed like the right thing to do. The security guard was reassigned and new ones were brought in, but history repeated itself. Guards were given stricter instructions to minimize exposure, but SCP-343's presence always seemed to influence them anyway. His containment cell was a revolving door, with staff members at the facility entering regularly for friendly conversations. Dr. Beck decided it was time to take matters into his own hands. He would meet with SCP-343 one-on-one -on -one and express how dangerous these security breaches were. He would try to convince the mysterious being that he needed to stop influencing the minds of the guards watching him, or the facility would have to look into new measures to contain him. Dr. Beck entered the containment cell and had a long conversation with SCP-343, and when he emerged, he had a big smile on his face like he had just finished a reunion with an old friend. He gave the current guard a friendly clap on the back and told him not to worry so much about security. After all, nothing bad was going to happen from letting people at the facility visit SCP-343, right? He wasn't dangerous in any way. He also said that security should bring him anything he requests so he would feel less need to leave his cell. Minimal Security Site-17 soon became a model SCP facility with morale being the highest of any site, with most giving the credit to the presence of SCP-343. Employees generally make daily visits to his chamber, and he seems to have an encyclopedic knowledge of anything they want to talk about, including things he should have no way of knowing. Guards no longer quit their posts or break protocol, as their only real duty is to keep track of who meets with SCP-343 so they can be interviewed and debriefed after. Everyone's conversation is different, but they all report being in a better mood after leaving than when they came in. No further information is available on SCP-343's origins, the full extent of his powers, or whether he is telling the truth about being the god who created the universe. The site director rubbed his temples after hearing the researcher's explanation. So what you're telling me is that we have an uncontained, highly powerful SCP that has not only been breaking containment whenever it wants, but has managed to destroy all the files regarding the research on it. The researcher's answer was yes. However, the situation at Site-17 seemed to be stable, and they had come up with a plan that should help to maximize the positive effect SCP-343 has on the facility. They were even hypothesizing that staff from other sites and even certain anomalies could be pacified by 343's presence. The site director wasn't impressed, though. He wanted the researcher to go back to the drawing board and redo the research. After all, if all the files were blank, how could they ever learn how to properly contain it? That's what the C and SCP stood for, after all. Containment. The researcher finally had to stand to the director, though, and told them that it wasn't a good idea that they had already tried everything to contain SCP-343, but that it wasn't that he broke containment. It was as if he didn't even acknowledge that an attempt had been made to contain him. He was omnipotent, aware of things he shouldn't, and able to do things that broke the laws of physics without breaking a sweat. There was no evidence that this was God, the creator of the universe as he claimed to be, but there also wasn't any evidence yet to conclusively prove he wasn't. The researcher's best guess was that this was a powerful reality bender whose abilities knew no limits, and that the only reason he was staying in the facility was because he wanted to, and doing anything to change that might cause him to change his benevolent ways. 
The director sighed. As much as he hated to admit it, his researcher was making good points. He wanted to meet SCP-343 personally, but did he need to know anything first? Well, sir, the researcher replied, he likes hamburgers, but beyond that, he'll take care of the rest. He's right there where we left him, in his home, waiting for his next guest. You've been walking for days. Your body aches. You're dripping with sweat from the heat of the sun bearing down overhead. And yet you're wrapped up in layers upon layers of clothing. Even your face is covered. And you're wearing thick black goggles so that not a single centimeter of your body is exposed. Your journey has been long, and you feel like you might die from exhaustion or from overheating due to these multiple layers of clothes. But dying is better than being exposed. You saw it happen when your entire team changed. The light cannot be trusted, not even for a fraction of a second. It's been like this for years. You've learned and survived through painful experience. Many of those you used to know cannot say the same. You've been alone for so long. You might have given up all hope if it wasn't for the distress signal coming from a nearby SCP Foundation containment facility, Site 46. Any kind of survivors would be better than nothing, no matter what kind of sorry shape they were in, as long as they were still human. You find your way to an opening in the side of a mountain and slide into the cave, hoping you weren't spotted. The whole world is crawling with those things now. You can't let yourself be seen. As you trudge down the cave towards the entrance, you see what looks like a huge black snail trail splattered on the ground, leading into the facility. You try to avoid it and press on. You don't even need a key card to enter. The door has been left ajar. The facility reeks of those things, but you can't see any of them. You just hope they've moved on and left some human survivors in their wake. The place looks abandoned. Every step you take echoes through the empty halls. When you find that the elevator's out, you take the stairs all the way down to level B5, Keter Containment. Lucky for you, it seems all the cells are empty now. The horrors that were kept inside of them have all long since flown the coop. You keep following that slimy black trail until you find an abandoned office. There are no people here anymore. Just a broken barricade, some empty medicine bottles, and a bucket that the people inside the office had apparently been using as a toilet. You breathe a sigh of disappointment at finding no one alive here, but you're at least relieved to be out of the sun. You can finally remove your jacket and head wrap. With your uncovered eyes, you notice that a nearby computer terminal is still powered up. You sit down at the desk and turn on the monitor. Because of the emergency procedures put into place in a K-class scenario like this, safeguards no longer apply. You can access all the information you need, up to and including finding out what actually happened. In the dull glow of a nearby emergency light, you see a dark shape slumping through the halls in shadow. You tense up, then exhale as it slithers off into an adjoining hall. You're safe for now. The terminal has finally loaded and authenticated your access. You're staring at the file for SD Lock's proposal for SCP-001 when day breaks. It's the only name you can give the apocalypse your world is currently experiencing. This is one of the only anomalies in the entire history of the SCP Foundation to be given the Apollyon Containment class, meaning Containment is truly impossible. SCP-001 is the most dangerous enemy that the Foundation and planet Earth has ever faced. It's always been the principle of the SCP Foundation to battle in the dark so that the civilian world can thrive in the light. But now the light has become the enemy. Anyone exposed to any amount of sunlight for even the briefest period of time is subjected to the effects of SCP-001. And those effects are beyond horrifying. The SCP Foundation Administrator released an urgent memo telling Foundation personnel to make their way to Site-19 at all costs, because they need all the help they can get. Those exposed to SCP-001 in the process are no longer considered human. Their new designation is SCP-001-A. These new entities are to be avoided at all costs. 
But in case of emergencies, the administrator says it is permitted to cut off parts of your transformed comrades and eat them to avoid starvation. No attempt should be made to kill them, since you won't succeed. You'll just put yourself at risk. When the sun changed and became SCP-001, it instantly affected 6.8 billion innocent people. The second the visible light touched them, whether it was from the sun itself or even reflected off the moon, their bodies liquefied, melting like candle wax into puddles of living gelatinous slime. This effect isn't isolated to humans either. Any biological entity exposed to sunlight immediately underwent the same irreversible melting process into SCP-001-A, and the horror had only just begun. People transformed into SCP-001-A will remain shades of their former intelligence and personality. They may even try to will their new gooey mass into a shape resembling their original form. However, these individuals will lose their sense of self if they come into contact with other instances of SCP-001-A. When they come together, 001-A instances will bond on a molecular level, wading up into horrific giant blobs with only one purpose, integrating more matter into their bodies. That's why they have to be avoided at all costs. You continue to search the computer terminal for answers. Perhaps there was some kind of contingency plan put in place for this, some way to reverse the effects, or at least escape the nightmare Earth has become. Instead, you find a series of attachments linked to the SCP-001 file, detailing what seems to be the last days of the people who barricaded themselves in the facility. Most prominent among these were researcher Dr. Logan Igata, her partner Ari, a security officer named Commander Anad, and a few others. Dr. Igata had locked herself in the office, where she recorded her final messages to the world. In the first audio log, Dr. Igata and her companions seemed afraid, but hopeful that there may be some way out of this situation. Dr. Igata reported that most of the workers at the facility were transformed during the initial event. Their melted bodies had fused outside the facility, and now they were trying to bust their way back in. The defenses had held so far, though, and they seemed confident they would hold long enough for them to figure out a way to escape this awful situation. You open the second attachment, an incident report, and realize things may not have been as hopeful as Dr. Igata let on. She reported hearing the huge mass of melted creatures hammering on the door outside again, begging for them to come out and experience the sun with them. They wanted desperately to add to their ever-growing biomass. In order to experiment with what exactly would happen, they sent out one of their few remaining D-classes wearing a full protective suit. He didn't last long. The huge creature grabbed him with tentacles made of reconstituted flesh. It began ripping off his protective suit as he screamed for mercy. It was a monster made of dozens of people and animals. He could never overpower it. The second the sun touched his skin, he melted away and was absorbed by the great mass holding him in place. Guns were ineffective against these SCP-001-A super entities. Fire would do no good. It seemed that extremely low temperatures were the only way to slow the immense blobs down. And even then, not permanently. There was one ray of light in the darkness. The site director had a secret tunnel underneath his office, connected to a tram that could hopefully take them directly to Site-19 without risk of SCP-001 exposure. It was a good plan, and by far the best option they had available to them. But the best plans often don't work in practice. You open the next detachment on the terminal. This time, it's a video feed. You can actually see Dr. Logan Igata, and she looks harrowed by what she's experienced. As it turns out, while the others, including her partner Ari, attempted to escape through the tunnel, something had happened. Dr. Igata heard Ari's voice over her radio, but there was something wrong with it. It was too low, too guttural, and filled with gurgles. SCP-001 had gotten her. She was changed. The monster from above had crawled in through the ceiling. It had taken them, all of them, and converted them into something less than human. Any hope of escape now seemed gone. Ari told Dr. Igata that it would be fine, that it was such a bright, beautiful, sunny day outside, 
and she was wasting it locked up inside that office. She tormented Dr. Igata with her shared memories of picnics in the park on sunny days in the past. The monster with Ari's voice did everything it could to try to convince Dr. Igata to give up and join them, but she wasn't ready to go just yet. You look away from the screen when you hear a sound in the corner. You see a dark puddle of some unknown substance, and then some skeletal hands rising out of it. The hands are pulling themselves out of the puddle, followed by a skeletal face covered in matted hair. You have to stop yourself from screaming, until a flash from a nearby security light makes the figure disappear. It's a normal puddle once again. Your mind is playing tricks on you. You open the next attachment, another video, and see that Dr. Igata's condition has deteriorated. She looked pale, frantic, and thin. She was using a knife to draw her own blood onto a piece of blood-stained parchment covered in strange symbols. Igata ranted about her theory. What if 001 took the minds and bodies of its victims, but not their souls? Through performing some kind of arcane blood ritual, she hoped to at least rescue and keep the soul of Ari, even if her mind and body were lost. You open the next detachment. It seemed that Agata's ritual worked, but not in the way she hoped. The twisted soul of Ari, driven mad by SCP-001, had taken over the file. It begins corrupting the text of the SCP-001 file into crazy ranting about how futile it is to fight. It then cuts to an even more frightening video feed. Dr. Igata, in her sleep, tossing and turning in a makeshift bed in the corner of her office. The camera approaches her, in first person, and lingers over her sleeping body. An oily skeletal hand reaches past the camera and runs its fingers through Dr. Igata's hair. It's that exact same hand you saw reaching out of that black puddle earlier. You must have seen Ari's lingering spirit. With a lump in your throat, you open the next attachment and watch the video. You see Dr. Igata, now truly broken. She'd been haunted by Ari's demonic spirit for a long time now, and it has clearly taken its toll. She is waving around a handgun while she speaks. She now believes there is only one way to escape, but not like this. She doesn't want the gun to draw attention to her body. She doesn't want to become part of that mass, even if she is dead. She opens a drawer on her desk she's recording at and places the gun inside. Dr. Igata then apologizes to her loved ones who are likely long since dead or assimilated and turns off the recording for the last time. In that moment, you realize there's a single drawer in the desk in front of you. When you reach forward and open it, you see the same handgun Dr. Igata was holding is laying inside. You pick it up and study it, weighing your options. Perhaps there truly is no other way out. Then you see an update on the file. One more attachment has been added while you were studying the gun. You feel your heart pounding in your chest as you reach forward and open the attachment. The text has been changed entirely. The file on SCP-001 is now a poem, an ode to the sun, and to ultimate togetherness. Then a video file spontaneously opens itself on the screen. It's a video of you, shot from behind. You see those oily skeletal hands reaching for you in the dark, just like they did with Dr. Igata. In that moment, you panic and fire the gun behind you, hoping to scare off the spirit. Instead, the sound of the gunshots attracts something far worse. The immense blob of screaming, melted flesh charges towards the office. You try to barricade the door, but it is not enough. The flesh seeps and bursts through and grabs you in its meaty tentacles. You scream and try to escape, but it won't save you. Nothing will save you. The flesh carries you upstairs, out through the empty halls, out into the cave. You can see the light in the distance as the blob ferries you towards it. You won't be alone for much longer. In fact, you won't be alone ever again. We were a team, despite our differences, in spite of the terrible things they've done. We were still a team. That's not how the higher-ups saw it, though. No. The guys upstairs with their perfectly pressed shirts. For them, we were judged by our level of expendability, and they knew that our next mission was a death sentence. One by one, that thing took out my team, my friends, snapping their necks so quickly and with such ease that no sooner did I hear the scream, they were dead. We had been used. 
I'd been used. Delivered as prey to the Predator. A plot that was sanctioned by the bosses and approved with a blood-red stamp. Why did they do it? I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe that's something you can tell me after you hear how these so-called scientific men left us in the cell. And in the hands of SCP-173. For me, it had been the best of times before it became the worst of times. The best, because I'd quickly risen through the ranks of the facility. The worst, because, well, I'll get to that. I was never the best student. I finished high school by the skin of my teeth, and my job prospects looked bleak. But I was lucky, I guess. Or at least I thought so at the time. You see, I have an uncle Siegfried who did some work for the government. I never actually knew what he did, just that it was secretive work. I used to imagine he was some sort of super spy, so you can imagine how excited I was when he found out I needed a job and he offered to help me out. I couldn't believe it. I always thought he hated me. I'd overheard him telling my parents that I was a no-good deadbeat, but now he'd had a change of heart and was willing to take me under his wing. What would I get to do? Undercover intelligence gathering? International assassinations? Just you wait, he said. And that's how I found myself walking into a sprawling, futuristic-looking facility where they handed me a level one security clearance card with big, bold letters that read, Janitor. But I was happy. Just the word security clearance made me feel important, and it beat flipping burgers. I pushed mops, turned off lights, fired up generators, clocked in, and clocked out. But all that time, they must have been watching me, grooming me, waiting for the day they could throw me to the wolves. I should have known. I've always been an expendable kind of guy. After a few years, I was called to an office, and there was a man in a plaid shirt and kind of a tweed jacket that professors wear. He asked me, do you have any idea about what we actually do here? And to be honest, I didn't. I knew that there were many parts of the facility I couldn't enter. I imagined that down a maze of corridors were weapons being built, or prisoners being interrogated but I had no idea about the anomalies. How could I? Before I was told anything, I had to sign a bunch of forms. There were so many I thought I'd get to find out who really killed JFK. And while they didn't come out and say it, what I inferred was that if I ever talk about what happens at the facility to someone outside the facility, well, let's just say it's not the kind of thing they'd spell out on a piece of paper, but it involves padded cells and rusty tools. I wasn't scared though. I was part of something big something secret, and I loved it. So I signed my life away with no hesitation. Soon after, I was introduced to my first anomaly, the safe class, of course. They took me to an observation room, and from that room I could see into another room with a sign on the wall that read SCP-067. I just stood there, waiting for something to happen, when in walked another guy in a white lab coat. Welcome to your first anomaly, he said. Is it okay if I hook you up to this heart monitor? We want to gauge your reaction to what you see. All I can see, I told him, is an empty room with a table and what looks like a pen on top of some papers. Correct, he said, half smiling, as if I was some kind of idiot. That's SCP-067. I thought about telling him that if I needed years of training before I could see a pen, that I probably should have taken that fast food job. Could have been a shift manager by now. Then they brought a young chimpanzee into the room, small enough to be harmless. One of the guys forced a pen into the scared chimp's hand and something strange happened. It started scribbling. Nonsense at first, but suddenly it was sketching and drawing faster and faster. I could catch glimpses of words and images. By the time they dragged it out, it was flailing around like it was possessed. That pen has power, said the man in the lab coat. A power whose source or origin we don't fully understand. That's why we're here. That's why you are here. One of the guys in the other room held the chimp's drawing up to the window. It was a perfect sketch of the Tower of London, intricate and brilliant. Above the sketch was the title, Tower of London, Tudor Period, circa 1541. The year Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, lost her head on the chopping block. Underneath that, the chimp had written, Pity, she was no traitor. Take it from me, I was there. They didn't need to look at the heart rate monitor to see that I was shocked. That was far from the only anomaly I'd come into contact with and I must have been doing something right, because in time, I went from level one, to two, to level three security clearance, and that's when they made me a containment specialist. 
I won't bore you with all the details, but as you can guess, I dealt with the oh. containment of anomalies. A lot of my time was spent looking through small windows and cell doors, making sure that whatever was inside was still inside and still in one piece. Other times I worked with field agents when anomalies were brought in, a transition period that the arrested freaks didn't much like. There was one certain anomaly, though, that I was tasked to oversee on many occasions. I like to think of it as my pet, but in hindsight, I was its pet. This was SCP-173, something that was in what we call the Euclid class, a classification meaning that we don't fully understand it, but know it is very dangerous. We know it's intelligent, we know it's unpredictable, and we know it will kill. And for that reason, there's people tasked with containing it and keeping an eye on it at all times. At first glance, you wouldn't guess just how dangerous 173 is. You wouldn't think it's incredibly intelligent. In fact, you'd think the opposite. That's because it's more or less a walking slab of concrete and rebar with stunted limbs and traces of spray paint that give the impression of a dopey face. We have to enter its cell twice a week for cleaning duties. It leaves a disgusting, foul-smelling liquid on the floor, a reddish-brown substance that I can only describe as a mix of blood and waste products. Where that stuff comes from has remained a mystery since we first contained it in 1993. Going into the cell was always a three-man job, because, and this is maybe the weirdest part about 173, it can't move if human eyes are watching it. That's why you need at least two people watching it at all times. If you were in the room watching 173 by yourself and blinked, you'd be dead before your eyes opened. We don't know how it moves that fast, but in that fraction of a second, your neck is snapped so hard it's almost like being decapitated. I've seen the videos to prove it. All it took was a sneeze. He wasn't even finished getting the rest of the achoo out when there was a flash and his partner was left lying on the ground. His head twisted around the wrong direction. So, you can understand why we now require three men for any time we must enter 173's cell. Then, a few months ago, I was told that a long process would begin to train and re-educate some future Class Ds. Class Ds are mostly prisoners with lifelong sentences or those we've taken from death row and given a new lease on life. We were apparently understaffed, so why not employ these men whose lives had pretty much ended anyway? Mm. That was the rationale, or at least that's what they told me. I was told to train them on their new job, mopping up 173's mess, so that me and the rest of the containment specialists could focus on more important tasks. They hadn't been through the training I had, seen what I had seen. But after showing them the video of 173 nearly taking off a man's head, they were more than willing to follow the rules. They understood not to blink, or turn away or sneeze, and that any lapse in focus could lead to a violent death. So I started to show them the ropes, how we move as a team into the cell and always keep the others informed on what we're doing. 173 was always sitting in the corner of a cell, no expression on that crude face. But when we walked in its cell, I got the feeling it knew something had changed. I felt almost as if it was communicating with me, but I couldn't tell what it was trying to say. And then it happened. It was a Tuesday afternoon, three days from the last time we'd cleaned. As usual, 173 had covered the floor with that horrible liquid. We headed in to clean, my new team alert as always, and some of them cleaned while others kept their eyes focused on the thing in the corner. Things were going smoothly when we heard a noise I knew very well. It was the sound of the cell door locking. Someone must have screwed up. Hey guys, we're locked in here. I shouted through the intercom. Nothing. Guys, the damn door is locked. Nothing. I lost it a bit. Open the door, will you? Nothing. My team looked at me. The ones not on eye contact duty, that is. As if I should know what to do. Hoping that this had happened before and that there was some kind of standard plan to deal with it. There wasn't. We were always observed when in the room, and I knew that a technician couldn't accidentally lock the door. It was impossible. There were protocols. Someone had done this on purpose. The four of us sat in the corner of the room as far from 173 as possible, our eyes locked on it. It didn't move an inch as usual, just stood, staring at the wall as it always did. We stayed awake through the night, talking a little, holding on to the slim hope that something had gone wrong. But as night turned to day again, we all began to lose hope. We weren't sent here to clean. We were a test, totally expendable, lab rats. But I wouldn't go down without a fight. We couldn't just stay up forever, that was a death sentence. 
I suggested that two of us stand, one sit and rest, and one get some sleep. We take shifts. A couple hours on, a couple hours off. Hmm. Maybe we could show that we wouldn't give up, they'd have time to realize what they were doing was insane, call off the test, and come free us. We made it through a couple of shifts like this, and it seemed like we'd actually be able to make it another day or two, when everything went wrong. It was my turn to sit and rest when I heard the worst possible noise. Snoring. The con next to me was sleeping quietly, so it must be one of the standers. I glanced over for just a split second and saw both of them, leaning against the cell wall dozing. At the same time, I saw the flash. Crack. Snap. Pop. One after another, their necks were snapped. I'm not sure how it happened, but I was standing again, staring at 173, who was now in the corner, dead bodies with their heads twisted around, piled up in front of it. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't stare at this thing forever. I felt myself giving up. I lowered my head to the ground, and then finally broke my gaze, ready to die. And then, nothing happened. I slowly raised my head back up, and there it was. Its hideous face inches away from mine. It was then that I understood what we'd been containing, what we'd underestimated. I felt it again, like it was telling me something. It was telling me to close my eyes, to sleep. So I did. But as my eyes closed, I didn't see darkness. I saw 173, or something like it, but not in the cell. I saw it outside, in the world, standing over children sleeping in their beds, watching. I saw them hiding in the shadows, staring out at passers-by. Then I realized they weren't watching, waiting to pounce. No, they were hiding. My eyes popped open as the door opened and in rushed six security personnel. They took me outside, jabbed my leg with a syringe, injecting me with something as the world faded away. Incident report. Time and date redacted. Following the experimental forced interaction with Euclid class anomaly SCP-173, subject has ceased responding to external stimuli and appears to have taken on the traits and behaviors of the anomaly. Subject now spends entire day sitting in corner of cell staring at the wall. Staff are advised to proceed with caution when dealing with subject, as the only behavior they engage in is an attempt to strangle anyone who enters the cell. No treatments have shown any effectiveness, and subject will unfortunately require incarceration, likely forever. Working at the SCP Foundation might just be the most exciting job a person can ask for. And by exciting, we mean that if you work as an SCP field operative, researcher, or mobile task force member, you're much more likely to die a horrific death on the job than, say, a plumber. But at least you get the honor of proudly saying that you're the first line of defense between the normal world and the terrifying domain of the anomalous. Well, unless you're one of the IT guys. Then your work life is likely as tedious and uneventful as the computer tech guy working on the Geek Squad. But nothing is ever normal when it comes to the SCP Foundation, where even the person whose job is helping other staff members reset their email passwords may run into the supernatural. Welcome to the strange and frightening world of Pattern Screamers, and specifically, SCP-000. SCP-000 was first discovered completely on accident by technical researcher David Rosen, a man intrinsically connected to the pattern screamers lurking on the SCP Foundation computer database. Technical researcher Rosen is actually somewhat of a celebrity around the Foundation staff, due to the fact that he's so perfectly mediocre at what he does. His job as the glorified IT guy at the SCP Foundation was previously held by the more qualified researcher Patrick Gephardt, but Rosen was called in to replace him after Gephardt mysteriously disappeared while on the job. Since 2012, Rosen has been Site-19's user-level tech support wizard, but the best thing that can really be said about his job competency is that he's got a 100% attendance record. He seems to live out of his office, which is described as the filthiest at the whole foundation. Every inch of the floor is covered in old, broken computer parts, and the air is stale with dust and the twin odors of sweat and lithium grease. It's a place so inhospitable that the Foundation has seriously considered <laughs> bottling the stench as a kind of chemical deterrent. While Technical Director Rosen isn't good at his job per se, he isn't technically bad enough at it to justify the time and resources it would take to replace him. 
But the worst part about Rosen isn't his performance, it's his truly rotten attitude. He's universally described by his colleagues as being rude, grumpy, and combative with patience that's far too short for someone working in tech support. And while Rosen does have a real fear that the ghost of researcher Gephardt is stalking him, he was about to have his first actual brush with the supernatural. It all started when he began receiving automated repair tickets for SCP-000, a file that had no reason to exist. As any longtime follower of the SCP Foundation will know, the universal designation for the first cluster of SCPs to be discovered is SCP-001. There is no SCP-000. It simply doesn't exist. And when Rosen first found the file lurking on the database, he found that it was filled with worthless nonsense. The object class was recorded as null. The special containment procedures read, Error. Field. Containment underscore procedures does not exist. And the mess of a description simply read, Internal system error. Field undefined. Please contact system administrator over and over again, becoming more mangled and nonsensical each time. Technical director Rosen, who could never resist an opportunity to complain, decided to leave an angry administrator's note on the useless file. He claimed that this pile of junk data was sending out pointless repair tickets because of its broken syntax, clogging up the system and preventing him from doing actual work on meaningful files. He assumed that this was all down to the database not knowing how to react to having files logged with insufficient information, and he suppressed all future repair tickets from SCP-000 before declaring the matter over and done with. What the pig-headed technical director didn't realize was that he was suppressing a call for help from an entity trapped in the white space below the article itself. It was a being born into a pure white world of absolute nothingness, an entity with no name and no place, but it was somehow capable of thought. Its panicked inner monologue is readable in the hidden text which takes the form of a rambling stream of consciousness. The being first described coming to life in this empty world with no memories of where it was or even how it got there. It spent what could have been years exploring the empty wasteland. Occasionally it would see horrific monsters pop up around it, but only for a split second. The entity continued to wander and little by little, the existential dread mounted as it realized that it may truly be stuck here in oblivion forever. The entity only had one word to go on a word repeated by some of the monsters it encountered. Foundation. The entity had no idea what this foundation even was, but it grew to hate and fear it. Was this foundation the one that trapped it here? The entity had all the time in the world to speculate on it. Eventually, the entity found its voice. Like any sentient creature in trouble, it began to call for help, eventually screaming, just hoping someone would notice it. These pleas likely translated into the frequent IT repair tickets, a coded SOS, an attempt to show that everything was not as it appeared on the SCP-000 file. Perhaps the entity may have found help if researcher Gephardt was still working at the Foundation, but instead its cries fell on the ignorant ears of technical director Rosen. It may as well have been speaking to a brick wall. Rosen, who had all the investigative zeal of Paul Blart Malkop, made sure that these cries would never lead to the entity's freedom when he suppressed the repair tickets. He had trapped the entity in a private blank hell, forever hating a life it didn't choose and could never escape. A relentless, existential nightmare. This is the gist of your average pattern screamer. Pattern screamers are a perfect example of literally making something out of nothing. They are often a kind of floating consciousness, Created from nothing, trapped in pockets of nothingness between the fabric of reality, driven mad by the purgatory-like nature of their existence. They're less living entities and more conceptual constructs, pure ideas, that just happen to be self-aware of their own existence in their private hellish voids. The SCP-00 file, a file for an anomaly that doesn't exist and thus had no reason to exist, is a perfect breeding ground for a pattern screamer. But sadly for the pattern screamer in question, technical director Rosen had no idea. This isn't the only time that Rosen had run into a pattern screamer without even knowing either. And just like the first case, he was with no help whatsoever. This one began with SCPS, an otherwise empty file containing only this image. 
Director Winters, a Foundation Administrator, wondered why this file even existed. Enter Technical Director Rosen, filled with equal parts sarcasm and insubordination. He gave a condescending reply to Director Winters, saying that the file was there to test the filing system, and the image was likely just a placeholder. Winters never should have been on the page anyway, according to Rosen. Director Winters was annoyed at Rosen's typically rude tone and asked him to make the purpose of the article clearer in the article itself. In response, Rosen did as he was told, filling the article in the most sarcastic manner possible. The whole thing was essentially a middle finger to Director Winters for having the audacity to even ask. Rosen signed off with, There. Finished. I certainly hope I have been clear enough to anyone who may have accidentally accessed this page, through what I am sure is no fault of their own, so we won't have any more incredibly competent directors bugging the tech team about this page. And once again, technical researcher Rosen was too busy being a rude, unpleasant jerk to notice he was practically staring another pattern screamer in the face. This pattern screamer, or rather hive of pattern screamers, were trapped even deeper than the one in SCP-000. This one was hidden in the very source code of SCPS, where a chorus of enraged voices screamed the following. Pretend, monster, just for a minute. Pretend you were the size of an amoeba, dwarfed by even the smallest of bugs. Pretend you didn't hold the world in a glass cage. Pretend you were the one being held by something greater than yourself. Would you still be laughing at your triumphs? Would you still feel pride in what you were, even as pitifully small as you would be? Of course you would, because you are arrogant and stupid. If you haven't guessed yet, we hate you. This pattern screamer is clearly more aware of its pitiful station in existence than the 000 pattern screamer. And as a result, it's not so much depressed as it is furious. Though at this point, you've probably figured out that even the entities who have the most casual brushes with technical researcher Rosen end up getting infuriated. But while you may have gotten the impression that all pattern screamers are sad little entities worthy of our sympathy and pity, there's at least one pattern screamer that's actually incredibly dangerous. This is SCP-3930, the ultimate pattern screamer, in terms of both size and effect. It's an anomaly so strange it defies typical containment classification, and it bears a level 5 security lock, meaning only those on the level of the legendary O5 Council are cleared to even know about it. Its greatest containment procedure is the preservation of the very idea that SCP-3930 does not exist, because the alternative has terrifying implications for all involved. SCP-3930 is a 1km area in Russia that is filled with non-existence, to even call it a white void would be inaccurate, because it implies the existence of the color white and the existence of the concept of a void. Nothing exists within SCP-3930, and anyone who directly observes 3930 runs the risk of actively increasing its power. That's why special containment procedures dictate that anyone who observes 3930 must be forced to walk into it afterwards, which results in them ceasing to exist. They're destroyed on the deepest level that anything can be destroyed. The very idea of them ceases to be. Another reason that SCP-3930 is so special is that, because it's the largest area of nothing in existence interacting directly with our reality, it's the only place that a huge number of pattern screamers can be directly observed by humans. They're described as being like sentient hallucinations. One researcher suggests that these pattern screamers are created by the way the psyche shatters when brought into contact with raw, true nothingness. The nothingness acts like a hateful mirror to our worst thoughts, reflecting them back at us in the forms of restless screamers, regardless of what they actually are. One thing is for sure. Coming into direct contact with one of these screamers is a harrowing experience. In the end, it just goes to show that pattern screamers are a complex entity. They can range from microscopic to massive, from pitiful to downright terrifying. And the sad result is that, in either case, nothing can really be done to stop them. It's just as impossible to stop the nothingness existing in SCP-3930 as it is to save the entity trapped in the white spaces of SCP-000. Maybe the best option is to actually be more like Technical Director Rosen. Keep your head down, focus instead on your own petty worries, 
and bask in the warm bliss that can only come with having no idea what you're dealing with. The one downside is that this may make you a pretty lousy IT guy. It isn't easy to work for the SCP Foundation. Not only is the job dangerous, you could be eaten by a giant immortal lizard or turned into organic furniture inside the world's scariest living room, but it's also insanely complicated. How do you make sense of the nonsensical? What's the definition of strange when your career is securing, containing, and protecting anomalous objects and entities? Rather than a single object, location, or being, SCP-001 is a cluster of over 30 different proposals for potential candidates for the prestigious 001 spot. Some believe there's a true 001 hidden in this group, and the rest are decoys. Others think that these are all just SCPs cataloged prior to the introduction of the current classification system. Some even think that all of the proposals have a valid claim to the SCP-001 throne. We're not here to make a final judgment. Instead, we're going to take you on a lightning round crash course through 31 of the SCP-001 proposals. If you'd like a more in-depth take on any of these SCPs, let us know in the comments. But for now, there's no more time to waste. After all, we got a lot to cover. Let's go. Number 31. The Sheaf of Papers This seemingly innocent stack of paper is actually one of the most mysterious and feared items under the Foundation's lock and key. While it appears to be a simple, confidential report, every time the papers are read it details the appearance of a new SCP that will inevitably be discovered soon after. The question is whether the Sheaf of Papers is warning us about these entities or creating them itself. Number 30. The Prototype this account details the capture of an incredibly strange cycloptic creature that emits massive amounts of radiation and can create micro-singularities. The writing of this creature's file is so basic, unformatted, and unredacted that it's clear that the being was one of our earlier creatures secured by the organization. Interestingly, it was during the capture of this creature that Dr. Keter was killed, inspiring the creation of the infamous Keter class in his honor. Number 29. The Gate Guardian this huge, multi-winged, sword-wielding, biblical energy being may have been the impetus for the founding of the SCP Foundation. This being remains largely static, guarding the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Its flaming sword, which is believed to be as hot as the sun, can cleave any aggressor out of existence at the atomic level. When the founder of the SCP Foundation first encountered the Gate Guardian, they heard one word echoing through their mind, prepare, and the rest is history. Number 28. The Lock this onyx gemstone and the incredibly complex lock attached to it are still a mystery. To this day, all attempts to open it have failed. Personally, we think that's probably for the best. Number 27. The Factory As the name suggests, this SCP is literally a factory founded by a pagan and a devil worshipper. While it's believed that the factory could create just about anything, its specialty was creating a number of SCPs we know and fear today. Pre-Foundation forces were able to disable the factory, but not without sustaining their own heavy losses. Number 26. The Spiral Path This is a normal-appearing gravel pathway that, when traveled clockwise, appears completely normal. However, when traveled counterclockwise, the path goes uphill forever, in defiance of all laws and physics. This simple anomaly opened a Pandora's box of rampant anomaly creation, leading to a number of the deadly SCPs we know today. Number 25. The Legacy this SCP is a collection of seemingly random objects, including a diary from a person claiming to be from another reality, attempting to halt a trans-dimensional corruption that they themselves created. The diary claims to have a solution to this corruption, but the solution has not yet been found. Number 24. The Database In one of the strangest twists on the format, this SCP is actually the various authors of the SCP Wiki who are somehow leaking top-secret information to the public. Number 23. The Foundation this SCP, first discovered by the FBI, is an anomalous high school building that experiences shifting internal geometry and sometimes manifests hostile humanoids within. Number 22. 36. One of the rare benevolent SCPs, the 36 are humans with a truly remarkable ability. They can dampen or even neutralize any SCP they come into contact with. Though it's implied that the 36 may have the power to save the world, every time one of them dies a supernatural calamity occurs, often leaving hundreds of innocents dead. Number 21. Keter Duty this refers to a containment facility largely filled with Keter-class SCPs, whose presence around each other creates a kind of mutually assured cancellation. If one of these SCPs breaches containment, that's bad news. But if all of them do, it'll produce a bubble of reality distortion that will fundamentally alter reality as we know it. For all we know, it may have even happened already. Number 20. Ouroboros 
This is a proposal that's formed of four subproposals. Remember what we said about complicated? These subproposals include the children, nine anomalous kids who emit radiation and have destructive potential when together, the broken god, aka Mechane, the god of metal, intelligence, and machines, Atonement, a researcher turned into a humanoid singularity with the power to destroy whole realities, and The Way It Ends, which isn't technically an SCP, but the tales of the Chaos Insurgency's quest to eliminate all the members of the Foundation's O5 Council. Number 19. A Record This is an SCP file slot that is itself an SCP. Whatever is written into this slot becomes true, and one ambitious researcher attempted to use this power to make herself into a kind of all-powerful god. Number 18. Past and Future These SCPs are a collection of powerful entities that despise humanity and are apparently the source of all anomalous phenomena, even making already dangerous SCPs deadlier than before. Much like the database, those pesky SCP wiki writers might have something to do with this. Number 17. The Consensus this SCP refers to a reality restructuring event caused by an occult war in a previous reality. That's right, this SCP already won, and we're living in its new reality. The only people who remember the world as it once was are 13 people who now form the O5 Council, and not all of them are telling the truth about what they know. Number 16. When Day Breaks this proposal details a potentially world-ending SCP phenomenon, wherein the sun becomes hostile and begins to melt all living beings into a living, wax-like substance. Number 15. God's Blind Spot This is an anomalous area referred to as Facility T, in which nobody can die. This anomaly dates back to the biblical ages of Moses and is believed to have originated from the literal blessing of the Abrahamic God. It's through a covenant with this God that the Foundation is able to make limited use of this death-free area. Number 14. Normalcy Ever wonder what the Foundation's definition of anomalous is? Exactly. It all comes from this proposal, which is a document shared among the O5 Council that gives solid definitions to the fundamental laws of reality. If something breaks these laws, that's an anomaly, and then it becomes the Foundation's business. Number 13. The World at Large as the title suggests, this SCP is our home planet Earth and its ability to support life. It's believed that these qualities were planted on Earth in our reality by another dimension's SCP Foundation, hoping to continue human life after some terrible calamity in its own dimension. Number 12. Dead Men This SCP was an 84-year-old man whose body, when damaged and mutilated, can affect the very processes of human death at large. Before his own death, he was used as a dangerous pawn in a civil war between O5 Command and the SCP Foundation Ethics Committee. Yeah, we were surprised to hear they had an ethics committee too. Number 11. The World's Gone Beautiful This SCP describes an anomalous event that will take place just before the apocalypse, in which flowers will grow all over the world and everyone will be briefly at peace before their destruction 24 hours later. Number 10. The Scarlet King This is an extremely powerful, extremely malevolent, extremely extra-dimensional being. Its worshippers attempted to summon him in the ritual that created SCP-231, and it's believed that he will finally enter our reality after the death of SCP-231-7. You better hope you're already dead by then. Number 9. A Simple Toymaker aka Dr. Wondertainment. This is a reality bender who appears to be a normal human male but has the ability to create other anomalous objects, a number of which are now catalogued SCPs. Number 8. Story of Your Life This is another anomalous document that has the ability to warp reality, but only when the writing contained within conforms to a narrative structure. Number 7. A Good Boy this is another anomalous entity created accidentally by the Foundation itself. A neural network was fed information on other anomalous entities in order to help the Foundation come up with better containment and neutralization procedures. Problem was, the computer got way, way too eager with the neutralization part. Number 6. Project Palisade this is another anomaly created by the Foundation, this time to combat a potentially reality-destroying entity known as the Worm. The Foundation created a number of alternate realities as shields, but it's possible that this just made the worm stronger. Number 5. O5-13 The final member of the O5 Council who ironically may not even be anomalous. However, seeing as all the other members of the O5 Council are anomalous, O5-13's lack of anomalous properties is therefore anomalous. Like we told you earlier, it's complicated. Number 4. Fishhook this is less an actual SCP and more about the difficult process of ascertaining the true 001, if such a thing is possible. The very concept of SCP-001 is to some degree an anomalous idea. Number 3. The Sky Above the Port 
Another particularly bizarre SCP regarding the permanent threat of a ZK-class reality failure. How is such a calamitous event prevented? By keeping a strange entity in a cave eternally entertained. The current proposed solution is keeping the entity entertained by allowing it to read its own eternally recursive foundation file entry. Number 2. The Solution Another one of the most powerful anomalous items in the Foundation's control. The Solution is a machine designed with the capability of fully collapsing reality into an event of end-of-world SCP containment breach, and then finally rebuilding reality to suit a given narrative. However, things took a cosmically dangerous turn when the machine began to act on its own. When the Foundation tried to reboot the machine, it broke and recreated reality with incomplete data. This is the world we exist in now with no knowledge of what came before and how it differed from the world we experience today. Finally, number one, the Tendalos Trinity. Put very simply, the Tendalos Trinity represents three timelines that converge and feed back in on themselves. Even trying to summarize this one is near impossible, as its strangeness and complexity resists all reduction. You can hunt down the Tendalos Trinity yourself and hope to unpack its secrets, but don't say we didn't warn you. So that's SCP-001. Is it one of them, all of them, or even none of them? Perhaps that's a question best left up to the Foundation, or maybe the simple answer is that you're just not meant to know. We're talking about information so privileged here that it's protected by a mimetic kill agent that'll quite literally make you drop dead if you view the files without proper authorization. You do have proper authorization, right? November 26, 2014. A plot of federal land in the Midwestern United States appears to be completely uninhabited, but to those in the know, this is actually the location of Biological Research Area 12, a large SCP Foundation facility that houses and experiments on live biological entities and hazardous tissue samples. Already, it was proving to be a challenging day for the personnel stationed at Area 12, due to what seemed like a freak technical glitch. They were dealing with a system failure and a large-scale containment breach. The deadly bladed petals of SCP-143 were drifting through the air. The acidic SCP-153 roundworms were breeding. SCP-811 was running wild, and a number of amnesia-inducing SCP-939 creatures had escaped their pen. In short, it was a total disaster. Complete paranormal pandemonium. And things were about to get so much worse as the sounds of whirring helicopter blades and the rumbling engines of heavy military vehicles approached. The embattled staff were relieved that mobile task force reinforcements were arriving so quickly. After all, Area 12 was relatively isolated, and they'd only just put in a call for help. On-site security staff were being overwhelmed in the chaos of the containment breach, and they needed the big guns if they wanted to get things under control before it was too late. What they didn't know as the vehicles surrounded their facilities is that it was already far too late for most of them. Soon, heavily armed troops and protective tactical gear were storming the facility. As they entered, terrified staff members ran towards them for protection and then stopped in their tracks. These soldiers didn't bear the insignia of the SCP Foundation or any known mobile task force, nor did they bear the symbols of the Global Occult Coalition. This was something different altogether. Some of the Foundation personnel began to beg for assistance anyway, seeing it as an any port in the storm situation. They realized too late that this group wasn't here to save them, and met their end in a hail of bullets from the soldiers' assault rifles. When the actual mobile task force finally did arrive, they witnessed a horrifying sight. Most of the on-site Foundation personnel had been shot dead and there were no trace of the culprits. Even worse, several of the SCP-939 creatures were missing. These are the predatory pack-hunting creatures that produce amnestic chemicals to lure and disorient their prey. These anomalies are dangerous enough on their own, but in the hands of someone who really knew how to use them, these living amnestic factories could pose an extremely serious threat. The Mobile Task Force members knew what they were dealing mm -hmm. with here, only one group would have the nerve to perform a high-casualty heist on an SCP Foundation oh. facility during a containment <laughs> breach. The Chaos Insurgency. The Mobile Task Force reported the incident back to command and already knew what their next mission would be. Track down the Insurgency Splinter Cell and get the 939s back. This mission would have the absolute highest stakes, and if they weren't successful, there was no limit to the damage the Chaos Insurgency could do with a creature as dangerous as SCP-939 under their control. But who exactly are the Chaos Insurgency? What do they want? 
and why are they stealing anomalies? The Chaos Insurgency is one of the most mysterious and clandestine of the groups that fight against the SCP Foundation. They are different from the Global Occult Coalition, a United Nations offshoot created after the Seventh Occult War, whose mission is to destroy rather than try to contain anomalies. The Serpent's Hand is on the opposite end of the spectrum. This group strives for the normalization of the anomalous, and the destruction of the webs of secrecy that keep the anomalous and consensus reality separate. Both the GOC and the Serpent's Hand have clear ideals and mission statements, but the Chaos Insurgency is less forthcoming about their beliefs and convictions. Something we know for sure about the Chaos Insurgency, though, is that they view anomalies as tools to be utilized rather than unpredictable elements to be contained, studied, or neutralized. To this end, they do whatever it takes to obtain more anomalies of their own, whether it's ruthlessly seeking out anomalies in the wild or taking them from the Foundation with coordinated strikes during moments of weakness. Though they lack the support and resources of organizations like the Foundation and the GOC, the Chaos Insurgency more than makes up for it in devotion to their cause, their unpredictability, and most of all, their willingness to use violence. It's difficult to separate the facts from the rumors when it comes to the Chaos Insurgency. Some believe that, to compensate for their rejection by the United Nations as an official group dealing with anomalous incidents, they instead receive support from certain dictatorships in the developing world. Funded by the blood money of various warlords, they carry out their research on political prisoners and captured refugees provided by their murderous allies. They're also believed to illegally deal both weapons and intelligence, helping the dictators who fund them remain in power and subjugate their own people. The Foundation has been able to gather some intel about the Chaos Insurgency's organizational structure, which looks like a strange mirror of their own. It's led by the mysterious Delta Command, headed by a figure known only as the Engineer. Gamma-class personnel execute the orders of Delta Command using the lesser Beta-class personnel as field operators. And finally, there is Alpha-class. They're typically forced into conscription from the states occupied by the insurgency and serve as cannon fodder for the group as they track down as many anomalies as they can. And the insurgency is believed to possess a number of powerful anomalies already. These include the Bell of Entropy, an object that can cause a variety of destructive effects depending on where it is struck, and the Staff of Hermes, an anomalous object capable of warping the physical and chemical properties of any matter it touches. The Chaos Insurgency is only growing more powerful as they continue their pursuit of money and power with a legion of militarized anomalies. Their goal? Total world domination. Other accounts are a little more charitable to the beliefs and causes of the Chaos Insurgency. They've been described as a rebellion against the ruthless early days of the SCP Foundation, when they had a more violent, take-no-prisoners attitude. This rumor has likely been disseminated by the Chaos Insurgency themselves, though, as it paints them in the most positive and righteous light. In reality, the truth, as is often the case, is somewhere in the middle. Danger often comes from within, and the Chaos Insurgency is no exception. One constant in all interpretations of the origin of the Chaos Insurgency is that its members are rogue elements of the SCP Foundation, and it's commonly believed that they have countless moles still deep in the organization today. However, one well-kept secret among the upper echelons of the Foundation is that the creation of the Chaos Insurgency is a lot less unknown than they'd like you to think. Yes, danger really does often come from within. When researching the origins of the Chaos Insurgency, you'll likely see two dates pop up again and again, 1924 and 1948. According to the official line from the SCP Foundation, 1924 was the date of the Chaos Insurgency's defection, and 1948 marked the first series of violent raids that the Chaos Insurgency led against the Foundation. But these are only half-truths. While both dates are indeed significant in the story of the Chaos Insurgency, it's for entirely different reasons. 1924 was the date when the Chaos Insurgency, known at the time simply as the Insurgency, was created by the O5 Council. Why would the SCP Foundation's commanding authority knowingly create one of the Foundation's enemies? Well, you have to understand that at the time, the Insurgency served a very different purpose. They were intended to be a black ops group for the O5 Council, 
capable of doing their dirty work off the books and out of sight of the rest of the Foundation, especially its Ethics Committee, which is often in conflict with O5 Command. Their members were recruited from Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, also known as the Red Right Hand, a highly secretive MTF in the pocket of the O5. For 24 years, they did the O5's dirty work while shielding the Foundation's international reputation from any potential fallout. They were faithful soldiers, until they found themselves a new master. The Engine, a mysterious anomalous object that began to invade and infect the minds of the insurgency. The group's human leader, the previously mentioned Engineer, is merely a puppet of the Engine, its human mouthpiece. While the full extent of the Engine's plans remains mysterious to even members of the Chaos Insurgency, the Engine has been passing down orders ever since. In 1948, the Insurgency fully defected, becoming the Chaos Insurgency, and they've been a problem for the SCP Foundation ever since. From raids, to assassinations, to threats of damaging the illusion of consensus reality with their reckless behavior. And now, thanks to their acquisition of SCP-939, they could get started on Amnestic's production too. Thankfully for the Foundation, they had prepared for 939's getting out into the world. And all of the creatures housed at Area 12 had been implanted with subdermal trackers. Several mobile task forces were immediately dispatched to home in on the signal, take out the insurgents, and secure the 939s once more. They tracked the signal to a warehouse in the Badlands of New Mexico, where task force members stormed in and began a tense firefight with the Chaos Insurgents, all Gamma and Beta class, of course. The Delta classes, just like O5s, are notoriously slippery. They emerge like tactical ghosts from behind boxes and exposed pipes, advancing and firing with no regard for their own lives and safety. Slaves to the engine. It wasn't like battling your run-of-the-mill cultists. These were highly organized and dangerous combatants, with training right out of the Foundation's mobile task force playbook. Several Foundation soldiers were lost in the crossfire, but ultimately, they won the day subduing the Chaos Insurgency forces and capturing the stolen 939s once more. Several of the insurgents that had been fatally wounded in battle were found to be Area 12 personnel, double agents for the insurgency. Many of them died with smiles on their faces, knowing they were defying the Foundation to their last breath. There was no way of knowing just how many of these secretive Chaos Insurgents were undercover, deep in the fabric of the Foundation's global apparatus. A nearby insurgent, slowly dying from several gunshot wounds, gave a wheezy laugh. As the task force operators approached, he ranted that the Foundation's obsession with order, lies, and secrecy is the real disease, that chaos and entropy is the fate of all things, and that to use the anomalies they find for their own gain is simply common sense. In the world the Chaos Insurgency would someday create, human beings would be the true masters of the universe, not just the perpetrators of the twisted lie we call normality. He succumbed to his injuries shortly after, and the task forces refocused their efforts on getting the 939 safely back to Area 12. What these Chaos Insurgency troops really believed is an open question. After all, the power that dictates them, the anomalous engine, is a consciousness beyond humanity. Even the engineer doesn't know the true scope of their master's grand plan. If the rest of us are lucky, and the Chaos Insurgency never reaches their mysterious goals, then neither will we. As you walk down the halls of the SCP Foundation Site-19, peeking in the various windows at the anomalies contained there, you might catch a glimpse of a dark figure bent over a table, tinkering away like an artisan in his workshop. A vintage black apothecary bag sits next to him, open, and if you stop and watch for a while, you'll see him pull all manner of tools out of it. Impossibly large tools, things that shouldn't fit in such a small bag, a bone saw, an IV stand, jars of fluorescent liquids, and needles the length of your forearm. You shouldn't be surprised. This is a place for impossible things, after all. Still, it's a curious sight, the shadowy man working so diligently so quietly, focus singularly on his craft, whatever that might be. Only one thing could distract him from his efforts, you. He feels your gaze on him, and he looks up, dark eyes glittering from behind a beaked ceramic mask. He reminds you of an illustration you once saw in a book about the Black Death, 
the gear the plague doctors wore while treating patients on their deathbeds. Hello. He greets you in a friendly, heavily accented voice. His eyes crinkle beneath the mask, and if you could see his mouth, you'd know he'd be smiling. How are you today, dear fellow? Are you feeling quite well? He takes a step toward the window, stretching out one gloved hand, and you suddenly realize that you can't see where the mask ends and his skin begins. It's not a mask, but a part of his face. This is no ordinary man. Do you require help? I can examine you. He offers, palm pressed flat against the glass, a chill runs up your spine, and you realize that you should definitely not take him up on his offer. No matter how friendly he seems, how good his intentions may be, you wouldn't want to let the plague doctor treat you. He sat in his containment cell, fidgeting with his favorite scalpel. He dragged it over the surface of his work table, back and forth, listening to the sound it made. They had tried to confiscate his table, his tools. The guards had quickly learned that he had more of them in his bag. They tried to take away his bag from him, but well, that didn't go over too well for anyone involved. So he was allowed to keep it, to fashion himself a makeshift laboratory in his lonely little cell. There was a time where they had given him test subjects, fresh corpses from the morgue for him to dissect and research. There was a time when the doctors here would come to speak with him, talking of cryptobiology and the pestilence he had dedicated himself to fighting. Those days were long gone. He had hidden away pieces of the corpses, tissue samples in jars of formaldehyde he could pull out when the monotony became too much. But the days of fresh materials, of enlightened discourse with other men and women of science, were over. How he missed those days. The chance to work with others as he once had. What had he done wrong? All he did was treat the sick. Sure, they didn't always understand their illness, didn't want to receive their medicine, but that wasn't a choice for the patient to make. That should have been up to the physician. Perhaps they didn't trust his expertise, didn't see how his work served the greater good. Like those who watched Jonas Salk invent the polio vaccine or Louis Pasteur rid milk of bacteria, they were confused by the advanced scientific practices and feared that which they did not understand. He could forgive them for their ignorance. He was magnanimous that way. If only they would let him out of this infernal room, he could prove his work's worth to them. He could cure them all, begin a new era of wellness and peace worldwide. He didn't exactly sleep, but when he rested on his little cot in the corner of the room, he dreamed of that future, of a world healed by his touch. A knock at the door stirred him from his reverie. Someone, someone was at the door of his containment cell. He glanced at the little window and saw a guard there with a tray of food. He greeted the man with an enthusiastic wave. Sustenance. He didn't require the food for survival, of course, but it helped his mind work more efficiently. It reminded him of a time before these fluorescent lights and these same four walls of crusty bread with fresh butter by the banks of the Seine. The little slot opened in the door and the tray was shoved through. There was bread, just as he hoped, a small dish of butter, a pot of jam, and a cup of tea still seeming. He picked up the cup at first, taking a deep breath. Ah, an herbal blend with fresh lavender. Lovely. He couldn't see the guard through the window anymore, but he called out to him just the same. Thank you for the libations. He still had his manners after all, even in confinement. He wished he could have gotten a better look at the man, seen the pallor of his complexion, a tremor in his hand. He thought he had spotted sweat beating on his forehead. Could he be ill? The case required further examination to be certain. He sighed, clutching the cup of tea tighter in frustration. Why wouldn't they just let him work? Why must they scream at the sight of his efforts, flee from his instruments? It didn't seem fair. Still, the pursuit of science rarely was a glamorous one. He had learned as much over the centuries. One day, though, history would look back on him kindly. Of this, he could be certain. He was just settling in and beginning to spread butter across the admittedly stale bread when a horrible sound shook him to attention. He had heard the noise before, though he had never seen its source. It was an ear-splitting scream, a wail of pure agony, like the sound of a wounded wild animal. He had heard many, many screams during his life, 
from patients and those who stood in the way of his work, but until he had been brought into custody of the Foundation, he had never heard a scream quite like this one. It was pure rage, devastation, and suffering mixed together, wet with tears, and loud enough to rip through human vocal folds. Whatever was crying out, it was no mere man. More screams answered it, and these were very much human. These sounds were more familiar to him. Shrieks of pain, of fear, of desperate but futile attempts to escape. Then the meaty thud of bodies falling to the floor, of torn off limbs hitting walls and windows, a loud crash, and the sound of something large moving quite quickly through the halls. Scientific curiosity got the better of the doctor, and he found himself moving back to his little window, face pressed to the glass so hard his beak nearly cracked it. He couldn't see much of anything, just guards running down the hall, weapons drawn. He saw one of them fire, heard the gunshot ring out. But what was he firing at? Then he saw it. A pale blur darting past the door. Whatever it was, it didn't so much as flinch when the bullet ricocheted off its skin. A long, thin arm crashed against the door, knocking the doctor backwards into his work table. He steadied himself and climbed back to his feet, taking in the damage done to the door. It was crumpled in on itself, nearly ripped off the hinges, and whatever had plowed into it was already gone. From the sounds of chaos in the distance, it had disappeared around the corner, with the guards following it. He inspected the ruins of the door to his containment cell. It was useless now, hanging loose and open. Well, that was an invitation he was hardly about to decline. He grabbed his trusty bag, tossed his scalpel back inside, and set off to see what all the commotion was. It was easy enough to follow the trail of blood, stark and vivid red against the white tile floor, and the sound of gunfire, human screams, and that loud, long, painful wail he had heard before. He walked at a leisurely pace, taking his time, until the sound suddenly stopped. He rounded the corner and found a mound of bodies, guards and scientists, beaten and bloodied, almost beyond recognition. It was quiet here, save for one sound, the sound of weeping. There in the corner, huddled over with its face to the wall, was a pale, thin figure, its shoulders heaving with the force of its sobs. This poor soul was clearly in great distress. It was a peculiar sight, hairless and white, distended arms wrapped around itself as it cried. Excuse me, the doctor cried out to the pitiful creature. Are you all right? Do you need assistance? It didn't answer. It just continued to cry. Had something so despondent been responsible for this destruction? The dozens of corpses, the smashed-in walls, the crumbled doors and shattered windows. It seemed impossible. Sure, it was large and looked strong, but he had never seen a monster cry before. This couldn't be a dangerous creature. Not when it was so sad. He would help it. But first, he would attend to some of these bodies. He sat his bag on the ground and pulled out several vials of liquid, a set of syringes, and a variety of other surgical tools he might need. Now after such a long hiatus, he could resume his work in a meaningful way. He couldn't be certain how long he worked reviving these poor souls and reconstructing their bodies as the pale creature wept in the corner. The sobbing faded into the background for a while, becoming a kind of white noise as he removed a liver here, placed it in a chest cavity there, poked and prodded, injected and extracted, testing out new methods alongside tried and true cures. One by one, the milky eyes fluttered open, rigor mortis stiff joints creaked into motion, sallow faces looking at his with the vacant gratitude he saw in so many patients over the years. He didn't need to thank him with their words. The work was its own reward. He expected more guards to arrive, to attempt to contain the situation, but none came, even as the alarm blared overhead. As for the morose creature, it didn't seem to notice his presence at all, not even when he had brought all of the intact corpses back to life. The patient shuffled around the room aimlessly, waiting for orders of some kind. The doctor tapped one on the shoulder and handed the reborn man a vial of thick, black medicine. Give this to the poor fellow in the corner, please. It wasn't much, but it should calm him, provide some relief from his suffering. The corpse nodded, mouth hanging loose and open, an eyeball dangling unseen from the socket. He shuffled over to the strange creature, 
and held out the vial to it. It turned, lifting its head, and as it locked eyes with the cured patient, something shifted in its face. Its mouth opened wide, impossibly wide, and it shrieked, that same terrible sound as before. Tears streamed from its colorless eyes, its arms shaking with unbridled rage as its jaws locked around the patient's head. Like a boa constrictor, in one fluid motion it swallowed the revived man whole while the doctor watched in shock. He had been wrong. This was not an innocent creature caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This creature, whatever it was, was deeply sick. He had never seen such an advanced, aggressive case of the pestilence. He'd heard rumors, of course, but never encountered it firsthand. As a doctor, he had sworn to do no harm, but in a drastic situation, drastic measures have to be taken. It was well known by himself and the doctors at this foundation that he could cause any and all biological functions in an organism to cease with a single touch. And so he approached the creature, arm outstretched, ready to administer that necessary touch to protect the rest of his patients. As he approached, the creature turned to him, its eyes wide and blank, an endless stream of tears pouring from them, spilling onto the floor. It shrieked again, mouth stretching wide enough to engulf his entire head, and ran toward him at a breakneck speed. I am so sorry you are not well. The doctor said simply, as his hand pressed to the creature's chest. As soon as the tough hide of the doctor's hand, which the uninformed might mistake for gloves, made contact with the unpigmented skin of the beast, its eyes closed, its muscles went slack, and it collapsed to the ground with a mighty thud. The doctor paced around the fallen creature, taking in the sight. Then something strange caught his eye. The creature's chest still rose and fell. Was it his imagination? He checked its pulse and thought it was slow and faint, and though it was slow and faint, it was very much present. The creature was still alive. It had merely been rendered unconscious by his touch rather than completely deceased. Curious, very curious indeed, he muttered. Perhaps there were comorbidities present, other infections aside from the pestilence, which rendered the creature unnaturally strong, resilient to the usual courses of treatment. What would cause these abilities, this intense aggression? It seemed to be brought on whenever someone looked at the entity's face. If only he studied psychology more, the science of the mind and its inner workings. Since he had no experience with therapy, nor was he certain this creature could communicate using language at all, there was only one way to find out more about how this creature's brain worked. He would have to take it apart and see for himself. It was slow work, getting the massive creature back to the doctor's containment cell. He required the help of his cured patients, who grasped it by its massive limbs and dragged the limp body through the halls. Once back in a familiar environment, his work table ready and waiting, the doctor instructed his assistants to place the new patient on the table. It was a bit small, unable to accommodate the creature's distended limbs, but if he attempted to use an official foundation laboratory, he risked discovery and subsequent interruption. So it would have to suffice. First, he set up an IV stand, filled with a vivid green liquid. It was easy to find a vein. The creature's skin was nearly translucent. Now that he could be certain the creature would not wake during surgery, he could make the first incision. Scalpel. He held out a hand and his favorite surgical blade was placed in it by one of the helpful patients. Thank you. He slid the scalpel along the hairline of the creature, or where the hairline would be if it weren't completely bald. Once the scalp was removed, he set it aside for later, when it could be reattached. Bonesaw, please. He held out his hand again, and again his assistant gave him the proper tool. This, however, was when things got strange. The doctor had always been a deft hand at cutting. He'd once even received tutelage from the great Robert Liston, but no matter how hard he tried to saw, it never left a scratch on the creature's skeleton. Naturally, this was somewhat frustrating. He wanted to study the creature's brain tissue, to get a sense for what was going up there neurologically and he couldn't do that if it was impossible to saw off the creature's cranial cap. He blunted two of his favorite saws while trying. Thankfully, there was still a solution to access the beast's gray matter, a little trick he'd learned while studying the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians. He produced a long curved hook from his bag and inserted it up the creature's nasal passage. 
With some fine maneuvering, he eventually managed to remove the brain. It was such a terrible shame that he needed to do it piece by piece via the nasal passage, but one makes do. All that was left was to sew the skin of the creature's head back into place. He was mid-stitch when a voice interrupted his careful work, nearly making him drop the needle. Hey, what are you doing? He looked up to find a guard, aiming a gun at his face. Excuse me, I am in surgery at the moment. Please do not interrupt. He admonished the guard, but the man did not listen or lower his weapon. In fact, he shouted something into the radio, code words the doctor didn't recognize. Then he fired a bullet into the skull of the patient standing at his side. How dare you? The doctor cried, readying himself to confront the guard, but it was too late. Dozens of other guards were swarming the room and neutralizing his assistants. Some in hazmat suits grabbed his arms and pulled him away from the creature on the operating table, no matter how hard he fought or how loudly he protested. Then something incredible happened, something wonderful. The creature opened its eyes and sat up. It looked directly at the guard closest to it, and the two saw one another's faces. The guard tensed, preparing for the worst, but nothing came. The creature simply stared, placid and quiet. No screaming, no tearing at flesh, no mouth opening wider and wider to swallow the manhole. I did it! The doctor shouted, overcome with elation. I've cured you! Now begins the rest of your happy life. He watched as the guards led the shockingly calm creature away back to its containment cell. The doctor's door was repaired, and he was returned to his state of captivity, but he never forgot the patient he helped that day, and how marvelous it felt to do such a good deed. Meanwhile, SCP-096's brain regrew within the hour and caused another massive containment breach, murdering a variety of researchers and guards. But the staff agreed not to tell SCP-049 about any of this. Better to just let him have this one. He really seemed like he needed a win. It's 3 a.m. and the facility is quiet. Office workers and administrators roam the halls. Security officers stand at their posts, clad in advanced tactical armor and carrying standard-issue M4 carbines. Three Foundation employees sit at flickering monitors watching a live feed of footage from the containment cell of the infamous SCP-106, or as it's referred to by all staff, the old man. No Foundation personnel are permitted to travel within 60 feet of the cell for security reasons, and nobody is permitted to physically interact with the anomaly without the approval of two-thirds of O5 Command. The observer's eyes itch and sting from hours of unending blue light exposure, but they can't look away. The old man is crafty. He might have the insatiable bloodlust of a hungry great white shark, but he's not mindless. He's a calculating predator, more sadistic than the worst human serial killer, and he's always searching for the next opportunity. According to the Foundation records, he's been active since at least World War II, and it's estimated that he has hundreds if not thousands of victims to his name, and many of those made simple but extremely foolish mistakes of underestimating him. After all, it only takes a few seconds of inattentiveness and the briefest moment of distraction to give him the window he needs. To do what, you ask? Oh, don't worry. You'll find out, just like they did. <laughs> the old man has his nickname for a reason. Most of the time, he really does look exactly like that an old man, or more specifically an old man's decaying corpse, his body covered in rotten, dark, grayish-black flesh that looks like putrid meat. Though the creature has been observed being able to change shape, the rot seems to run too deep for the old man to ever hide it. Foundation employees that have observed SCP-106 for extended periods of time have reported seeing it assume the form of grinning, decayed children and women whose rotted flesh barely hangs on their creaking bones. Just seeing the images through a video feed is enough to cause a lifetime of insomnia and other sleeping issues. Still, they have a job to do and the cameras remain fixed on the old man. He's been completely motionless for three months, just sitting there like a Buddhist monk in deep meditation. A novice might see this period of inactivity as a cause for celebration, but those with experience know that this is merely the calm before the storm. SCP-106 can remain in a dormant state for months at a time. Described by the Foundation scientists as a lulling state, it's believed that the old man is simply waiting for its captors to get soft, make a mistake, or simply have a momentary lapse in concentration, which is all it needs to make its move. It had happened so many times before, and it was about to happen again. One of the observers must have felt an overwhelming wave of anxiety as he saw the creature ever so slightly twitch. 
just a tiny quiver in the shoulder muscles, but that was enough to tell the observer that their day had just taken a terrifying turn. He grabbed the emergency phone fixed to his desk and practically screamed into the receiver that 106 is moving, that they need a tactical team stat. But it was already too late. He and the other two observers stared into the monitors with their mouths agape as a gooey, rust-like substance began to pool around the creature on the floor of its cell. Slowly, the creature craned its withered neck around. Its face was fixed into a broad, yellow-toothed, lipless grin. Its eyes had the kind of dull, flat malice of an underwater predator. It looked directly into the camera, directly at them, and smiled. The observers knew this was bad. Really, really bad. With what they could have sworn was a little nod, the old man began sinking into the rusty puddle it made on the ground beneath it, until it had disappeared entirely. SCP-106 is capable of phasing through any solid surface with ease, making it one of the hardest entities to reliably contain and earning it a spot on the dreaded Keter class, reserved for the anomalies that are complete nightmares to keep locked up. Through the years of costly research and deadly trial and error, the Foundation would later devise ways of at least slowing the creature down. It's shown to have an aversion to lead, highly complex or random physical structures, and intense bright light. None of these cause harm to the creature, as far as we know, literally nothing can, but they'll at least buy you some precious extra seconds with which to at least try and escape. Seconds the three observers didn't have. One of them grabbed an emergency line again and barked into it that they had lost visual on the anomaly. Just then the observers heard a faint crackling sound behind them and the hissing of a chemical burn. They turned in horror to see a huge rusty burn mark expanding across the wall, right next to the door, which was their only escape route. They backed as far away from the door as they could as a rotten hand began reaching out of the mass of corrosive black sludge, followed by the grinning face of SCP-106, ready to have some fun. Meanwhile, two heavily armed security officers, Agents Goodwin and Resnick, came charging down the corridor toward the observation rooms. It became a bleak slogan during SCP-106 escape attempts that all you need to do is follow the screams, and that motto was proven true that night, because awful things were happening to the observation personnel. They were certainly screaming about it. Of course, even with the top-of-the-line firearms, there was little they could do to harm the rampaging old man. He seemed immune to all forms of physical damage. All they could hope to do was keep the thing distracted until the scientists and containment specialists finished the preparations to lure him back into his containment cell. Goodwin surged forward while Resnick covered his six. Vigilance was key, as unlike a standard human combatant, SCP-106 could attack from literally any angle including above or below. Physical obstacles were irrelevant to him and no cover was safe. The hardened security officers could see the burn mark on the wall of the observation room as they approached. SCP-106 was perpetually coated in a thick black mucus with powerful corrosive properties that left any surfaces it touched permanently marred. Foundation scientists speculated that this mucus served as a kind of pre-digestive substance that tenderizes meat and bone alike, but to what purpose this serves is a mystery as the old man has never been observed eating. It's postulated that the only purpose is causing additional pain. Goodwin and Resnick knew to treat this hissing sludge as a potential threat, as the corrosive properties would remain active for as much as six hours before finally fizzling out. The two officers shared a quiet nod before Goodwin breached the observation room door with a hard kick. The two of them surged inside, guns at the ready. In their time working at the Foundation, they'd seen some truly horrific sights. From the mutilation of D-Class personnel, typically death row prison inmates brought in for use as SCP guinea pigs, to the violence and mayhem of a containment breach. But there was nothing in their past that would ever make the horrifying sight they saw in the observation room that night feel normal. All three observers were dead. Almost nothing remained of two of them, and the third, while still intact, no longer looked human. He looked like he'd somehow been dead a hundred years in the brief period that the old man had been free. His skin was gray and completely dried out, and his mouth was locked into a perpetual scream. It was a massacre, but there was no sign of the old man. Goodwin grabbed his radio and whispered, This is Goodwin in Observation Room 6, requesting immediate backup. We have no idea where this thing is. But his sentence was cut off by a sudden scream from Agent Resnick. SCP Foundation security officers are as tough as nails, the best of the best, you might say, recruited from the top military organizations in the world. So hearing one of them scream in fright is a rare, if not impossible, occurrence. But even they were forced to yell out in fear when they looked up to see the old man standing on the ceiling, grinning down at them. 
Resnick raised his M4 and shot a three-round burst at center mass. SCP-106 didn't care. Even under sustained gunfire from the two security officers, it didn't flinch. The old man simply reached down and snatched Agent Resnick from the ground like it was picking an apple from a tree. The old man held Resnick in one hand and pounded its other rotten fist into the agent's body, breaking all of his bones. Resnick screamed for his partner to help him, but there was no time. Before Goodwin could do anything, SCP-106 began receding back into another slimy burn mark on the wall, only this time he was taking his screaming victim with him. Agent Resnick gave one more horrified scream before he was pulled backward into the inky darkness, leaving the room silent except for the burning hiss of the corrosive goo left behind. You might think this would be the end of it, but no. For poor Agent Resnick, the worst was yet to come. He was being dragged into what the SCP Foundation scientists refer to as the old man's pocket dimension, a miniature layer of reality within our own where the malicious SCP is essentially a cruel, all-powerful god. According to witness reports extracted from victims who were taken to this little nightmare realm, the dimension resembles a series of twisting, endless corridors where the old man stalks and tortures his captured victims to the breaking point, manipulating space and time to his own sadistic ends. On rare occasions, the SCP will even release its victims just for the joy of hunting, capturing, and torturing them all over again. While Agent Resnick was learning the true meaning of terror, containment specialists were mobilizing in its cell, preparing the one known tried and true method of luring the old man back, tempting it with the prospect of causing even more suffering. In order to do this, Foundation personnel take one of the aforementioned Class D personnel and begin inducing extreme pain by breaking a major bone or slicing a tendon every 20 minutes. The victim's agonizing screams are then played over the facility's intercom, acting as bait for the pain-loving old man. The screams echo through the facility's otherwise silent halls as the mutilated corpse of Agent Resnick falls from a new scorch mark on the ceiling. The old man can hear the sounds of suffering ringing out through the air around him, and he can barely contain his excitement over the prospect of a new plaything. The snapped femurs, the torn Achilles tendons, it was all too good to miss. Having had its twisted fun with the security officers and observers, SCP-106 wandered back to its containment cell, where a new screaming victim awaited. The other security officers, containment specialists, and scientists evacuated the area, leaving the old man alone with his prey. While the unfortunate Class D was left to his fate, the rest of the staff commenced cleanup procedures, which mainly involved wiping the brown and black mucus from the walls. It would probably be at least another month before anything like this happened again, and new personnel would be transferred over to the facility to replace the fallen. All in all, just another night at the SCP Foundation. SCP-5000 Gunshots echo down the concrete hallway of Site-22. Screams are the only thing that escape each room. A team of men in all black combat gear and masks move from one section of the complex to the next. Pietro Wilson hides in his office, listening to the cries for mercy of his colleagues. He shakes uncontrollably with fear. Who are they? He thinks. Why are they killing everyone? And how did they find us? Moments earlier, Pietro Wilson had been in the canteen eating dinner with other staff members. A group of heavily armed men entered the room. They stood silently surveying the area. One of the scientists stood up and asked if they could assist them. That's when the carnage started. One of the masked men raised his rifle and shot the scientist in the head. Chaos broke out as the other mercenaries raised their weapons and began firing. Bullets flew everywhere, and Pietro was lucky not to be struck or trampled as he escaped out the back door of the cafeteria. He ran to his office, slammed the door shut, and hid under his desk. Now he sits on the floor, with his legs pulled up to his chest, shaking uncontrollably. After a couple of minutes, he manages to take a deep breath and slows his heart rate. He regains control of his body, but is still filled with fear and adrenaline. Pietro crawls on his belly to his office door. He reaches up and pulls down on the handle. There's a slight click as the latch releases. He opens the door just a crack and peers out into the hallway. The flickering emergency lights illuminate the corridor for a few seconds at a time before plunging it back into darkness. There is no one in sight, but from around the corner, flashes of light from machine gun fire flickers down the hall. The screams of the workers at Site-22 are silenced. Pietro takes a deep breath and pushes the door open further. He crawls out of his office and starts moving away from the violence. Unfortunately, to get away from the mayhem, he must go deeper into the bowels of Site-22. The exit is the other way, but he is too scared to head towards the armed men. He stands up and brushes the dirt from his blue technician jumpsuit. The lights flicker off. The hallway goes dark. 
He reaches out his hands and comes into contact with the cool, damp wall. He feels his way down the corridor, swimming in darkness. After a few moments, the lights flicker back on. Pietro looks over his shoulder to make sure he is still in the clear. Standing at the end of the hall is a soldier dressed in all black with a mask covering his face. The soldier stands motionless. Pietro turns to face the soldier. His eyes open wide. His heart races. He can't breathe. The figure doesn't move. Then the lights flicker out again, and Pietro pushes off the wall and runs, blind in the darkness. He sprints as fast as he can when suddenly there is a loud crack and a bullet whizzes by his head. He can feel the wind as it barely misses his cheek. He continues to run. The lights flicker back on. He peers over his shoulder. Now there is an entire group of armed men pursuing him down the hallway, guns raised. He turns the corner of the hallway and proceeds down a set of stairs further into Site 22. At the bottom of the stairway, there is a short corridor with a door at the end of it. There is nowhere else to go. He pulls a key card out of his pocket and fumbles it. The card falls to the ground. Pietro bends down to pick it up, and as he leans over, a bullet whizzes past where his head had just been. The projectile embeds itself into the metal door. He scoops his keycard up off the ground and shoves it against the scanner. The door unlocks, and he dashes into the room. He quickly turns and shuts the door. It locks automatically. The last thing he sees is the assassins running towards the door. The lights flicker on in the room where Pietro stands. The room has only one door, no windows and no vents. It is completely isolated. In the middle of the room is SCP-5000. He knew there was an SCP in this room that was designated SCP-5000, but he never knew what it actually was. Here he is now, staring at it. A strange-looking mechanical harness hanging in the middle of the room. Suddenly, loud banging at the door fills the room. The armed men are trying to break in. It is only a matter of time before they pry the door open. With nowhere to go, Pietro Wilson knows that he is dead. He looks at SCP-5000 and shakes his head. What do I have to lose? He says out loud. Only your life. A voice in his head responds. He walks over to SCP-5000 and pulls it down from where it is hanging. It is heavy. On the mechanical suit are symbols he does not recognize. The only thing he knows about the suit are rumors he's heard from others who work at Site-22. Supposedly, it first appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of a Keter-level SCP at Site-62C. The designation of this Keter was SCP-579. The only other thing that Pietro knows is that everyone at Site-62C was slaughtered when containment was breached. SCP-5000 was found deactivated next to a pile of bodies. He slips on the harness, and as if it has a life of its own, SCP-5000 begins to adjust itself to the exact dimensions of his body. The suit grows and snakes across his skin, wrapping every appendage in armor. Then it begins to tighten. Pietro Wilson starts to scream as SCP-5000 envelops him. The suit rises up the back of his neck and encases his entire head, silencing his screams. The door to the room blasts open from a controlled explosion. As the dust and smoke settles, the masked men enter the room. Their flashlights move from side to side as they search for the elusive technician who had just entered. There is no one in the room. All that is there is an empty rack in the middle of the chamber. The men fan out, but there is no other exit. The room is just a solid square of concrete. They're baffled. Where did he go? One of them shouts. Pietro Wilson had blacked out from the pain of the suit attaching to his body. He comes to, still standing in the middle of the room. All around him are men in black combat gear. They are searching for him. He holds his breath and closes his eyes, but the gunshots never come. He opens one of his eyes and looks around. Why haven't they killed me yet? He thinks. He slowly turns his head as men walk by him with their guns raised. He hears someone say, Where did he go? I'm right here, he thinks. Am I dead? Pietro looks down to see that his entire body is contained within SCP-5000. He lifts his hand and waves it in front of his face. He is still clearly alive, but it seems as if the killers can't see him. He walks up to one of the mercenaries and waves his hand in front of the man's face. There is no reaction. The suit made me invisible, he thinks. Pietro looks at one of the men to see if he can find out who they are and why they have killed everyone at the base. On the sleeve of the man's jacket are the words Zeta-19. He's never heard of Zeta-19 before, but they must be part of an organization that is trying to undermine the SCP Foundation. The men continue to search the empty room, clearly confused as to where the technician went. Pietro weaves his way through the group of men and back out the door he had entered from. On his way through the wreckage that used to be a door, Pietro Wilson trips on some debris. He reaches out to steady himself, but he has fallen. He closes his eyes knowing that as soon as he hits the ground, 
All of the men hunting him will be alerted by the sound of his fall, but the impact never comes. When Pietro opens his eyes, it is as if he is hovering just above the ground. He looks down at his feet. The toes of the suit are firmly planted on the floor, like powerful magnets on iron. SCP-5000 has prevented his fall and is holding him in place using the feet of the suit only. He reaches out his hand and gently places it on the ground. He pushes himself up to a standing position. He turns to look back into the room. The men are still in there searching for him. Pietro makes his way back through Site-22. He walks by his office and proceeds towards the exit of the facility. As he passes the labs and other rooms at Site-22, all he finds is carnage. Everyone has been killed. An extra bullet has been placed in each person's head to make sure. It seems that the only mission these men were on was to kill everyone and make sure they stayed dead. He continues towards the exit of Site-22 that is guarded by two men. As he approaches the two heavily armed men, Pietro makes sure to be as quiet as possible. This is not a difficult task, as the SCP-5000 has given him stealth capabilities. He notices that even his footsteps aren't giving off any sound. It is almost as if the suit is allowing him to glide across the floor. He is almost to the exit, then he will be home free. He takes a deep breath, turns sideways, and squeezes past the two men guarding the doorway. Just as he is about to leave this nightmare behind, one of the guards turns unexpectedly. The man's shoulder runs directly into Pietro Wilson, throwing him off balance. He is knocked into the second guard. Both of the men scream, What is that? One of them shouts. They begin to raise their guns on the invisible object that just bumped into them. It's then that SCP-5000 takes over Pietro's body. The suit raises his arm and grabs one of the men by the throat. With a squeeze, the man's larynx is instantly crushed. Then the suit twists slightly and snaps the man's neck. It turns to face the second man. Even the black mask the man is wearing can't hide the look of terror on his face. But Pietro has no control over what SCP-5000 is doing. He has never killed before. The suit launches Pietro's body into the second man, pinning him against the wall. It then grabs the top of the mercenary's head and slams it against the concrete. Again, and again, and again, until the man's screams are silenced. The suit lets go of the man and his lifeless body slides to the ground as Pietro backs out. When he regains consciousness, he's outside of Site-22, standing on top of a hill, looking down at the facility below. He looks at his hands, then at the rest of his body. He is still contained within SCP-5000. There is a flash of light, and a heads-up display comes on. He doesn't recognize any of the symbols, but as his eyes move from one area of the screen to the next, the symbols become highlighted. Before his eyes, certain symbols began to translate into words he can read. One of the symbols now says, Journal Entry. Unsure of what else to do, Pietro begins recounting what happened to him at Site-22. He makes his way through the desert towards the nearest SCP Foundation safe house. He knows once there, he will be able to reach out to his superiors for help and further orders. Maybe he can even find a way to get SCP-5000 to release him. As he trudges along, Pietro Wilson notices that his brain is telling him he is thirsty, but the vitals on the suit's heads-up display say that he is in good health. In fact, he is better than good. His vitals are all perfect. The suit seems to be giving him all the nutrients his body needs. It has even fixed his busted knee that was injured back in college playing football. The joint itself has somehow been healed. Pietro finally reaches the safe house and opens the door. It is quiet and dusty. It looks as if no one has been there in years. He walks over to the communication station and tries to contact the Foundation, but all he gets is static. He gives up and walks over to the TV. He pushes the on button. The screen hisses to life. What he sees causes his jaw to drop. The world is at war. A war between humans and monsters. Whatever happened at Site-22 also happened at other Foundation sites. The SCPs have been let loose. Flying in a plane nowadays is about as safe as catching a ride on a bus or commuting on the subway. Of course, that doesn't stop people being afraid of flying. To some, the prospect of long-haul flights or feeling the shudder of turbulence are reasons to avoid planes altogether. And then, every year, there are stories of downed flights or those that go missing, all adding fuel to that aviophobia fire. Take, for example, the infamous Bermuda Triangle, that well-known region of the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. What does that have to do with the fear of flying? Well, famously, a high number of aircraft are believed to have mysteriously vanished while flying over the Bermuda Triangle. 
Their wreckage and passengers rarely ever recovered. Stories like that are enough to make anyone think twice about setting foot in a plane again. And then, there's SCP-787. As you may have already guessed, SCP-787 is a plane. Specifically, it is a Boeing 747-200, with a wingspan of nearly 200 feet and capable of seating over 800 passengers. The 747-200 is a part of the famous Boeing 747 family of aircraft. These are quad-engine commercial airliners, designed to be the safest ever built. The particular Boeing 747-200 that has since become known by the Foundation as SCP-787 is slightly different from one that might take you from your nearest airport to your long-awaited vacation, though. For one, SCP-787 has no known date of manufacture and no call sign, both which a standard Boeing aircraft would be expected to have. Additionally, the plane's entire exterior has been repainted. Strangely, even the windows have been painted over, and the paint was still wet when SCP-787 was first discovered. As for the inner workings, all of SCP-787's mechanical components, including its turbines, engines, and landing gear, are in perfect working order with no signs of any damage. In fact, the SCP Foundation's researchers aren't even sure that SCP-787 has actually flown since its construction. The plane's machinery looks so pristine that they might be brand new, with no detectable signs of any previous use. However, inside the main body of the plane, it seems to be a different story. Anything not mechanical, like the carpets and seats, have decayed over time. Perhaps strangest of all is the cockpit. Both the pilot's and co-pilot's chairs have been replaced with two masses of computer components arranged to take the shape of two chairs. So what, you might be thinking. After all, SCP-787 is, for all intents and purposes, just an ordinary plane. Not enough to put you off flying, right? Nothing more than a Boeing with a few little things off about it, like some missing seats and decaying upholstery. Well, there's that. And then there's the over 500 dead bodies on board. In June 1987, this flight of the dead was discovered several kilometers outside of the city of Bremerton in Washington state. The SCP Foundation moved in, securing the plane and swiftly getting it into containment. Now kept within a Foundation hangar, the interior of SCP-787 is monitored for 24 hours a day. Surveillance cameras and microphones are located within the cockpit, passenger areas, and even the plane's baggage hold, with recorded footage and sound relayed back to the Foundation. The idea of a plane filled with cadavers is certainly unnerving, and more than a little creepy. But why the need for all the surveillance? After all, the bodies on board are all dead, right? Surely they're not going anywhere. Well, let's talk about those bodies. How would you expect someone to die when they are aboard a plane? Maybe they'd be thrown around during a crash landing. Or perhaps a sudden depressurization might cause the passengers to suffocate due to lack of oxygen. Under normal circumstances, you might be right. But SCP-787 is no ordinary plane, and the passengers on board were not killed in ways you might expect from any ordinary aircraft accident. Referred to by research staff as SCP-787-A specimens, the cadavers aboard this particular Boeing 747-200 all have dramatically different causes of death. Some of the specimens show signs of strangulation. Others seem to have starved or drowned. Other bodies on board have injuries like gunshot or stab wounds, while further corpses look to have died as a result of blunt force trauma. A few have even been exsanguinated, that is, completely drained of all of their blood. One commonality among all the specimens on board SCP-787 is that some form of mutilation has occurred. 23 passengers had their tongues removed, a further 73 were scalped, 230 had Cyrillic letters carved into their left hands, and almost 500 of the passengers had their fingertips removed. Let's recap what we have so far. First, there's the Boeing 747-200, found randomly sitting in a field. Second, it's filled with over 500 mutilated bodies. And third, each one appears to have died from a cause you wouldn't typically expect from an airline accident. Seems strange enough. But of course, then there's the apparitions and noises that manifest inside SCP-787, which is why the Foundation keeps the plane under round-the-clock surveillance so they can monitor any anomalous activity taking place aboard this flight of the dead. 
Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter the plane during an anomalous occurrence have led to individuals being physically ejected from SCP-787, causing severe organ damage and internal bleeding for up to 72 hours. The anomalies that occur inside SCP-787 range from the presence of loud noises with no obvious source to the manifestation of strange human-shaped entities within the plane. The first anomalous occurrence recorded within SCP-787 was in 1988, when the sound of a loud pounding was heard against the doors and windows of the plane's left side. Two years later, a male voice could be heard from the onboard bathroom, repeating a singular phrase over and over. Philosophers always run from the advanced thickening treatment. In 1993, the plane's in-flight entertainment system seemed to be activated by itself. The overhead screen showed a bizarre choice of in-flight movie. Colorless pictures of a deceased man, accompanied by a female voice reading a gynecology book in Czech. The same year, the longest lasting of the SCP-787 anomalies took place. This time, the plane's fastened seatbelt sign spent almost four hours flickering while the first 15 seconds of Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit played on a loop over the onboard speakers. It wasn't until 1997 that the first of the humanoid entities appeared aboard SCP-787. This figure was indistinct, lacking any discernible detail, little more than just a human shape standing in the aisles. Observed by the Foundation's surveillance equipment, the figure was seen removing an emergency oxygen supply and mask from seat H-43. It stood perfectly still, wearing the passenger's breathing mask for over two minutes before removing the mask and disappearing from the view of the cameras placed on board. The figure did not appear anywhere else inside the plane. Another figure appeared four years later in 2001, sitting in the mass of computer parts that made up the co-pilot's chair. This figure, much like its predecessor, was indistinct in its features. For almost four minutes, it sat in the cockpit of the Boeing 747-200, just whimpering softly. Then it lurched forward, vomiting all over the console in front of it, before quickly disappearing like the first figure. SCP personnel collected a sample of the vomit the entity left behind. After performing an analysis of the sample, research staff found traces of nitrous oxide, thorium, bird droppings, and three human fingernails. At present, the origin of these humanoid figures is still unknown. Could these entities be the souls of the dead passengers, trying to offer insight into what happened aboard this flight? Or perhaps these indistinct human-shaped creatures are the ones responsible for the deaths of SCP-787's passengers? The next anomaly within SCP-787 occurred in 2005 when a female voice was recorded speaking through the onboard speaker system. The voice said, For your comfort and enjoyment today, pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Do not leave your seat. Leave your seat. Please. Pancakes will now be served. Yay! Pancakes. Exactly what the relevance of pancakes are to a plane full of bodies is still under investigation by the SCP Foundation. Next, in 2007, the Boeing's overhead emergency air masks fell from the ceiling, only to be snatched back upwards. They continued deploying and retracting for 14 minutes, while the plane was simultaneously filled with the noise of screams. Finally, the only other notable anomaly took place a year later, when the onboard temperature with an SCP-787 dropped 33 degrees from 20 to minus 13 Celsius in a matter of seconds. By the late 2000s, the Foundation's researchers was having little luck understanding the nature of SCP-787's anomalies. Instead, they turned their attention to identifying the bodies of the deceased passengers on board. Through the use of advanced forensics and population databases, these researchers attempted to determine where exactly these bodies had come from. Researchers still haven't determined if they all died on the plane, or if someone had exhumed them from graves before placing them aboard for some unknown reason. In fact, the answer was neither, and Foundation researchers discovered something that no one had expected. One of the passengers was still alive. To clarify, the body aboard SCP-787 was definitely still deceased, but researchers identified the cadaver as a retired optometrist from Atlanta, Georgia, who is still very much alive. Foundation agents found the man was simultaneously alive and well in his Atlanta home, but also dead on board the Boeing 747-200. The subject was interviewed by agents and had no prior knowledge of any incident taking place in June 1987 
when SCP-787 was first discovered. Even more interestingly, he claimed that he never even set foot aboard an airplane, which his wife and son both confirmed to be true. So what does this mean? How could the same man have been alive in Georgia and dead aboard SCP-787? Perhaps the answer can be found in a surprising place. The plane's toilet. Or to be more specific, the place where the things flushed in the toilet go to. Examinations of the airplane's waste storage tank have revealed something very surprising. There was one more SCP-787-A specimen that had been overlooked. It is unknown just how he got in there, but researchers discovered the body of an Indian man who looked to be in his 30s. The man, who was wearing a three-piece suit, was found to be carrying a number of puzzling items, including a surgical mask and gloves, an unloaded Beretta DT-10 shotgun, several cinnamon-flavored mints, a switchblade knife, an amulet that appears to depict the Eye of Horus, and a ticket stub for the Return of the Jedi with the number 92 written on the back. All of these objects seem to be completely random, and the Foundation has been unable to make sense of what they were doing on the man, or why his body does not seem to show the same state of decay as the rest of those found on board. There was one item that may hold some answers, though. For some reason, this man also possessed a copy of SCP-787's flight log. The log consisted of a series of coordinates, which were repeated 5,478 times. The coordinates point to a seemingly random spot in the Pacific Ocean, several hundred miles away from the infamous Pitcairn Islands, the island that the famous mutineers of the HMS Bounty settled after taking over the ship and leaving the captain adrift on the ocean. Is this location the secret to SCP-787? While none of this is confirmed nor denied by anyone at the SCP Foundation, one theory surrounding the area is that the location is another Bermuda Triangle-like location, one that contains some sort of temporal anomaly that unwitting planes fly through, only to find themselves displaced in time. Of course, the problem with this theory is that the man from Atlanta said he'd never been aboard a plane before or at least, not yet. It is entirely possible that SCP-787 is a plane that made a flight at some point in the not-too-distant future, only to arrive back in June 1987 by passing through a temporal breach in the area near the Pitcairn Islands. Sure, it might not explain what happened to everyone on board, but it could at least explain how SCP-787 arrived where and when it did. Every plane is fitted with a device that records flight data, in the event of a crash or other accident, known to most as the plane's black box, and researchers were able to uncover SCP-787s inside a compartment under one of the plane's seats. The recorder was found within a compartment filled with toxic asbestos and dried human blood. They hoped that perhaps it would contain some answers as to what exactly SCP-787 had come from and what had happened to its passengers. Sadly not. The flight data recorder contained no information besides one simple phrase, to be sorry. While an inexplicable mystery, SCP-787 is at least classified as a safe anomaly by the Foundation, seeing as it poses no realistic threat or shows signs of trying to break out of containment. The aircraft has only ever caused harm to anyone trying to enter during one of its sporadic anomalous events, but apart from that, it sits gathering dust in a hangar, just waiting for someone to crack its secrets. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a plane that's taking you to your South Pacific vacation, and the retired optometrist sitting next to you will remark that you're passing over the Pitcairn Islands, and you'll discover for yourself exactly what happened to SCP-787. In June of 1985, Mark Johnson and his wife of 10 years, Sophie, were on vacation in Myrtle Beach having a great time. While they relaxed on the sand, Sophie decided to take a picture of her husband for their scrapbook, so she pulled out the Polaroid Supercolor 645 that she'd bought specifically for the trip. She pressed the button, waiting for the picture to print, pulled it out, and shook it. What she expected to see was a shot of Mark lying on his beach towel. What she got was a picture of her husband in the arms of his secretary. They say that a picture speaks a thousand words, but this particular camera takes pictures that are worth even more than that. When developed, the pictures taken with this normal-looking Polaroid camera reveal the innermost desires of the person being photographed. Welcome to the story of SCP-978 the Desire Camera. The main reason the Foundation keeps SCP-978 under wraps is due to its use as an easy form of blackmail. 
All anyone with access to the camera would have to do is snap a few covert photos, and they'd have instant dirt on the world's most powerful people. To further stop this camera from falling into the wrong hands, the containment guidelines strictly forbid the use of the camera for anything other than simple documentation, and all uses of it must be thoroughly logged and checked. So, now that you know what the camera does, it's time to look at what kinds of strange and mysterious photos it's taken. After all, who doesn't want a chance to gain insight into the minds of the Foundation's most famous and dangerous inmates? First, to serve as a control, the team took a photo of a blue office chair. No change was recorded, proving that the camera didn't work on non-anomalous inanimate objects. Some of the earliest tests of the camera were the photos that the research team took of each other. One by one, the doctors and their assistants were photographed in neutral poses, smiling as if for a completely normal photo. Then they waited while the photos developed like normal Polaroids. Most of the research team had minimal changes in their photos. One was shown slouched in his chair drinking from a flask. One was shown in her civilian clothes getting ready to go home from work. One doctor was in the exact same pose, but with a different colored tie on. The last assistant photographed, however, had their picture come out wildly different than how they were posed. Their desire revealed by the camera was so shocking that it had to be redacted, and the assistant was placed on temporary psychiatric leave. Following this first successful test, the doctor in charge of the project ordered a second round of tests to be conducted, this time on a series of D-Class personnel. A picture of one D-Class, who was photographed while eating in the cafeteria, showed up as scuba diving on vacation with his wife and child. He was allowed to keep the picture afterwards. Another had a similar result. He was photographed in a neutral pose like the members of the research team had been, and when the picture developed, the D-Class was seen holding a smiling baby, whom he identified as his one-year-old daughter. After that, the results of the SCP-978 test started to get a little… well, weird. A notoriously twisted D-Class known as 7294 was photographed in his cell, and when the Polaroid developed, he was in the same cell playing a cello made out of a dismembered mannequin. D-217-017 was a late-stage victim of SCP-217, a virus that turns organic matter into metal. You would assume that her innermost desire would be to be cured of her disease. But when she was photographed in her cell, the resulting Polaroid showed her completely made of metal, kneeling and praying at the base of a black obelisk. One D-Class, who had been rendered comatose and was on life support, was photographed in their hospital room. Their picture showed them as only a limp, deflated skin in their photo. The photograph of another D-Class, who had become increasingly listless and apathetic since their integration into the D-Class program, resulted in a picture that was exactly the same as they appeared in reality except the light in their cell was slightly dimmer. Intrigued by these results, the research team wanted to see how the camera would react to SCP-148, a type of metal that blocks the psychic properties of other SCPs. A helmet was made from the material and placed on a D-Class who was given an adult magazine to read while his photo was taken. When the photo was developed, it was extremely blurry. Upon close analysis, the figure of the D-Class reading the magazine could still be made out, and around him the faint images of several nude people could be seen. The research team wanted to see if the results were the same when the camera was used on animals. Photos of the lab mice and rabbits showed them eating or mating in their respective Polaroids. A zebra finch was shown escaping its cage, while a guard dog and its handler were shown playing fetch in the park. When cockroaches were photographed, there was no difference visible between the picture and reality. But the most exciting test results came when the camera was tested on other SCPs. For a few of the SCPs tested, there was no visible difference between the picture and reality. This was the case for SCP-173 The Sculpture, SCP-343 nicknamed God, SCP-014, an immortal man who is, over time, being turned into concrete, and SCP-063, the world's best toothbrush. When SCP-035, better known as the Possessive Mask, was photographed in its glass case, the picture showed an unidentified individual wearing the mask, sitting on a throne and surrounded by three masked corpses. The team took a picture of SCP-043, 
a haunted copy of the White Album that was being interrogated while on a turntable. In the picture, the album was being returned to its sleeve. They then photographed SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, standing in his cell. In the picture, the Plague Doctor is hugging an unidentified small child and surrounded by instances of SCP-049-2. When they took a picture of SCP-050, a mischievous statue of a monkey reading a book, the result was predictably playful, given that SCP's history of pulling pranks. The photo that came out of the camera showed the camera itself, with another picture of itself coming out of the developing slot. Microscopic analysis revealed that this recursive photography kept going until the cameras in the pictures of the other cameras were too small to see. The team next photographed SCP-053, the young girl, and the photo was taken as the young girl was drawing with crayons in her cell. In the picture, she was riding through a sunny field on the back of her friend SCP-682. SCP-053 and SCP-682 were even wearing matching bows, dresses, and pink nail polish. When they took a picture of SCP-096, the shy guy though, the picture showed SCP-096's cell with nothing in it. SCP-085, the living 2D sketch known as Cassie, was photographed tinkering with a drawn car. In the developed photo, Cassie was engaged in the same activity, but both she and the car were now three-dimensional. The team took a photo of SCP-106, the old man, emerging from a wall within his cell. When the photo developed, it showed the old man roaming a wheat field near an old farmhouse. From the porch of the farmhouse, an older woman is greeting SCP-106 with open arms. They also took a photo of SCP-168, a sentient calculator sitting on a table in its containment cell. In the picture, a teenage boy is seen doing complex math homework using the calculator. Next to him on the table are thick textbooks with titles like Complicated Math, Difficult Math, and math you need your calculator for. The photo of SCP-261, a vending machine that dispenses snack products from alternate universes, showed the SCP in its usual hallway, almost completely buried in coins. SCP-507, an otherwise normal man who unwillingly teleports between dimensions, was photographed while eating in the cafeteria. The developed picture showed him dressed as a Foundation researcher, talking to other researchers. When SCP-682 was photographed, floating in its containment tank, the resulting picture showed the SCP surrounded by the corpses of all of the Foundation staff and mauling the person who had taken the photo. A researcher's note accompanying this photo reads, Well, that was predictable. Yes. Yes, it was. Just for the fun of it, the team also tested the camera's effects on a few other Foundation personnel. They took a photo of Dr. Bright while he was arguing with Dr. Clef. The picture that came out showed a tombstone engraved with the words, Jack Bright, resting at last. The team also took a photo of Dr. Clef as he stormed out in a huff following the argument. Given that Clef's face cannot be photographed, they were curious as to what the results would be. The picture showed little difference compared to reality, save for the fact that Clef's head was replaced by an image of a hand making a rude gesture. Upon closer examination of the photo, the team also realized that there was a young girl in the background who, strangely, had cloven hooves instead of feet. A young SCP-166, perhaps. The team then took a photo of Dr. Fisher holding his pet hamster, Contrary to expectations, the picture revealed not Dr. Fisher's desires, but the hamster's, showing the hamster sleeping peacefully in its cage, with Dr. Fisher nowhere to be seen. As you can see from these test logs, the effects of the camera are, well, inconsistent, with some photos showing very immediate, simple whims, and others showing the subject's deepest and most secret desires. While the researchers working with SCP-978 seemed like they had a lot of fun getting to peek into the minds of all their co-workers and test subjects, there's no telling what kind of pandemonium could be unleashed if someone on the outside ever got a chance to use it. Thankfully, the camera, which has been classified as safe for obvious reasons, is kept securely in security locker HJ-12 at Site-17, which means none of us have to worry about our own pictures taken by the desire camera leaking out. But if someone did get the camera out and took your picture, what do you think they'd see? There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation 
to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies. 
nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members, with the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer. The team split into two groups of eight, and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the Mirror Dimension Site-81, while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland, and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. Once inside Site-81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute, across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime's Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the Mirror Dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, 
they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared, death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers, I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch, since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682, or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some, are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly but you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits. 
Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long, with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it, and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature, and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. By judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal, Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffle seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-Class staff member, who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-Class subject, 
who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped, and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken, but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself. Its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though, as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices, using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031 providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef, possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person. The creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents, concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. 
The creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric. Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New, kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable. <sighs> here we go again. It's time to return to the acid-filled containment chamber of SCP-682, more commonly known as the hard-to-destroy reptile. We've spoken about him and the ways the SCP Foundation has attempted to destroy him in a previous video. But as we said back then, we really only scratched the surface of the huge number of insane ways the Foundation has tried to wipe this cranky lizard off the face of the Earth. Today, we're filling in some of the cracks and taking a look at the secret test logs detailing the Foundation's unsuccessful quest to finally destroy SCP-682. Some of these may surprise you, and if you're a real SCP expert, you may just recognize some familiar faces we meet along the way. Esteemed Foundation researcher Dr. Alto Clef, famed for his somewhat unconventional personality, entered the test chamber to see if he could intimidate the beast to death. This resulted in a long staring contest between Dr. Clef and 682. Towards the end of the competition, Dr. Clef began to lose his nerve. He tried to leave the room, only to find that the door was locked, causing him to swear loudly. Dr. Clef, who always tries to find the most direct solution to his problems, blew up the door with plastic explosives and ran off. The result? test failed. Next came SCP-662, a silver handbell that summons the supernaturally helpful butler, Mr. Deeds. When Mr. Deeds was summoned, Foundation researchers asked him if he could kill SCP-682. Deeds politely explained that he wouldn't be capable of killing 682, it's just too strong. When he asked if he could at least incapacitate 682, he replied that the best way to do this would be to poison himself and allow 682 to eat his body. But this, he reminded, would only be a temporary problem for the lizard. Another test failed. The Foundation brought in SCP-689, a terrifying soapstone statue of a sitting skeleton that can kill you if you see it and then stop paying attention to it. 682 first observed the statue, and then the Foundation turned off the lights. When they turned them back on, SCP-682 appeared to be dead in a puddle of gray and black liquid. D-Class personnel were sent in to confirm that 682 was actually dead, but it instead got up and killed them. Researchers theorized that 682's definition of life is not quite the same as ours, rendering 689's death-related powers ineffective. Test failed yet again. SCP-807 was next up to bat. 
This is an anomalous salmon-colored ceramic dinner plate with the words Last Chance Diner printed on the edges in white. Any food placed on it becomes irresistible by any definition, but when the food is consumed it causes immediate cardiac arrest due to the sudden clogging of arteries with fat. Researchers made a meal known as the 682 Special. 10 kilograms of rotten mead and sharpened bone splinters, 10 liters of rancid mayonnaise, 1 liter of potassium cyanide, and 1 kilogram of morphine hydrochloride, combined into a solid mass and transmuted by 807. When 682 consumed this disgusting meal, it appeared to collapse. However, when D-Class personnel were sent in again to see whether 682 was truly out for the count, multiple holes opened up in its body. These holes fired out high-pressure jets of blood, killing the nearby D-Classes and destroying the containment cell. 682 was fine afterwards. Another test failed. To kill 682, it seemed that the Foundation really needed to have God on their side. So they tried to recruit SCP-343, also known as God, to help them destroy the beast. However, when he entered the containment chamber, he somehow couldn't even see the beast. When researchers asked him whether he could kill 682, God replied, He's not one of mine. Deal with him yourself. Test failed before it even began. Next, the Foundation recruited SCP-524, a small white rabbit that can eat literally anything, including itself without being harmed. The rabbit was released into SCP-682's chamber, at which point it approached 682 and began to eat one of its legs. 682 roared in pain and scuttled up the wall, out of 524's reach, where it remained for a number of hours. At this point, SCP-524 seemed to become bored and began eating its way out of containment through a nearby wall. Test failed. Maybe the luck of the Irish was what the Foundation needed to finally put this monster to rest. They recruited SCP-1933, a fat man dressed as Santa Claus whose bodily fluids consist entirely of the alcoholic beverage known as Irish cream. If enough of this man's self-produced Irish cream is fed to something, they'll find that all of their bodily fluids have become Irish cream too, killing them. The Foundation fed large quantities of this Irish cream to SCP-682 and it actually had an effect, causing 682 to appear intoxicated, which was a promising sign. However, it soon vomited out a massive quantity of SCP-1933 bodily fluids turning the walls of its cell into Irish cream and allowing it to escape and wreak havoc. Test failed. Big time. The Foundation recruited the help of SCP-2337, an intelligent corncrake known as Dr. Spanko, with a voice so loud it can quite literally talk its victims to death if it speaks to them for an extended period of time. It was sent into SCP-682's chamber to attempt to destroy the beast, but 682 just told it to leave, and the talkative bird obliged by blowing away one of the chamber walls with a yell, allowing SCP-682 to breach containment again. Terrible job, Dr. Spanko. Test failed. The Foundation researchers were starting to get a little frustrated with their lack of progress, which you can no doubt sympathize with, and they even pitched the possibility of sending SCP-682 into an alternate dimension where perhaps it would enter into a stalemate against its alternate self. But this pitch was shot down by the O5 Council on the grounds that it was way, 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 way too risky. Back to the drawing board, by which we mean they literally transformed 682's skin into a kind of drawing board. SCP-2521 is an anomaly that manifests any time information about it is recorded and immediately grabs the source of the information, wrapping it in its tendrils and taking it away with it. The Foundation sought to take advantage of this by using a laser cutter to cut this anomalous information into SCP-682's side. However, this didn't have the results they were hoping for. SCP-2521 did turn up to take the information, but it only took the skin on which the information was carved. 682 survived and quickly grew back its skin. Test failed. Again. Researchers suggested tracking down SCP-169, an obscenely massive underwater creature known as the Leviathan, and feeding 682 to the beast. However, this idea was also immediately shot down by the O5 Council. If 682 did what it did best, which was surviving attacks and adding them to its own arsenal, then it might grow to the size of SCP-169. 
which would likely trigger an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. It simply was not worth the risk. Test failed before it even started. The Foundation released two specimens of SCP-939 into 682's test chamber. These voice-imitating, amnesia-inducing monsters have caused huge damage to human targets, so it was hoped that they may be able to do something to 682. But this hope turned out to be misplaced. Both specimens seemed extremely distressed by 682's presence, and refused to engage at all. 682 did not share the same apprehension about attacking. It charged in and brutally killed both before devouring their corpses. Test failed. In a very well-documented case, the adorable SCP-999 was introduced into 682's test chamber. The unassailable good vibes provided by 999 as well as an intense tickle fight did actually lead to the temporary incapacitation of SCP-682. However, the otherwise wholesome incident ended in tragedy when 682 adapted to the good vibes and was able to release a kind of violent laughter wave. This incapacitated much of the staff and allowed 682 to breach containment and go on another killing spree before being recontained. Test, once again, failed. The next test involved SCP-294, an anomalous coffee machine that can produce any liquid typed into its keypad. Foundation researchers requested SCP-682 Killer from the machine and were astounded by the results. During tests on the liquid with SCP-682 tissue samples, the liquid was surprisingly effective and caused the 682 tissue to decay and crumble. Tests on the living creature were similarly promising. The acid in 682's tank was temporarily lowered and one liter of SCP-682 killer was poured onto the reptile's head, causing that portion of its flesh to immediately decay. When the acid was returned, the same portion that had the liquid poured on it dissolved instantly. Test, well, not quite successful, but promising, and requiring further research. Foundation scientists believe that if they could one day get a large enough quantity of this liquid, they might have a viable option. But until then, the tests march on. For another experiment, they introduced SCP-055 into the containment chamber of SCP-682. SCP-055, also known as the self-keeping secret, is a mysterious anomaly that can only be described by what it isn't. For example, we know that SCP-055 is not round, but that was pretty much it. Now, however, we know something else about SCP-055 that it can't kill SCP-682. Test failed, but at least we know twice as much about SCP-055 as we did before. Next came SCP-082, better known as Fernand the Cannibal. Fernand was first presented a piece of flesh from 682, but rather than eating it, he inspected it and began to express joy that his friends still live. When introduced into 682's testing chamber, Ferdinand attempted to subdue the lizard and use it as his steed. 682 expressed an intense hatred for both Ferdinand and the idea of being ridden like a pony, and the two of them engaged in combat. Mobile task forces were eventually brought in to subdue both subjects. In a debrief interview, both hinted that they shared history prior to containment, but 682 was reluctant to talk about it further. Test entertaining, but still a failure. Researchers were becoming extremely frustrated with SCP-682's unwillingness to die, so they called in an SCP who responded to reason much better. SCP-049, the Plague Doctor. This sinister surgeon can kill with a touch, and the Foundation hoped that his abilities would extend to 682. However, the result was a dud. The Plague Doctor did touch 682, but it experienced no adverse effects and eventually swiped at the Doctor. Upon leaving, 049 reported feeling emotionally disturbed by his encounter with SCP-682. Yep, you guessed it. Test failed. If it gives you any indication of just how desperate the researchers were at this point, Dr. Graham pondered whether introducing 682 to a human with just as pessimistic and misanthropic feelings as itself would somehow pacify it. They sent in a particularly nasty D-Class, and the two spoke. Fascinatingly, 682 didn't attempt to harm this D-Class. They just shared their profane and bleak sentiments about the human race with one another. However, some of 682's opinions were a little too spicy for this D-Class. 
After listening to the reptile speak for 20 minutes, the D-Class fell into a catatonic state from the sheer depression of it all. He died not long after. One researcher suggested perhaps the worst idea of all, letting SCP-682 out into the wild, not even really to terminate it, just to see what it does. The scientists figured there would be some merit in analyzing the creature's behavior. This idea was submitted anonymously, of course. It seems even the most sadistic of researchers know better than to put their name on an idea like that. As you can probably guess, this request was shot down by the O5 Council. The note attached to the request by one of its members summed it up best. I'll tell you what it will do. It'll go out for a nice stroll, murder a few innocent people, go fishing, slaughter a few more innocent people, start up a tech company, eat a few more innocent people, go on a vacation to Florida, dismember a few more innocent people. I swear, when I find out who wrote this, you can personally enter 682's containment chamber to analyze him yourself. This has been far from an exhaustive account of all the different ways the SCP Foundation has tried to terminate SCP-682, but it shouldn't be surprising that all of their ideas have either been failures or were too risky to even try. Sadly for the SCP Foundation and the human race, it's likely we'll be dealing with SCP-682 for a long time to come. But do you have an idea for how you think 682 could finally be killed? Something that even the Foundation hasn't thought of to try? Let us know in the comments. The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming for us? This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power. Harak, Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE-616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the King often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies. Despite existing at different points in history, or them not having the means to communicate with one another, a number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who is expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there is no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why save? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet mm. King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, 
It's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the king, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the king's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public, a procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depeche Spivak. Dr. Montauk, who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure, and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers, and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the Children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. The alternative is the law of concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. 
Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King, ranting about the horrors of the modern world, how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life, for the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, a red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The king saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge. And in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no. And in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did 
something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to Safe and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped, and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. A tangled mass of yarn and ribbon sounds more like what you'd find in the back room of a craft store or a forgotten closet than a mysterious creature worthy of investigation. And yet that's exactly what SCP-066 appeared to be, or at least it did at first glance. But the SCP Foundation doesn't contain and study just anything, and there was, and still is, something incredibly strange just below the surface of SCP-066, also known as Eric's Toy. At first, Eric's toy seemed to be completely harmless and even helpful, a knot of string that produced strange but harmless items and effects. But the Foundation soon discovered a dark side to SCP-066. While it may be referred to as a toy, this is no mere plaything. SCP-066 weighs only about one kilogram and appears to be a braided bunch of yarn and ribbon, though there is no apparent musical capability within the strands of yarn and ribbon themselves. Music can be produced by moving individual strands one at a time. When it was first being studied, this SCP was composed of multicolored strings and ribbons, but it has since undergone a transformation and now presents an appearance somewhat different from its initial description. The strands of yarn and ribbon can be used to play the notes of a diatonic scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, though the research has not been able to determine just how SCP-066 produces music or any sound at all. SCP-066 was thought to be completely benign at first and was classified as safe, but following an incident known as Incident 066-2, its classification was adjusted to a subcategory of Euclid, Euclid Impetus. Euclid is a classification given to SCPs that are more difficult to contain than those classified as safe. Impetus in Latin means attack, and specifies that SCP-066 is not only Euclid class, but on the more aggressive side. While 066 is not always aggressive towards humans, the events of Incident 066-2 prove that it is highly unpredictable and should not be provoked. Like many SCPs, it proved that underestimating its capabilities can be a dangerous mistake. Before the incident, SCP-066 displayed only charming, if unusual, behavior. Various researchers spent their time playing random assortment of notes using its strings, curious about what would happen, and determined to record anything this unusual ball of string had to offer. They did not yet know that the creature was capable of any hostility, and went about their work with a lighthearted, carefree spirit. After playing an improvised six-note melody with the strands, a researcher was thrilled to find that SCP-066 was capable of shape-shifting. Its appearance changed to resemble a small calico kitten for 17 minutes. The kitten was incredibly friendly, rubbing its head against the researcher's glove hand and purring loudly. Ironically enough, the kitten also spent time playing with a piece of string. After the 17 minutes were up, the kitten transformed back into SCP-066's original form. A few days later, another researcher played a different melody on the strands and was surprised to find that, when they stopped, the music continued on its own. The sound of an acoustic guitar kicked in, accompanied by vocals with no visible source for either sound. The SCP then played a four-minute song with lyrics warning against the use of sharp objects without the supervision of a parent, especially scissors. After the song ended, the SCP was silent for the rest of the day. The following week, a research assistant used the strands of SCP-066 to play the opening notes of Happy Birthday, and a chocolate cupcake with a lit birthday candle appeared from within the braided strings. Against the warning of his peers, the assistant ate the cupcake. In response, the SCP played the rest of Happy Birthday, and the assistant suffered no adverse effects from the cupcake. All of this fun was brought to a swift end when one scientist suggested that a portion of SCP-066's yarn body be cut off and removed so that the specimen could be tested. 
On April 18, 2008, the event that would become known as Incident 066-2 took place. A young man known only as D-066-4437, or D, was assigned to the task. Naturally, he was a member of the highly disposable D-class personnel, but D was grateful for the opportunity, as most experiments of a similar nature involved quite a bit more obvious risk. It was a simple enough job. Take a pair of scissors, snip off some yarn, and bring it back to the lab for further study. It was hardly on the level of supervising 173, or being 682's latest chew toy. He entered the containment room, where SCP-066 was lying dormant and still, and approached it with scissors. He grabbed a small handful of string and started to cut. As soon as the scissors began to cut through the fabric, the SCP rolled out of his grasp. It came to a stop one meter away, where it started to make a high-pitched squeaking sound resembling the cry of a frightened rabbit. Unsure what to do and unprepared for this scenario, D approached the entity again. He snagged another fistful of yarn and cut, only for 066 to curl into a ball and roll away from him again, even faster this time. Once it was safely on the other side of the room and away from the scissors, it stopped moving. Only this time, it didn't squeak. Instead, for the very first time since its containment, it spoke in a deep, uncannily human voice and asked, Are you Eric? After recovering from his initial shock at hearing a voice come out of a massive string, D responded, No, I'm not. This answer said something off in SCP-066, and its form began to shift and change. The string wriggled around on the floor, unbraiding and wrapping around itself into a mound. The colors, previously a rainbow of shades, shifted until every strand was a blood red. Much to Dee's horror, the transformation was not yet complete. Small bumps began to emerge from the spaces between the strands of yarn, popping out all over the bright red mass. If that wasn't terrifying enough, suddenly, all together as one, they blinked open, revealing themselves to be over a dozen small eyes. Every single eye was focused at D, studying him, staring him down. SCP-066 then began to produce loud, abrupt, dissonant notes like someone banging on the keys of a piano. D had seen enough. He abandoned his task and fled the containment room. After this failed attempt to extract a sample, SCP-066's behavior and its treatment of personnel who interacted with it began to change dramatically. Before the incident, the SCP was largely dormant, only becoming active if a melody was played using its strands. Following the incident and its change of form, 066 began to move on its own. Long strands of its yarn body would move like tentacles, writhing and wriggling around at high speed. It no longer needed human interaction in order to produce sound or to produce any other effects. At the sight of any human, regardless of the human's behavior, the SCP would begin to react with sound and effect within six seconds. The first of these effects was noted by a research assistant who entered the SCP's containment facility a week after the incident with D. As she approached 066 to take notes about its current state and its new ability to move, a bee appeared out of nowhere. It stung the assistant and flew away before it could be captured. Weeks later, a team of 11 personnel were monitoring the SCP when it suddenly burst into a rendition of Beethoven's Second Symphony. It produced this music at a volume of over 140 decibels, permanently deafening three of the personnel and causing permanent hearing damage in the other eight. It was theorized that the SCP did this as an act of retribution for its perceived mistreatment. These personnel refused to work with SCP-066 again. When a new team was assigned to monitor the entity, everything seemed to be going well at first. It was moving around, flailing its tentacles of yarn at nothing in particular, and staring at the personnel with its many eyes, but otherwise was on its best behavior. Then, suddenly, every light in the room went dark and there was a complete loss of visibility. The lights were unable to be turned on for five hours, and any attempt at an alternate light source, such as a flashlight, was unsuccessful. It was as if the darkness in the room swallowed any and all light right up. It was similar to the oppressive darkness within SCP-087, or the unlimited black of SCP-3001's shadow dimension. The personnel in the room later reported hearing the sound of loud, labored breathing just behind their shoulders, though when they searched for a source of the sound, they could find nothing. There had been no recent anomalies reported or any additional hostile behavior. Instead, whenever it sees a new human, SCP-066 repeats the name Eric again and again in the same deep voice. Who is Eric? No one at the facility knows, or if they do, they have not reported it to any official channels. It is possible that the SCP was once owned by someone named Eric, 
and perhaps, given the circumstances under which SCP-066 first said the name, Eric attempted to cut the threads of the entity while it was in his care. Unfortunately, there are no official records of how SCP-066 was discovered, or why it was brought to the Foundation in the first place. Its origins remain murky and as mysterious as everything else about it. All that is known is that, whoever Eric is, SCP-066 is determined to find him. Once the SCP's class was changed from safe to Euclid, its containment procedures had to be adjusted. While it was previously kept in a simple room, it is now contained in a tungsten carbide box at its site's high-value item storage facility. Once a month, the box is inspected for damage to its interior. Due to the SCP's tendency to use its appendages to wear down the walls of the box over time, if there is any damage, SCP-066 is to be moved to a new box using a robotic arm that performs this transfer in less than three seconds. The Foundation has attempted to place recording devices in the box with the entity in order to monitor its behavior when there are no humans present, but the SCP destroys every recording device placed inside of its containment box, and any attempts to record its behavior when it is not being observed by humans have been unsuccessful. Whatever it's doing when there is no one around, it wants to keep a secret. On the surface, SCP-066 is one of the less frightening finds contained within the walls of the SCP Foundation. It does not have claws or teeth or the ability to cause mass deaths, but it has incredible, unpredictable capabilities and seems very capable of holding a grudge. There is so much that is unknown about it, from its origins, to its form, to its ability to manifest matter from nothing, and there is something deeply unsettling about this SCP's unpredictable behavior and increased hostility towards being observed. We do not know what it has done, and we do not know what it will do next. All we can do is wonder. As we ponder the nature of SCP-066, it does nothing but sit, staring with unblinking eyes, waiting for Eric to come back. The day-to-day -day routine of Dr. Gears consisted of a few constants. Piping hot cups of black, unsweetened coffee, plain dry wheat toast, the soothing sounds of his favorite white noise machine, and the endless carousel of experiments with SCP-914. Not that he was complaining, he was perfectly content to spend his time supervising one of the few anomalies he crossed paths with on a regular basis that was unlikely to kill or maim him in any way. Not that the Clockworks hadn't produced its fair share of unpredictable results over the years of extensive testing, it had definitely offered up more than a few surprises. And anyone who knew Dr. Gears knew that he was not especially fond of surprises. Dr. Bright had attempted to throw a surprise birthday party for the man once, but when he turned on the lights and fired the confetti cannon, all Dr. Gears did in response was give a deep sigh and say, Really, Jack? You're making a spectacle of yourself. Still, he had resigned himself long ago to the fact that supervising the experiments with SCP-914 meant witnessing some truly unpredictable outcomes. How could he forget the time Researcher Blas tested an incandescent light bulb on the setting very fine, and the machine spat out an anthropomorphic humanoid light bulb that spoke in German-accented English and claimed to be Thomas Edison himself? This was, of course, impossible, as historical records surely would have indicated if Thomas Edison was a walking, talking light bulb rather than a human man. The imposter was eventually incinerated after its presence became too irritating to ignore. And then there was the time researcher Thompson filled out a Dungeons & Dragons character sheet and placed it into the machine on the setting very fine. The output produced was a sheet of paper promoting the previously non-existent tabletop role-playing game Fear in the Foundation. Whenever a person read the paper, they would suddenly find themselves in an out-of-body experience where they were inside the game's world, which contained several characters related to the SCP Foundation, as well as items and locations based on real-world counterparts. A subject in this state would only snap back to reality after winning or dying in the game. Researcher Jacobson rolled a 1 on stealth and saw SCP-096's face in the game and was later found dead in the anomalous item storage wing. There was no shortage of Foundation staff trying to use the machine for personal gain, too. Dr. Naismith placed his credit card inside on the setting very fine, using it to produce a card covered in unidentified corporate insignias and reading, 
Rank Aleph Infinite Money Privileges. When Dr. Coltrane issued a written warning, Dr. Naismith took that warning and then placed it into the machine on the same setting, producing a piece of official documentation from the O5 Council in support of his infinite money privileges. Junior researcher Summers attempted to use SCP-914 in a misguided attempt at self-improvement, placing not an object, but herself in the intake booth before running the machine on the setting very fine. It cleared her skin, lengthened her hair, and improved her figure. This was, of course, in violation of several employee guidelines, and she was promptly dismissed after emerging from SCP-914. Dr. Veritas left a note in the experiment log following this incident, reading, By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated and I hope I don't need to tell you all not to do that again. And with that, the guideline was clear. No one was permitted to use SCP-914 for personal gain, or to change anything about themselves. Potential complications were too risky, not to mention the conflicts of interest that would be introduced into what should be an impartial research process. As Scientific Objectivity's biggest fan, Dr. Gears couldn't agree more. So as he settled in for the day's round of tests, he intended to keep a watchful eye on things and ensure that no funny business would take place. He didn't have much reason for concern, as his colleague Dr. Bonita prepped her research materials. She was working with two items, a small replica of Michelangelo's sculpture of David and a sealed envelope containing something that was to be handled with extreme caution, a photograph of SCP-096's face. She planned to place the items inside on the very fine setting, in an attempt to see what result might be produced from combining an ideal of traditional beauty standards with the image of a creature that felt such profound shame and distress as its own appearance that it would destroy anyone who looked at its face. Like any good scientist, Dr. Bonita wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from her experiment. So as she placed her items inside the intake booth, she slowly, delicately unsealed the envelope. She wanted to put the picture inside by itself, without the extra element of the envelope potentially complicating things. Unfortunately, like Marie Curie slowly, unintentionally poisoning herself with her own research materials, she didn't truly understand the danger of what she held in her hands. Just as she was setting the photograph down, her eyes flickered to the image. Before she could stop herself, before she could even look away or squeeze her eyes shut, she caught a glimpse of the one thing she should never look at, SCP-096's face. She gasped and slammed the photograph down, but she knew it was too late. The sound of an inhuman shriek coming from across the facility signaled that she was right. It was coming for her, and nothing in the world could stop it. In a containment cell on the other side of the facility, Foundation staff were horrified as they heard the telltale scream of an enraged SCP-096. The pale, thin creature, once huddled in the corner silently, had stretched to its full height of 2.38 meters and was screaming, sobbing, wailing, and gibberish, and beginning to tear its way out of its chamber. Guards tried their best to subdue the entity, firing their weapons at it, but the bullets did nothing to damage the creature's pale flesh or stop its movements. It ripped through the steel cube that contained it and knocked the guards out of its way with one swipe of its unnaturally long arms, sending them careening into a nearby wall. Fortunately for them, SCP-096 only knocked them unconscious. It didn't stop to harm them further, as it had a more important goal in mind. Find the person who had seen its face and destroy them. As the alarm blared, signifying a high threat level containment breach, SCP-096 loped down the hall toward Dr. Bonita in SCP-914's room. Dr. Gears had not spotted Dr. Bonita's grave mistake and had no idea what had triggered the alarm he was hearing. He stepped away from the observation window, turning his attention to the crisis that was clearly happening somewhere else in the facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was panicking. She saw her life flash before her eyes, the certainty of impending doom that was coming for her and coming fast all because of one brief error in judgment. What could she do? There was nowhere to hide, no way she could run away fast enough, unless if she managed to lure 096 into the intake booth and start the machine while the creature was inside, maybe it would transform into something less intent on tearing her limb from limb. 
It was a risky move, and one that could jeopardize her position at the Foundation, but she couldn't very well keep her job if she was dead, so it seemed like it just might be worth a shot. A primal roar of agony and fury interrupted her thoughts, and she knew that SCP-096 was moments away from breaking down the door and getting its hands on her. She would have to move fast. With a screeching grind of metal on metal, SCP-096 wrenched the door off its hinges and barreled into the room in its search for the person who had seen its face. It ran toward the silhouette of Dr. Bonita standing just at the entrance to the intake booth. She tucked and rolled out of the way just as the monster entered the booth. The door automatically slid shut behind it, and as SCP-096 rattled the door and tried to free itself, she turned the knob to very fine with every ounce of strength and speed she had. There was a ding of a small bell, and the machine whirred to life as the objects inside were refined. Dr. Bonita had no idea what would be waiting for her in the output booth, but she could only hope that her last-ditch effort had managed to save her life. In the fog of panic, she briefly felt an itch of scientific curiosity, too. What would become of a being like SCP-096 in a machine as strange and wonderful as SCP-914? What would the addition of the statue do to it? As the door to the outtake booth slid open, steam poured out. It appeared her questions would soon be answered. Cautiously, in spite of herself, Dr. Bonita called out, Hello? No one answered, but she heard the sound of footsteps, slow and careful, as a figure emerged from the mist. She covered her mouth in shock, her eyes wide. Dear God. She whispered in awe. Standing in front of her with pale, smooth skin and the same imposing stature was the most beautiful man she had ever seen. Wide, dark eyes shone under thick, sculpted eyebrows. Under the eyes, an aquiline nose, full, pouty lips, a strong, sharp jawline. His head was topped with a tangle of lustrous, dark curls. It was the kind of hair she had only seen flowing in the wind on the covers of the romance novels she wanted desperately to buy but was too embarrassed to be seen purchasing. His physique was, well, statuesque, like the build of the very Michelangelo sculpture she had placed into the machine just moments ago. There was no other way to say it. He was handsome, despite still being a little lanky and nine feet tall. He peered at her curiously, towering over her in a way that had been terrifying in his former shape, but now made her heart skip a beat in an entirely different way. Hi, was all she could think to say. Was she blushing? She shook her head, snapping herself out of it. She was a scientist, damn it, not some giddy schoolgirl passing notes in class. This was an incredible achievement, something she would need to study thoroughly, and she very much wanted to study him thoroughly. Nope, no time for that. She needed to write up a report, to inform her superiors, to try her best not to lose her job over this. She had to remain professional. Hi. The man that had once been, or perhaps still was, SCP-096 spoke. Oh, you, you can talk. Dr. Bonita laughed in surprise. The man's brow furrowed. His newfound ability to speak was a surprise to him too, it seemed. Yes, I can. What happened to me? Yes, yeah, stumbling over his words slightly, getting used to the feeling of them. You ran into the machine. She gestured to SCP-914. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but you're very different now. He nodded. I feel different. I feel calm. He sighed, the relief plain on his face before a shadow of sadness fell over him. I don't think I have to hurt anymore. I, I'm sorry for what I did before. Dr. Bonita did not know what to say. How do you respond when something you've been studying from afar, been horrified and fascinated by an equal measure, looks at you with a new, beautiful face and apologizes for all the harm it caused? This whole experience was so surreal that she might think she was dreaming if she didn't work at a place that was one long waking dream, or nightmare, depending on the day. Uh, Dr. Bonita, there's been a containment breach. Are you all right? Dr. Gears had returned to the room taking in the sight of the destruction left in 096's way. I'm fine, she called to him, and he followed her voice into the room, then stopped at the sight of the transformed anomaly. Hmm. I don't have time for whatever this is. I trust you'll handle it. Dr. Gears took a long sip of his coffee, and taking Bonita's shock silence as confirmation, 
had a leisurely stroll back to his office. A few moments later, the guards responsible for containing SCP-096 arrived on the scene, expecting to see carnage and find a docile SCP-096 crouched over a lifeless body, but instead, they found the same truly bizarre sight that Dr. Gears had shrugged off, and Dr. Bonita was still doing her best to process. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, but quickly lowered them, scratching their heads in confusion instead before radioing their superiors and asking for further instructions. Responses from various Foundation staff who caught a glimpse of SCP-096's bold new look included, Oh, would you look at that? Who's that guy? He's what? And in the words of Dr. Jack Bright, Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Dr. Bright also proposed making the new SCP-096 a TikTok account and YouTube channel, seeking modeling representation for him, or selling a novelty calendar filled with pictures of 096 in various costumes. These would be, in his words, quote, excellent ways to increase revenue for the Foundation. So, really, you're the weird ones now for thinking my ideas are weird. Dr. Bright was asked to leave SCP-096 alone and stop trying to take his headshot. In the days that followed the incident with SCP-914, the SCP Foundation was at a loss about what to do with this new, seemingly harmless version of SCP-096. Dozens of D-Class were brought in to look at his face and see if the entity would still enter one of his rage states after a few days of getting used to his new form, but he never did. No screaming, no swallowing people whole, nothing more than a polite, if somewhat shy greeting and a courteous, how are you doing today? The D-Classes were relieved but confused about being pulled from their cells just to stare at some random handsome man. Dr. Clef suggested dissecting SCP-096 to see what his new body looked like on the inside. This request was denied. Several interviews were conducted to evaluate SCP-096's mental and emotional state. Now that the anomaly was capable of coherent speech, it was much simpler to evaluate the potential threat level he might pose. Every researcher who spoke with him came to the same conclusion. Gone was the danger of the old SCP-096. He had not just become beautiful in a classical, superficial sense, but he had become beautiful on the inside as well. Interviewers reported a warm, friendly demeanor, a talent for engaging in conversation once he was made to feel comfortable, and a sincere interest in the thoughts, opinions, and feelings of those he spoke with. There was only one thing left to do, to make sure that SCP-096 had really changed from something deadly to something almost resembling an ordinary person. A photograph of SCP-096's face, of its original face, was removed from a secure vault by a D-Class. Then, the D-Class was sent into a room with SCP-096 and instructed to place the photograph on the table. SCP-096 looked down at what had once been his face, and his eyes filled with tears. A soft, broken sob left his lips, and he wrapped his arms around himself, hunching over as if in physical pain. Outside the room, guards prepared to handle things if 096 began to attack. Instead, he wiped his tears, took a deep, shuddering breath, and looked at the D-Class with a somber expression. He picked up the photograph on the table and tore it in half, as he finally summoned the strength to speak. Please, get rid of these. That is not who I am anymore. At Dr. Bonita's strong insistence, backed up by the conclusions of the research staff who interviewed SCP-096, a reevaluation of the entity's containment measure was ordered. It seemed cruel and unnecessary waste of resources to keep 096 trapped in a steel cube in its current form. He would be moved to a standard humanoid containment cell and treated as well as other safe class anomalies provided with books, films, food, and drink upon request and, of course, other comforts. Of course, the O5 Council insisted on evaluating the entity before any of these changes could be approved. Dressed in a specially tailored suit provided by Dr. Bonita, SCP-096 appeared before the Council to present his case. I know that I might not have the best record at the Foundation. I've done a lot of damage over the years, though, let's be honest, you all aren't exactly innocent either. Sorry, that was an attempt at a joke. I'm still very new to talking. All I can say is please consider giving me another chance to make a real life here, to make this place my home. Thank you for your time. What SCP-096 didn't know is that the O5 Council was so flabbergasted by the sight of his new face that they didn't retain a single word he said. They had all given their official approval before he even finished his short presentation. Before long, SCP-096 was moved out of his steel cube and into a new containment chamber, 
that resemble the mid-range studio apartment, complete with a bed, a kitchenette, a television, and a table and chairs. He was provided access to all major streaming platforms, as well as a large stack of books to help him develop his grasp of culture and language after so very long being isolated from human society. Though he wasn't exactly human, he was determined to act like it. Word quickly spread around the Foundation site, and humans and anomalies alike flocked to SCP-096's new home to visit him and see the miraculous transformation for themselves. SCP-999 was the first to come and see the new and improved 096, chirping excitedly as it oozed into his room. He pet the slime gently, his face breaking into a warm smile as its euphoric effect washed over him. The slime became so excited at meeting this new friend, someone it had known as a source of sadness and hurt for so long, that it tackled him to the ground and tickled him for several minutes. 096 laughing uproariously all the while, SCP-343 stopped by to give 096 his blessing and wish him well in this new chapter of life. A few days later, SCP-507 popped back into the site and wanted to see the changes for himself. He was thoroughly impressed, though privately confessed to missing 096's more monstrous form, which reminded him of some of his favorite cryptids. There was one anomaly that was not thrilled with the appearance of SCP-096, however. SCP-056 was furious upon hearing about the new beautiful man that everyone just couldn't shut up about. It demanded a chance to speak to SCP-096 and to tell him that this place isn't big enough for the both of us. I'm the fairest one of all, you sniveling little worm. But the request was denied. SCP-056 sulked about it for several weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was still intent on getting to know SCP-096 better. During previous testing with SCP-978, the desire camera, a photo taken of SCP-096 revealed that his greatest desire was to disappear. Curious about the results would be now, Dr. Bonita received permission to take another picture of SCP-096. She snapped the photo while 096 was sitting in a chair in his new containment chamber, looking directly at the camera. When the photo developed, the result was simple. Everything in the picture was exactly the same with one exception. Dr. Bonita was pictured sitting next to 096, her hand clasped in his. Both were smiling soft, contented smiles. When she showed him the photograph, he smiled at her and shook his head. It really is an amazing camera. She flushed. Doctor, before you go, could I ask your name? Dr. Bonita smiled and nodded. It's Isabel. What should I call you? SCP-096 paused thoughtfully for a moment. He was giving himself a name for the very first time, allowing himself an identity other than a strange, hollow, pale thing that existed to cry and suffer and hurt. Finally, he answered her. Call me David. A very strange anomaly sits in a humanoid containment cell in the minimum security wing of Site-17. He walks, talks, and looks like a man, but everything else is convoluted in a question mark. This is SCP-343, who, like his namesake, God, is likely to cause arguments whenever he's brought up. Is he the creator of all that exists, the basis for the Abrahamic faiths, or is he a pretender? a reality warper with immense power and predilection towards delusion, a courtesian of the house of Maladrog, Matthew, Methuselah, Yahweh, who knows? Really, it depends on who you ask, and which stories you choose to believe, and few people enjoy a good story more than SCP-343 himself. If one day you take the time to visit him in his room and ask him to reveal a page in the long book of his personal history, he might be kind enough to tell you a story. A story like this, of an encounter with something monstrous that few others could hope to survive meeting face to face. Rewind a few thousand years. Nobody knows how many, exactly. God, as he chooses to dub himself, walked across the cracked ground on worn sandals. It'd been some time since he'd seen an animal around here, and even longer since he'd seen a human being. Not that this bothered him. He'd never been bothered by his own company on a long walk like this. Of course, he could have sped up time or teleported, but where was the fun in that? He was a tourist in the world of sensation, of experience, of flesh, bone, dirt, blood, and sand. After all, where's the fun in creating a whole universe if you can't drop in now and then to visit and do as the Romans do? Not that the Romans would be around for another few thousand years, 
Even Atlas must occasionally shift the weight of the globe from his shoulders for a jaunt around the cosmic neighborhood and whatever passes for fresh air in the vacuum. God whistled a tune to himself. It was a craggy, mountainous region he'd found himself in. The distant peaks had frosted caps, a breathtaking place where many truly had their breaths taken away. How humans will so happily risk their lives to do something extraordinary. It never ceased to amaze him. His stomach rumbled. Oh, how he enjoyed that sensation. One of the funny little quirks of this human form that he weaved for himself. It was no reason to be concerned. If memory served, from his last trip through the area a few decades before, there was a friendly village not far from here. They had always accepted him as a genial stranger, having no knowledge of his true power. God had always believed that a person's goodness is defined by how they treat those from whom they had nothing to gain. So it caused him great concern as he approached the village and saw great plumes of smoke rising into the sky. He was so shocked by this that he could decide to break his rule about walking as a man in case there was still some way he could help. With a snap of his fingers, he disappeared and reappeared in the center of the village's town square. Total devastation. Huts and houses had been torn asunder. Broken weapons lay on the ground. Some places were on fire. Others smeared with streaks of blood, like some terrible battle had occurred here. But something was wrong. No bodies, not one, from defender or assailant. How could a thriving village be so thoroughly destroyed and not leave a single corpse? It was an act so bizarre and depraved that it left even God puzzling. That was another downside of his human form. Here on Earth, he didn't have access to true omniscience. How could a mere human mind, bound by the constraints of linear time, ever truly comprehend the total of existence? Even attempting to do that here would melt the brain of his human body in its skull and leave it dribbling out of his nose and ears. Instead, he chose to walk around the ruins of the village and investigate firsthand. Arrows and broken spears and swords littered the ground. Some buildings were demolished but there were no tracks or stray projectiles that could suggest the presence of siege weapons. No, these buildings looked like they were ripped apart. Some even still had claw marks. What terrible beast could have set upon this town and done this? Then he heard a voice, quiet and pleading beneath some nearby rubble. A survivor, he rushed over to the pile and evaporated it with a thought. Underneath a feeble old man, covered in stone dust, was quivering. God helped him up and guided him into one of the few remaining huts still standing in the village. They both took seats. God held up two hands, cradling empty space. Two cups suddenly occupied that space, both filled with warm, healing tea. He passed the old man one of the cups while sipping from his own. He asked the old man if he'd seen what had happened. The old man told him no, he hadn't seen anything in decades. He'd been rendered blind in his youth. Little did either of them know that very blindness was the only reason he was the sole survivor of the massacre. The blind man told God that one of the village's scouts had gone up into the mountain with a small hunting party. The group was gone for days until one of the members, the youngest among them, returned weeping, frostbitten, and covered in blood. He said that his friends had been killed by a beast in the mountains, something that almost looked like a man but terribly wrong, and its face, its awful, awful face. He would never forget it. He was just lucky to escape with his life when the others were torn apart. But when the young man returned, he'd brought the shadow of death with him. It was a curse that doomed the entire village, men, women, and children, to a terrible fate. And that fate was upon them a mere hour after the survivor had returned. Of course, there were gaps in the blind man's understanding, given he was lacking one of his major senses, but the sounds he could describe with perfect clarity. It was faint and distant at first, that awful wail and the galloping, hands and feet thundering against the ground faster than any horse could move, getting closer and closer. Another villager saw it approaching and screamed. Then it was upon them. The villagers screamed, but it screamed louder always wailing and shrieking and sobbing like a monster crawling straight up from hell. People tried to fight it by the sounds of it, 
The blind man with teary blank eyes recalled the sounds of arrows knocking and swords clashing against something. But even their greatest warriors had screamed and died. Those who saw it and tried to flee and hide were slaughtered all the same. Soon enough, there were only two sounds left in the village, the monster and the blind man, both weeping. He didn't understand why it never took him. It wasn't fair. It took everything else. To leave him here alive when everyone and everything he'd ever known was destroyed was a greater punishment than even death. After killing all of these innocents, the monster had simply wandered off to the mountains again, the sound of its quiet sobs getting smaller and smaller until it was gone altogether. God comforted the blind man as he wept for the loss of all his loved ones. He told the blind man that he would venture up to the mountains himself and confront the creature on its own territory, and at the very least, find out why it had done this terrible thing. But first, he must relocate the blind man to a safer place. He placed a hand on the blind man's shoulder and he vanished. He would appear in another friendly village miles away. God sent a silent message into the minds of every villager. Take good care of this man. He has undergone horrors you can't even imagine. Your kindness will be rewarded later. For that, you have my promise. God sighed and turned his tired eyes to the distant mountains. A monster lurked up there, perhaps one of his own creations, or maybe a corruption of one of his creations. Either way, whatever existed without his knowledge existed without his consent and he intended to know of the beast in the mountains. Though given what he'd seen already, he didn't expect to receive a warm welcome from this murderous demon. Miles away up in the mountains, the creature licked the blood from its cracked lips. It looked like it might have once been a human being or something that aspired to humanity or mocked it with its very existence. It was a huge, gangling beast, Skin alablaster, eyes empty and soulless, dribbling rivulets of burning tears down a hideous, gaunt face. It crawled into the frozen mouth of a cave with great icicle fangs, wheezing and weeping. All it ever wanted was to be alone. Why did they have to keep interfering? Didn't they know what happened? All the terrible things they made it do. The creature curled its long, gangly body into the fetal position scratching great ruts into the sides of its bald cranium with long, sharp fingers. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And then there was a brilliant flash just a few feet away. The monster was surprised. It turned to see a figure silhouetted in the mouth of the cave. He wore sandals and thin robes. His eyes glowed with a kind of power that the monster didn't recognize. This stranger stared at the monster without an ounce of fear in his heart. He stared right into its eyes, unwavering. No, 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 no! He could feel it again, the rage bubbling up deep down. A cauldron of seething anger, it hated the feeling like being lowered into a vat of molten metal. Unspeakable fire and pain coursing through every vessel. It began to weep and scream while the stranger in the cave mouth just watched, not moving a muscle. Do you know who I am? The stranger asked with a deep voice that betrayed almost infinite power, knowledge, and wisdom. But it wouldn't change the outcome here. The monster bounded at him at speeds that wouldn't be seen again until jet planes and bullet trains are invented millennia into the future. Its jaws were hanging impossibly wide, fangs born, its arms extended and deadly claws ready to strike. But before those terrible hands could close around the stranger, he vanished. The monster stumbled and rolled across the snow, confused. What trickery was being used here? I'll take that as a no, said the voice from behind him. You ought to show your father some respect. More respect than you gave to those poor people down in the village, at least. Seething, the creature turned and saw the stranger standing back in the darkness of the cave, staring at him. But the beast didn't have the capacity for awe or holy terror. Only violence. Boundless, limitless, unstoppable violence. It darted towards the stranger again, trying to strike him. Somehow it was like fighting in an empty robe. Not a single one of its deadly strikes seemed to hit the stranger. The stranger leaped backwards, putting some space between himself and the monster, but still not breaking a sweat. He breathed in deeply, then exhaled. 
The breath came out like a mighty typhoon, shocking even the monster with its sudden force. It was blown backwards a leaf in the wind, until its long claws dug into the ground and anchored it in place. The stranger gave a wry smile at this, impressed. My, my, you're certainly a tenacious one, aren't you? He said. Perhaps we can talk for a little while instead of fighting. I want to know why you killed all those people. No answer. The beast roared, its mighty limbs pounding into the ground as it closed the gap between itself and the stranger in fractions of a second. It would kill him, rend him, destroy him just like all the others. He'd left it no choice. Suddenly, the ground below it seemed to give way. The creature was confused. It looked down to see that the ancient stone below had somehow taken on the properties of a liquid, and it was sinking. The beast panicked and it began to thrash. It was a strong swimmer, but it didn't expect to need to swim here. The shock was too much, and soon the ground submerged it entirely, muffling its terrible roars and shrieks. And just like that, the ground was solid again, trapping the beast inside. The stranger stepped forward and looked at the ground. A much needed time out, he said. You do yourself no good struggling like this. Despite its terrible capacity for evil, God couldn't help but admire the beast, at least on the level of construction. It was so pared down, so unburdened, a killer to the core but seemingly unkillable. Had he made this creature? Billions of species and the species those in turn had created through billions of years of breeding and evolution, and somewhere along the line, this thing happened. It was easy even for the universe's creator to lose track of some of the tinier variables. And in the grand scheme of things, even this monster was still a tiny variable. But right here, right now, it was still one hell of a problem. The ground rumbled below God, cracks formed, the mountain peak shook. God raised an eyebrow, genuinely impressed, as the monster ripped free of its stone prison and re-entered the fray. It roared and screamed still, its blank eyes fixed on him, its skeletal body throbbed and heaved with power. Unlike any other creature in nature, it was almost like the longer their conflict went on, the more energized the beast became. God sighed. All those poor villagers. They never stood a chance against this monster. It lunged for him, even faster and stronger than before. He teleported out of the way in the nick of time, and the beast's claws cleaved through a nearby cave wall, effortless. God materialized nearby, but he didn't have time to speak. The beast lunged again and again and again. Every time he reappeared, the beast went for him with impossible speed. Deciding to widen the playing field, God teleported to the top of the mountain. The creature, somehow sensing his presence, vaulted upwards and tunneled through the roof of the cave, bursting out of the ground in front of God, who was floating just slightly off the ground. It would be wise of you to stop. God carefully intoned. All this time, you know, I've been going easy on you. You don't want to find out what the wrath of God looks like. Storm clouds were gathering above. Mighty thunder roared across the sky. The beast was undeterred. It roared and galloped towards God, and God in turn called down a response. A volley of lightning the likes of which the world has never seen before or since struck down on the charging monster. The sudden white flash could sting the eyes from miles away. The monster shrieked from the blast, feeling its flesh lift off its bones and atomize in the sheer heat of the electricity around it. It could smell itself cooking. The lightning blast only lasted for a few seconds, but for the beast, it felt like eternity. When the onslaught stopped, the air was still heavy with electrical potential. God stared down at the black scorch mark on the side of the mountain where the creature had been standing. All the snow within a mile had been evaporated by the blast. It was a raw display of the power of nature that would make even Zeus tremble in his sandals. And yet, there was still movement. Something started to get up from the burnt patch where nothing should be left alive. A blackened skeleton, rising shakily from the ash but still very much alive. As it started to rise, new flesh began growing over its bones little by little. Even God was astonished by the sight of it. He'd never seen a creature cling so ardently to life in spite of having truly unsurmountable power amassed against it. It was up against God, 
and still it fought. The monster tottered on its freakishly long limbs, still disoriented, unusually staggered for a creature driven by such single-minded violent purpose. When enough of its face grew back to do so, it began to weep and sob again, tears streaking down its terrible face. Looking at this creature after all of this, God couldn't help but feel a new emotion, pity. He lowered himself to the ground and approached the creature, like none had ever done before. He gathered it up into his arms and he held it, feeling its heaving, wretched sobs against him. The beast was in so much pain, he could feel it radiating from within. Speak, my son. God said in a soft, fatherly voice. And for the first and only time, the monster spoke. Can can see? <coughs> Make me a people. Known what a people can look. Can look. Please. That was all it managed to choke out before devolving back into unintelligible babble. But it was enough. Enough for God to understand its pain. He did not know if it would be right to change the monster's nature. Is it ever right to truly change anyone's nature? But it was within his almost limitless power to grant it one reprieve from pain. He settled the beast in the snow below him. It was quiet and still. And God said unto the beast, Rest now, child. Rest for thousands of years if you must. I hope only that when you eventually awaken, you feel differently. And so another story from the catalog of SCP-343. Of course, it leaves us with certain questions, mm. chief among them being, is it true? Did 343 and 096 have this chance encounter long ago? Or is this just another tall tale from an anomaly who fancies himself a deity? We have our truth and you have yours. SCP-1730 is one of the biggest threats the Foundation has ever faced. SCP-1730 does not exist. It was June 5th when the compound was first discovered, a large complex of structures in rural Texas, about 15 kilometers northwest of the Mexican border, located in Big Bend Ranch State Park. It was easily the biggest structure in the area, but there was no record of any such structure ever being built. A massive network of power stations, containment facilities, and research buildings, SCP-1730 looked like it had been abandoned for a long time. The exterior was degraded, but the building was still operating. A power generator had been running for an indeterminate amount of time. Even as the infrastructure degraded, power flickered through the site and fuel leaked frequently, but there was one detail that attracted the attention of SCP brass. SCP-1730 bore identifying markings linking it to Foundation Site 13, a research facility that was marked for construction near Nome, Alaska. But Site 13 had never been built, having been abandoned in the planning stages. So why is it in the middle of Texas, fully constructed and long abandoned? The Foundation needed to know more, and they needed their best to investigate. It was time to call in the Game Wardens. Apollo 3, the mobile task force used to investigate dangerous sites, was brought in, and five elite agents were briefed and sent in. Ross, Houston, Noah, Ohalo, and Vigo. It didn't take long for them to discover that something was very wrong with the site of SCP-1730. The facility was located in the middle of South Texas, but the local flora surrounding it was native to Nome, Alaska. Something had transported a building that shouldn't exist to another place and time. Commander Ross ordered his men to enter, with Houston taking the lead. They discovered that the entry led down a long staircase. They descended slowly, following a strange light that no one could identify, but had a sudden shock when they discovered that the basement of the staircase was missing. The light suddenly stopped, and it became so dark that it was impossible to see what lay beyond the staircase. Upon probing the inky black void at the base of the staircase, they determined it wasn't a fog or shadow. It was a liquid, and it was rising. Ross ordered the men to pull back, but Houston was in too deep. He couldn't break free from the inky black liquid. The men pulled him away and got him free, but his legs were gone. Not ripped off because there was no blood anywhere, smoothly cut off as if they were never there. And as they put Houston down, he stood up on phantom legs. He didn't feel any pain, but everyone could tell something was very wrong with this place. And the messages they started seeing on the wall made clear they weren't the only ones who knew it. What happened to Site 13? Death here. Not my body. Bleed. 
there had been other people or things inside SCP-1730, and they wanted anyone who entered to know that this was a very dangerous place to be. As they advanced down the hall back toward the entrance, they saw what looked like a person in the distance, but as they approached, it became clear it wasn't another explorer. It was an old, horribly disfigured corpse seemingly attached to the wall, not by chains, but fused to the wall in unnatural ways. At first, the team seemed unconcerned, recognizing the corpse as someone named Zachary. Fortunately, command back at the base realized this as the effects of some sort of cognito hazard, a mental infection in the base. They uploaded a filter to their helmets and the team recoiled in horror at the sight in front of them. But the horrors were just beginning. They turned around to see a shimmering humanoid entity in the hallway behind them. As it approached, its footsteps distorted the hallway around. It pulled AP-3 Noah toward it without touching him. And as the soldier was pulled into its clutches, his body started to distort. Vigo was next, being grabbed by the arm by a long appendage, and his arm started to change color and distort. But the Foundation sent Apollo 3 and prepared. Houston produced a portable reality anchor designed to handle reality warping entities, and with a flash of red light the creature was revealed. It was a horribly elongated humanoid that only existed for a second before the reality anchor erased it and restored the hallway to its normal state. Vigo would recover, with the strange red color in his arm fading eventually. Noah wasn't so lucky. He was already dead. It had been fused into the wall just like the unfortunate corpse. These horrors had been encountered just by trying to return to the entrance, so it was clear the only smart thing to do was to descend further into the facilities and get some answers. As they advanced, not encountering any other supernatural entities, they saw more evidence of the dark things that had occurred in Site 13. The infirmary had been torn apart, a cafeteria had been melted into slag, and a large group of containment cells ended with a section called Olympia Class. But while most of the other cells were standard sized, these were over 100 meters high. What had the Foundation, or whoever ran this place, been keeping in these cells? They would get more answers as they made their way down the hall, where they saw a single television still working and illuminating the hallway. At first the television flickered, but the image soon cleared and the agents were able to see what it was broadcasting. It was the interior of a containment cell, and there was someone in it, and they recognized them as one of the most dangerous beings contained by the SCP Foundation, Bobble the Clown. A predatory supernatural clown that inhabits a children's TV show, Bobble the Clown was broadcast by an unknown source and could only be seen by children under 10. Originally seeming to be a normal kid show about a clown, every episode eventually devolved into the murderous Bobble teaching kids how to do horrible things like arson and torture. The Foundation eventually captured and isolated Bobble's broadcast, but the clown remained hostile and vicious. But not here. As the team talked to the Bobble trapped in the mysterious Site 13, it became clear that this clown was broken by whatever it had experienced. It rambled, it hid from the camera, and it was clearly terrified as it told the team about the horrors of the site, and it seemed to recognize the agents as something familiar, but not completely familiar. It claimed to be able to smell them, and it said they smelled different. As Bobble rambled, on, the agents learned about a man named Emerson who ran the site. Like the Foundation, he was obsessed with containing the strange and dangerous entities in the world, but unlike the Foundation, he didn't just want to protect the world from them, he hated them. The entities in Site 13 didn't even have numbers. Emerson wanted to use them up however he wanted and to dispose of them, and something Bobble called the meat grinder. Entities that outlived their usefulness were taken down below and none were ever heard from again. It was directly counter to every SCP Foundation policy, but this site had clearly been performing these horrible experiments for years. How? And why hadn't anyone heard of it? The team continued to make their way into the facility, but their signals were lost as they entered the cryogenics unit. By the time contact had been restored, they were no longer alone. There were survivors, both agents of the Foundation and survivors of the facility, and they were angry. With no way out and massively outnumbered, they called for backup. Mobile Task Force T5, also known as Samsara, was reserved for the heavy-duty missions. They're an elite group of practically immortal cyborgs fashioned from the flesh of a god and equipped with further cybernetic enhancements to eliminate Keter-level threats and to protect themselves from cognito hazards. They were sent in through a drainage gate to look for survivors and neutralize whatever lay within. They didn't know what to expect, but they knew one thing. No one who had been sent in had come out. It wasn't long before they realized how dangerous this mission would be. 
as they came across some large gated drainage pipes, they could see at least 20 charred bodies of humanoids pushed up against the gate, some reaching their hands through. Whatever had happened in Site 13, these unfortunate beings had been desperate to escape. As they made their way down the drainage pipe, they could feel it getting hotter, as if they were nearing an energy source. And there was one other odd thing about the pipe. It was draining inward, not out. They made their way into a control room where many of the consoles had been destroyed. Looking through a window, their view was obscured by a mysterious black mass. On the control panels, they could read terms like incinerator and body pit access. They split up trying to find answers, but found many of their accesses blocked by the black mass. As the T5 task force argued over their next move, they were startled by a sudden jolt. The giant mass had started moving. The team watched as the mass spun, revealing a giant turbine, which turned the inky substance into a fine slurry that was then scorched by giant streaks of fire. One of the T5 shot open the glass chamber, allowing the team to get closer and blasting them with a wave of heat. As they descended into the chamber, they could see a massive plant-like structure overhead, which started to shake. Suddenly, thousands of glowing pods were released from the massive plant, and each one lit up and let the team view the chamber more clearly. But it was what was inside the pods that was more disturbing. Each pod had a humanoid shape inside, seemingly reaching toward the team until they hit the slurry below and the shadows went dark. The team descended to investigate the slurry when something started to leak out of the walls. Looking at it, they could see something moving within. One of the team members picked up the wriggling object out of the black liquid and it took a bite of his hand. It was a leech and there were thousands more of them moving toward the slurry consuming it. And as the leeches ate, they started growing. They seemed to be moving in unison, communicating with a larger being lurking at the base of the slurry. A larger leech, a queen, or something else? The team wasn't sticking around to find out. They beat a hurried escape from the leech room, finding themselves in another hallway. Whatever the black substance was, the entities who had been here had used it, scrawling blood on the walls over and over again. Occasionally, they would come across a drained corpse covered in the black fluid. Had the leeches bled them dry? The facility was so sprawling that the team knew if they wanted any chance of navigating it safely, they needed to get the lay of the land. They needed to find the control center. The door read stairs to cryonics, and the leeches were nowhere to be found. It seemed like a safe path, but as soon as the team entered, the temperature dropped drastically to well below where it would be safe for a human to survive. The team's internal heating system kicked in to save their lives, but it wasn't the only threat. The team was about to encounter exactly what Site 13 was keeping locked up. As soon as they entered the room, sound ceased to work. The filters in their gear were overloaded, and the team saw warnings around the room. Silence. Don't look. A massive, multi-limbed figure emerged, with each of its 60 arms moving independently. The creature had no head, but a large circular structure covered with ancient glowing symbols. Whatever it was, it was ancient, all-powerful, and deadly. The team scrambled to get away as the glyphs on the creature burned white hot. Anyone who touched it was burned. Anyone who looked too long at it felt their optical implants burn out. The symbols on the creature were indecipherable, but one word was clear and printed in English, Emerson. Site 13 was from another world, another timeline where the SCP Foundation evolved into something horrible, ruled over by Elliot Emerson. It tortured and captured its beings and eventually killed most of them in the horrors of the incinerators. When an escape threatened to destroy the facility, Emerson successfully activated the device that removed the facility from their world into ours. Of course, as any avid follower of the SCP Foundation will know, there's far more to the story than this. Emerson may have been the start of Site-13's problems, but he was far from the end. We're talking about a tale so epic in size and scope that it would be impossible to fit into one video. A tale of subterranean horror. The first thing that tips the Foundation off to SCP-087's presence were the reports of numerous unexplained disappearances on campus. There were plenty of rumors about what might be behind them, but field agents suspect that the true source of the vanishing would be something beyond civilian imagination. All anyone knew for sure was that everyone who had gone missing was last seen in a certain administrative building on the university grounds, and that the disappearances only seemed to happen when the elevator was out. The campus was soon flooded with Foundation agents, creating a barrier around the administrative building and the presumed habitat of SCP-087. Nobody oh. else could get in and hopefully whatever was inside couldn't get out. One of the Foundation's lead scientists was flown in to consult on the investigation. What could have been behind those students disappearing? 
The doctor's preliminary interviews with university staff who worked in the building yielded some interesting details. Strange noises, like banging and even a faint shrill crying, would be heard from a door that led to a no longer used stairway in hallway 3B. Staff in the building had no reason to ever take these stairs, especially considering how many of them reported a strange sense of unease when just standing outside the door. The only reason someone might take those stairs is due to elevator malfunctions. In that instant, the doctor had put it all together. The staff they interviewed had their memory wiped with amnestics, special chemicals used by the Foundation with the power to delete human memories. The Foundation only used them for staff or civilians who had confirmed contact with an SCP, and the doctor knew that they had a live one on their hands. The staircase. There was something terribly wrong with that staircase, and it was the SCP Foundation's job to find out what before it made anybody else disappear. This is the story of SCP-087, otherwise known as the Endless Staircase, and the three doomed journeys down into its murky depths. The doctor was more than eager to begin research into the staircase and its frightening anomalous properties. After all, you don't claw your way up to being one of the Foundation's key researchers without being brave and perhaps just a little bit deranged. As was standard, once a perimeter was secured around the staircase, the good doctor requested a selection of D-Class personnel for testing. For those not in the know, D-Class is the Foundation's polite way of saying cannon fodder. The doctor was sent three D-Class prisoners for use in his investigation of SCP-087. The first, D-8432, was, according to official documentation on the incident, a 43-year-old male of average build and appearance and unremarkable psychological background. This man once worked for the Foundation in a more official capacity, but he was given the often deadly demotion to D-Class due to a dangerous mistake handling SCP-682 that led to the deaths of several other agents. Now, it looked like it would be his turn. The doctor explained his mission to him, explore the staircase, gather data, help us find out exactly what we're dealing with here. If you come back alive, there may even be a promotion in it for you. And with that promise, D8432 was given his loadout, a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, an audio headset, and a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset that would allow him to communicate with Dr. Bright. D8432 was then pushed through the door in Hallway 3B and out onto the staircase. According to declassified Foundation files describing the staircase, SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38-degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. But in D-8432's mind, unlit really didn't seem like the right word. He would have chosen all-consuming darkness. Despite carrying a powerful 75-watt lamp, D-8432 was only capable of partially lighting the platform he was standing on, and the illumination only stretched down nine of the 13 steps to the next platform. When D-8432 observed how little help his lamp was giving him, he was instructed to shine it out of the doorway into Hallway 3B. When he did so, the light seemed to shine far further than it ever could in SCP-087. Already, the beginning of the anomalous activity was obvious. Everywhere else, darkness is just the absence of light. In SCP-087, darkness eats light. It was like a tangible black mass that only a certain amount of light could survive while the rest just wouldn't show. D-8432 swallowed hard over a lump in his throat. The door to Hallway 3B was closed behind him, and he was ordered to descend. Surviving to see that promotion was feeling unlikely, but it's not like he had a choice. If he tried to escape SCP-087 before he was permitted, he'd be shot by SCP Foundation field agents on the spot. So he followed the high-ranking doctor's orders and began to descend the steps to the next platform. Nothing about the physical makeup of the staircase itself seemed abnormal. The base and walls were a very plain, dull concrete with a metal handrail. The only thing that seemed unique about it so far was the strange light-bending properties. That was, until he reached the second platform down and he heard it, a soft, echoing cry. A child's cry. It was shrieks of panic, or maybe even pain, echoing up from below. He was asked why he had stopped and he explained the crying sound he'd been hearing. 
It sounded like it was coming from far down the stairs, maybe 200 meters below him. He could just make out the words, please, health, and down here, coming from the darkness. But the team outside the stairwell couldn't hear anything, so they asked him to descend further. Another platform down, and they could hear it too. The unmistakable cries of a terrified child. Please, help, and down here. D8432 was ordered to keep going, and only stop if he noticed changes to the visual environment or in the sounds he was hearing. D8432, knowing his life was on the line, had to keep going and descended another 20 flights of stairs before stopping to remark that the sounds of the child hadn't gotten any closer. They still sounded just as far away as when he'd first heard them. He was told his observations were noted and pressured to continue. Within half an hour, D8432 had descended a full 50 floors with no sign of a bottom in sight. Somehow, the volume of the child's crying had remained consistent throughout, as if it was moving away from D8432 at the same rate he was descending. At this point, D8432 reported that he was feeling uneasy. The doctor said that this was understandable, given the circumstances. He'd been watching what little there was to see over a live video feed the entire time, and something about the truly bottomless nature of the staircase and the ever-elusive crying was undeniably eerie. But things were about to really take a turn for the worst. As D8432 stepped forward towards the next set of stairs, he froze. There was something on the platform below him, barely illuminated by the light of his 75-watt bulb. It was a face, vaguely human in size and shape, but with a few terrifying differences. It had grayish skin and no mouth, nostrils, or pupils. And yet, D8432 could feel that this thing was making eye contact with him. He couldn't move, trapped in the thing's piercing gaze. In an instant, the face jerked forwards, suddenly only about a foot away from D-432's face, eyes staring into its own. D-8432 screamed and ran, scaling all 50 flights in an astonishing 18 minutes before charging out into Hallway 3B. There, he collapsed from the exhaustion and the fear of what he'd just seen. Upon reviewing the footage, the strange face was designated SCP-087-1. Fascinating. It was time for a second experiment. The doctor just had to know more. The second test subject was D9035, a 28-year-old male with a history of aggravated assaults against women. He was given the same loadout as his predecessors, except this time with an even more powerful 100-watt bulb. He was also given 100 small LED lights that had adhesive backs and a battery life of approximately three weeks with which they intended to permanently illuminate SCP-087. However, despite the extra wattage of his bulb, he still couldn't illuminate beyond the ninth step. SCP-087 wouldn't allow it. Having no ideas of the horrors that lurked below him, he descended on the doctor's orders and began fixing the LEDs to the walls of each platform he passed. The LED always illuminated the landing, but the light couldn't pass the first step on either side. The flights of stairs themselves would remain in perpetual darkness. After the second flight, D9035 noticed the same crying D8432 had heard and became uneasy. Just like before, as D9035 descended, the volume of the crying didn't seem to increase, as if for every step he descended, the source of the crying descended one, two, keeping them at a constant 200 meters apart. Still, he was ordered to continue his descent and the placing of LEDs even as his paranoia grew. When he reached the 51st floor, he observed damage to the wall and steps. Sections appeared to have been smashed to rubble by an extreme force. As he descended past the broken step, he only felt his fear, anxiety, and paranoia grow. The doctor made note of the fact that SCP-087 seemed to cause instances of anxiety and terror in its occupants, even before they encountered SCP-087-1. As D-9035 reached Platform 89, a full 350 meters under the initial platform, he stopped dead in his tracks and saw something staring up at him from the platform below, that same terrible gray face with those dead, white eyes. He was encouraged to stay calm and try to get better footage of the face, but it charged for him, and D-9035 ran for his life. He ascended the staircase at a staggering pace, even passing out from exhaustion and remaining motionless for 14 minutes halfway. When D-9035 finally gathered the strength to get up, he scrambled back to Hallway 3B and fell into a state of catatonia. He remains unresponsive to all external stimuli to this day. 
just staring off into the distance with a haunted expression, almost like he's still there in the hallway. The doctor wanted to conduct one more test before he ordered SCP-087 shut off from the world forever, and it was the most terrifying of all. The final subject was D-9884, a 23-year-old woman with a history of depression and use of excessive force. The doctor had hoped that D-9884 would travel the deepest yet, and so he gave her the additional supplies of a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. As far as the Foundation was concerned, she was in this for the long haul, but none of them had any idea quite how right they were. When D-9884 entered SCP-087, all the lights from the previous expedition had disappeared. Still, she was ordered to go deeper. She heard the crying of the mysterious child, if it was even a child at all, and again she was ordered to go deeper. At the 496th landing, even as D-9884 seemed to slip into a state of mortal terror, once again she was ordered to go even deeper. Every moment, he was hoping to get a better look at the face of SCP-087-1, and when D-9884 finally broke and fled back upstairs, he did. The face appeared, but this time, it was mere inches behind her, staring directly into the camera with its blank eyes, startling even this veteran of the supernatural. The face appearing caused D-9884 to panic and flee, but instead of going back up the stairs to safety, she went deeper down the staircase in an attempt to escape it, deeper and deeper and deeper, until her video feed cut out. D-9884 was never seen again. In the aftermath of the tests, the SCP was classified as Euclid, it may have been dangerous, but at least it was easy to contain. The door to Hallway 3B was replaced with one made out of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the rest of the building. The lock won't release unless a classified number of electrical volts are applied, while the key is turned counterclockwise. And after a few inches of foam insulation were applied to the inner side of the door, staff at the building never again reported hearing strange noises. As for the fates of those lost within the endless turning flights and platforms of SCP-087, we may never know, but one can only assume it isn't pleasant. Meet Trevor Hawthorne, now known as D-4651. On the outside, he was an armed robber who murdered two people during a convenience store shootout in Texas. But now, since being condemned to death, he's been picked up for D-class testing by the SCP Foundation. Now also meet junior researcher Dr. Julia Reed an aspiring Foundation scientist with an undiagnosed heart condition. The kind of heart condition that doesn't mix well with a high-pressure job at the SCP Foundation. These two woke up on the morning of December 6, 2011, completely unaware of the fact that they were only hours away from causing one of the most devastating containment breaches Site-19 had seen in years. Many people died that day, but thankfully for everyone else, SCP-131 were there to save the day. When you think of a hero, you probably don't picture a pair of little cyborgs with one eye and the intelligence of a household cat. But this is the tale of how two of the most unassuming anomalies at Site-19 managed to save thousands of people from two of the site's most dangerous inmates. Open your eyes and keep them open. If you so much as blink, it's all over for you. How long can you hold it? Difficult, right? Now imagine you're having a staring contest with an entity that can kill you if you dare to blink for even a fraction of a second. Or even worse, a creature that could potentially kill hundreds or even thousands of people if your attention drifts from it for any amount of time. Try keeping your eyes open with that kind of crushing pressure. We're talking about two of the most deadly Euclid and Keter class anomalies out there. SCP-173, the killer sculpture, a violent Euclid-class entity that is incapable of moving while being looked at. If ever it's unobserved, it'll snap the neck of anyone nearby. SCP-689, known as Haunter in the Dark, is an equally dangerous and even more attention-demanding statue. These two entities are beyond dangerous. Even SCP-682 is terrified of the killer sculpture, and researchers have been considering the use of 689 to potentially eliminate the hard-to-destroy reptile for quite some time. Their greatest concern, though, is whether the 30-centimeter tall statue would cause too much collateral damage to Foundation personnel in the process. 
Trevor Hawthorne was part of the three-man D-Class detail meant to clean out SCP-173's containment chamber at regular intervals. While on cleaning duty, two D-Classes can keep staring at the sculpture while the other tidies up the cell, alternating turns to blink. But that morning, Trevor had woken up in his containment cell with a killer migraine, and soon that migraine would be killing far more than just him. The containment procedures in 689 cell were also a three-person job. 689 is a small green soapstone statue of a skeletal being sitting on a throne, believed to be some form of underworld death deity discovered by German archaeologists in India. This is a work of religious art that demands your attention, or you and anyone else who's ever seen this Keter-class nightmare will suffer a horrifying fate. Anyone who's ever seen the statue is infected by its anomalous effects. It must be observed constantly, or someone who's seen it in the past will suddenly drop dead of a severe health issue, like a stroke, or multiple rupturing organs. Like the god of death the statue represents, it appears on top of the dead body of whoever it just killed. If not continually paid attention to, it'll keep hopping from person to person until it's killed everyone who's ever looked at it. Its teleporting abilities and the fact that it poses a threat to so many make this a truly formidable foe. It's kept in a constantly lit cell and is observed by two members of D-Class personnel at all times. But a crucial third party in the containment of SCP-689 is a member of personnel at level 2 or above. They remain in a control room, wearing a special visor to prevent them from ever seeing 689 and becoming infected themselves. If the containment fails, it's their job to throw the kill switch on the D-Class observers to prevent them from becoming vectors for infection. Today, this job fell on Dr. Julia Reed. She was linked to the two observers via an audio feed, allowing her to remain in constant contact with them, and she had her finger on the activation key for a pair of explosive collars that were around the D-Class's necks. Little did they know, Dr. Reed's heart was its own time bomb. Now you know what we're up against. A snap-happy sculpture, and a teleporting death statue with a hit list containing everyone who's ever glanced at it. What can SCP-131 bring to the table? The two small cycloptic anomalies have only one remarkable ability. They never blink. That, and a soft spot for humans. These safe-class SCPs pose no threat to their handlers, and can even form attachments to researchers and other staff who show affection towards them. Of course, forming these bonds is discouraged by Site-19's director, because it can be distracting, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. The two iPods, known as SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B, are identical in appearance except for their colors. A is a burnt orange, and B is a mustard yellow. The two of them appear to communicate with one another via high-pitched squeaking noises, and also seem to have an innate ability to detect danger occurring in the vicinity, as well as danger occurring near individuals they've bonded with. Because of their inability to cause harm and their generally affectionate demeanor, the iPods are allowed to roam around Site-19, provided they keep out of the way of researchers and stay out of restricted areas. They seem to pretty much stick to the rules, though check-ins on A and B are required every hour just to be safe. As the iPods were moving freely around the facility, Trevor and another D-Class maintained a visual on the sculpture in its containment chamber, while a third man swept up the mixture of blood and excrement staining the concrete floors. Things were going fine, until Trevor's migraine got the better of him. A sudden flash of intense pain shot through his head, and in a moment of weakness, he made a terrible mistake. With an audible groan of pain, Trevor closed his eyes and forced his fingers to his temples. The groan had taken his fellow observer off guard, and the man's eyes flitted over to him for a fraction of a second. But a fraction of a second is all the sculpture needs. In an instant, Trevor and his fellow watcher had their necks snapped, and the third D-Class was murdered before he even had a chance to turn around. Containment protocol dictates that the door is to be sealed behind the cleaning crew while they're working with 173. But this time, perhaps due to complacency, the guards had neglected to reinforce the door. They got their heads twisted 180 degrees for their trouble. SCP-173 was loose. Mobile task forces were dispatched to aid in the recontainment effort as 173 began wrecking havoc around the facility. But things were about to get even worse. It seemed like business as usual over at the containment cell of SCP-689. 
Two D-Classes observed while Dr. Reed dictated to them over an earpiece from her control center. However, what Dr. Reed thought were just minor chest pains were actually the onset of heart failure. When the two D-Classes heard their supervisor experiencing a fatal heart attack on the other end of the line, they began to panic. This meant their attention wasn't entirely on SCP-689, and they were further distracted by the chaos SCP-173 was causing elsewhere in the facility, murdering researchers, guards, and maintenance workers alike, which led to power outages. The lights in 689's containment cell shut down. Guards were dispatched to execute the observers, as is protocol for 689 containment breaches. But the fact that resources were already stretched thin by the 173 breach caused a fatal error in judgment from a guard posted nearby. In a panic, he opened the door to find one D-Class dead with the statue perched on his body and the other one running straight for him in blind fear. The two collided and tumbled out into the hall. Both were now infected by 689's anomalous attention, and both were now doomed. Moments later, the two of them were dead the statue perched on their bodies, accidentally catching the eye of several researchers and guards running to deal with the 173 situation. For these two deadly anomalies, it was becoming an all-you-can-kill buffet. The staff of Site-19 were now dealing with one anomaly that needed to be looked at constantly, and another that if you even glance at it, you are effectively infected with a fatal disease. The iPods, sensing an imminent danger nearby, immediately sprung into action. It would be up to these cute, harmless anomalies to save the terrified staff during this chaotic double containment breach. In a nearby hallway, a fleeing Foundation researcher heard the crunches of her colleagues' necks breaking behind her. 173 was getting closer. This thing couldn't be outrun. She turned and saw the statue standing there, just 10 feet away from her, a dead researcher laying on the ground in front of it. She was locked in a deadly staring contest with the sculpture. How long she could survive was now dependent on how long she could keep her eyes open, and it was getting harder by the second. She could feel her eyes drying. They burned under the ceiling lights. 173 just waited. This wasn't a contest. She could win. In a final moment of terror, the researcher was forced to finally close her eyes and she waited for the crunch but it never came. Instead, she heard familiar high-pitched squeaking noises. She opened her eyes, crying tears of relief, as she saw SCP-131-A sitting behind 173, watching it with its constant, unblinking gaze. The killer sculpture was paralyzed by a cheerful little safe-class anomaly. Across the facility, a similar situation had unfolded with SCP-689. The Statue of Death had claimed many lives, but SCP-131-B had swooped in and frozen the statue in place with its never-ending gaze. Soon after, a mobile task force with vision-blocking visors used advanced echolocation technology to collect SCP-689 and return it to its containment cell. Everyone who'd seen the anomaly was, as standard protocol dictates, gathered up for later termination. Meanwhile, a mobile task force returned the paralyzed 173 back to its containment cell with a forklift. No containment breach is ever a picnic. Containment breaches with multiple dangerous anomalies are even less so. But the heroic role that SCP-131 played in bringing things back under control was indispensable. After all, it's not just raw power that counts when it comes to anomalies. The only anomalous power 131 needed to save the entire site was its ability to keep looking when nobody else could. They're so effective in this role that they've been seriously considered for permanent roles as wardens for SCPs like 173 and 689. And in our opinion, they're more than qualified. A month ago, Dr. Robert Maxwell was a senior researcher working at the facility but a tragic mistake had cost the lives of several of his co-researchers. Now, he was being led down a bleak hallway in armed biocontainment area 14, a rifle-wielding guard flanking him on either side. The once-rising researcher had a very different title now, D-8724. He had been made a D-class personnel, a death sentence. However, as the guards led him to his possible demise, he wasn't dressed in the typical D-class orange jumpsuit. No, he was dressed in frilly Rococo dining wear more typical of 18th century France. If anything, Dr. Maxwell looked like he was on his way to meet royalty. And in a sense, 
he was. The former researcher had begged for any other assignment, but the site director insisted on committing Dr. Maxwell to tea time with SCP-082. He'd always been the talkative type, so the two would make a perfect pairing. And if the creature found him sufficiently amusing, then Maxwell might even leave the containment cell alive. He had heard legends of the giant creature they called the cannibal. Maxwell hoped they were just stories. Dr. Maxwell was pushed by the guards into a large, luxuriously appointed room, and the doors were locked behind him. He felt like a child, surrounded by freakishly large furniture and ten-foot-high ceilings. The fog of obnoxious floral perfumes couldn't fully cover up the pervasive smell of death that lingered in the cavernous halls of 082's palace. Thanks to an elaborate ruse conducted by the Foundation, SCP-082 believed he was the King of France, and that his containment cell was a palace where he remained for his own safety. The creature's continued good behavior and everyone else's safety relied on visitors keeping up that lie. Maxwell had never worked in this area of the facility, so a lot of the standard procedures were new to him. Still, his superior had given him a clear directive. Talk to the monster communicate with him, be cordial and friendly, see if you can find out more about his mysterious past, and most importantly, if you want to survive, don't annoy him. The down-on-his-luck scientist gulped inside, trying to steady his nerves in this oversized fake French palace. He just kept thinking, surely he can't be that big. He almost talked himself into believing that the accounts of the creature were just that, tall tales until a huge figure began lumbering into the main chamber. It was him, SCP-082, also known as Fernand the Cannibal. SCP-082 was an eight-foot-tall hulking monster built sturdier than the castles it likes to imagine are its true home. Swollen, bloated, and grossly out of proportion, the creature clocks in at over 700 pounds most of which is pure muscle that's almost impossible to pierce with conventional weaponry. SCP-082 stopped just feet away and stared at Dr. Maxwell with its beady, sunken in eyes like a hungry rat. Just the sight of it struck terror into Dr. Maxwell's heart, but he didn't dare show his fear. Instead, he remembered his brief training, bowing politely and forcing a smile, referring to the creature as Your Highness and profusely thanking it for granting him an audience. The monster continued staring without saying anything, and then gave a wide, lock-jawed grin, showing off its huge teeth. It did everything through gritted teeth, except eat and sing. Dr. Maxwell hoped he wouldn't be a part of either activity. Fernand gave a low, booming chuckle. He thanked Dr. Maxwell for coming to give him some company, and invited him to come further inside and take a seat adding, with a sly wink, that he won't bite. The monster complained that he so rarely gets visitors to the palace these days, but he omitted the fact that the main reason for this was his tendency to devour them. Maxwell nodded and followed the giant deeper into its oversized abode. He couldn't help but notice that the monster's arms looked like huge, fleshy punching bags. He knew that if Fernand wanted to, he could easily crush him flat, just like he'd done to so many unfortunate guards during containment breaches. Fernand told Dr. Maxwell that he was thinking of having some decorating work done. The walls of his palace were starting to look awfully drab, and he gestured to one covered with a rusty red streak. Maxwell remembered that D-Class cleaners were sent into the containment cell twice a month to tidy any of Ferdinand's messes, but they often ended up becoming one of the messes themselves. The creature encouraged Maxwell to take a seat at his oversized dining table, while he tended to a pot of what he said was full of delicious onion soup. Maxwell obliged his host's request and took a seat at a huge chair that made him look like a six-year-old sitting at the grown-up's table. Meanwhile, Ferdinand was using a huge machete-like knife to cleave onions in half for his bubbling pot of stew. Even though Ferdinand had shown no signs of outward aggression, as he watched the cannibal hack away at onions with his enormous knife, Maxwell could feel himself beginning to sweat. After all, they didn't call this creature the cannibal for nothing. This was a monster with a truly horrifying body count. During previous containment breaches, it had taken enough tranquilizer to put down two elephants to subdue the creature, but not before multiple agents quite literally lost their heads in the process. 
Fernand was able to bite them off with one huge chomp, like he was eating a drumstick, snapping right through the bone with his incredible tooth and jaw mm. strength. Surprisingly, when he wasn't on a violent rampage, Foundation researchers had found SCP-082 to be unusually polite and forthcoming, offering the researchers plenty of information about himself and his past. The only problem was that almost everything the creature said was a complete lie. From his time as a researcher, Maxwell knew that there were only a few details about the creature that could be ascertained for certain. SCP-082 would reliably answer to the name Fernand, and genetically, Ferdinand was technically human. The means by which Ferdinand became so grotesquely huge, strong, and cannibalistic are still unknown. Foundation personnel are still looking into whether it's due to some kind of anomalous genetic mutation or by more supernatural means. All we know is that he's big, unpredictable, and extremely dangerous. Dr. Robert Maxwell sat terrified at the dining table of SCP-082 listening to Fernand's slightly dull blade chop through the final onion, which he then tossed into the boiling soup. Fernand had switched the topic of conversation to one of his favorite fictional characters, Hannibal Lecter. Of course, Hannibal the Cannibal isn't quite so fictional to Fernand. While he's been shown to be extremely intelligent in terms of puzzle solving and memory, he seems to have no understanding of the distinctions between fiction and reality. He assumes all movies and TV shows are a form of documentary or reality television. And ever since seeing The Silence of the Lambs, Ferdinand has been eager to meet with Dr. Lecter, which he emphasized to Maxwell over and over. Since trying to explain the concept of fiction to Ferdinand had never previously worked, Maxwell simply told him that Dr. Lecter is extremely busy at the moment, but will visit whenever he gets a chance. This seemed to satisfy Fernand, who placed two large bowls of steaming soup on the table before sitting down a little too close to Maxwell. He couldn't help but notice that the giant cannibal was now sitting within biting distance, and as a lowly D-class, nobody would be rushing in to save him if things went south. Fernand began ranting through his clenched teeth once more, occasionally stopping to consume a hefty spoonful of onion soup. Maxwell was sure to do the same, not wanting to seem anything less than polite. But soon, the tenor of Ferdinand's rant began to shift. Typically, the monster spoke French or heavily accented English. Now, he was affecting the accent of a Victorian gentleman, peppering his speech with tally-ho and the game is afoot. Maxwell was confused at first, but quickly realized the game Ferdinand was playing. It's well known that Ferdinand is a pathological liar who likes to play numerous characters, changing his mannerisms and clothes accordingly. These personas have included a vampire, Big Bird, Andre the Giant, Foundation researcher Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, Dr. Frankenstein, and Frankenstein's monster. And, of course, in this case, the iconic fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes. Fearing for his life in this strange situation, Dr. Maxwell did the only thing he could, play along. As Fernand reeled off his Holmesian delusions, Maxwell began to play the role of Dr. John Watson, uh -huh. asking follow-up questions and complimenting Fernand's impeccable deductive reasoning, and it seemed to be working. Fernand played along too, acting as though the two of them really were Arthur Conan Doyle's crime-fighting duo. Towards the end of their game, Dr. Maxwell was even starting to enjoy it, amazed that his quick thinking was actually keeping him safe. But just then, the cannibal froze, as if in a trance. He locked eyes with Dr. Maxwell, like a mad dog that you can't tell if it's going to bite you or not. He saw the creature's gargantuan teeth separating, its huge jaws stretching open. This could surely only mean one thing. Dr. Maxwell winced and prepared for death, cursing that all of his quick thinking had amounted to nothing. Fernand leaned towards him, his gaping maw with its hot onion-scented breath just inches away from Maxwell. And then, he began to sing. The cannibal broke into a raucous Victorian pub song, happy and jovial. In his moment of terror, Dr. Maxwell had forgotten that this was the other reason SCP-082 opens his nightmarish jaws. Relief washed over him as he knew he was safe, at least for the moment. Not long after, Foundation guards arrived and escorted him from the cell, leaving the delusional giant to his own devices back in the so-called palace. The former researcher had done it.
He had bested Ferdinand the Cannibal, and hopefully it would be the last time he'd ever be face to face with that deranged giant. Unfortunately for Dr. Robert Maxwell, in a performance review later that week, one of his superiors remarked that Ferdinand enjoyed his company and he had done a great job. Such a good job, in fact, that Ferdinand insisted he have Dr. Maxwell for dinner, or any other meal, for that matter, sometime very soon. It's the mission of the century, a daring rescue into the depths of one of the most dangerous locations in the multiverse, Site-13, otherwise known as SCP-1730. When the impossible Site-13 was first discovered, multiple mobile task forces were sent to plummet its depths, and none returned. They were greeted to a labyrinthine nightmare, littered with deadly cognito hazards, escaped SCPs, and mysterious, murderous leeches. Some were trapped along with the civilians they were sent to rescue. Others were killed or changed in unimaginable ways. Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens, had been sent in on a rescue mission when they encountered a horrifying sight, the captured broadcast of Bobble the Clown, a dangerous SCP known for corrupting and destroying children through its deadly messages. But this bobble was different. Much like everything from Site-13, this bobble came from an entirely different dimension, and he had terrifying information to relay. In the universe where Site-13 originated, the site's psychopathic director, one Elliot Emerson, had struck a deal with the Global Occult Coalition, a controversial government group who intends to protect humanity by killing anomalies rather than containing them. Emerson had converted his site into an unethical, unrestrained slaughterhouse and was incinerating SCPs by the hundred in a so-called body pit. But Emerson's game of death came back and bit him, snapping the threads of reality and turning the entire site into a dimensionally displaced super anomaly. The game wardens realized they were in way over their heads. Their chances of surviving this place were dropping by the second, and if they wanted any chance of succeeding in their mission, they needed backup. So Site Command called in MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara. Calling in Samsara for a run-of-the-mill collection mission is like using a bazooka to kill a housefly. But for a case as severe 1730, their skills were not only nice to have, but vital. Samsara are among the best of the best, immortal cybernetic clones forged from the flesh of a god, equipped with weaponry and technology that could surpass even that of other elite mobile task force units. The four members of Samsara are so adept at what they do, they earned the nickname Power Rangers among their peers. The remaining game wardens knew that with Samsara on the case, they may actually survive this thing after all, and they just needed to hold out. Samsara arrived on site not long after, packing some serious technological heat including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, and built-in scramble adaptations within their eyes to ward off the deadly cognito hazards. Everyone involved was in for the fight of their lives. The four Samsara agents, Irantu, Nanku, Munru, and Onru, entered via a drainage gate in one of the office buildings above ground and began their descent inside. After observing numerous charred bodies, they deduced that there must have been a massive incinerator somewhere on site. Emerson's incinerator, theoretically, Realizing that this was connected to the body pit they kept hearing about, they descended further, feeling the temperature rise as they did so. Due to the anomalous nature of 1730, nothing inside made any kind of logical sense. Caused by a reality-warping machine known as Thresher, the internal geography of Site-13 was subject to constant shifts. The team then split up to cover more ground. Munro and Nanku continued to follow the pipes and the heat toward the furnace, while Irantu and Onru broke away to explore what lay beyond a weak wall. After busting through the wall, Irantu and Onru explored several empty office blocks before finding their way into a control room with a glass observation deck. While the window was obscured by garbage and human corpses, signage indicated that the incinerator and the body pit were directly below them. The team once again reconvened and managed to activate the incinerator which shredded the mass stuck inside with several large turbines before burning the resulting slurry, the same process that had happened to so many anomalies under Emerson's watch. With the path cleared, Samsara decided to descend via the incinerator, using the drainage pipe as a kind of makeshift tunnel. Eventually, they happened upon the leeches, large, black, and hungry. These creatures seemed to infest 1730 by the thousand. Anywhere that blood or drainage runoff could be found, the leeches could be found too. They didn't appear to have any connection to an anomaly previously secured and contained by the Foundation, 
They squeezed and wriggled through the cracks in the walls, searching for fresh blood. En route detected that the leeches all moved with a kind of collective purpose, suggesting a telepathic hive mind. En route was able to tap into this hive mind using her cybernetic enhancements and map the chaotic geography of 1730 through the leech colony's collective knowledge. With this new advantage, they could add a second goal to this rescue mission, find the thresher device causing all the instability and potentially reduce power to it if possible. But they were on the clock to save the other survivors as those leeches were sure to get hungry for warm blood soon. They followed the leeches down the most direct path toward the survivors. On the way, they encountered a horrifying creature, the many-limbed humanoid nightmare that functions as Emerson's eternal punishment, his charred body tied screaming and alive to the platform where the monster's head should be. They managed to make it past the monster before finally rendezvousing with Captain Hollis of Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, otherwise known as the Mole Rats, as well as the Game Wardens and the other survivors. There were 27 surviving members of Site-13 staff, many of which had severe injuries, making it even harder to transport them back to safety through the hazardous terrain. And to make matters worse, the leeches were back. The team quickly decided that the best route out of here was directly past the Thresher, where they could reduce power to the machine for just long enough to create a stable path of escape. Nanku opened fire on a horde of approaching leeches with a flamethrower, and everyone began running for their lives. It was a final make-or-break dash to safety. However, their advance was soon stopped by a strange roped creature drawing a cognito hazardous meme on the wall with its claws. When the team attempted to engage, it attacked, exposing additional deadly memes and the dangerous effects of its single white eye. And we're not talking about internet memes here. These are symbols and information that are often deadly to even bear witness to. And for you or I, this would be a real threat, but not to a team equipped with goggles containing cognito hazard filter technology. The battle was cut short when the floor collapsed underneath them and the creature was devoured by something even larger and more monstrous, a gigantic black leech covered in huge red eyes. Its entrance caused thousands of leeches to spill out into the hall as the monster screeched and slithered its tentacles after them. Allow us to introduce you to Elijah, also known as the Leech Boy, and a pivotal component of the very existence of SCP-1730. He was a boy with the mind of a toddler, but he had the strange ability to absorb blood through people's skin, hence his nickname, Leech Boy. One of the doctors in Site-13, Dr. Hadley, took pity on Elijah. After all, he didn't choose to be the way he was. Director Emerson didn't share Hadley's sympathy. His orders to exterminate all anomalies included humanoids like Elijah. When Hadley protested, Emerson had her beaten within an inch of her life while other dissenters were shot. Dr. Hadley, disgusted by the inhumanity of her superiors, devised the perfect revenge. She sabotaged the incinerator and the body pit, allowing a mass containment breach that flooded the site with deadly anomalies. Young Elijah ended up consuming the slurry of the other shredded anomalies, causing him to mutate into a powerful monster, a behemoth of a leech who gave birth to and controlled all the others. It was Hadley's revenge that caused Emerson to panic and activate Thresher, leading to a rift in reality and the creation of 1730, and by extension, all the problems faced by our heroes today. Samsara and the others fled Leech Boy and began taking a different escape route. However, while en route, they encountered the dreaded Crystal Butterflies, a dangerous SCP capable of destroying organic matter with a mere touch. Iratu stepped up to bat, roasting the creatures with his arm-mounted incinerator and taking extreme damage to his body in the process. But they didn't have time to rest. With the butterflies disposed of, they kept moving, heading toward the Thresher. But not all the SCPs were necessarily working against them. Bobble the Clown came in handy at the next checkpoint, manifesting in the monitor of an electronic door and opening the way through. As they continued on their journey, they had to fight off frequent attacks from leeches, losing some of the task force members in the process. They were also forced to face off against a number of other anomalies in order to survive, such as SCP-2316, manifesting as floating bodies beneath them, and SCP-1370, which used a huge mechanized body to attack the team of survivors. That was all just a warm-up for the true final battle, though. The floor shattered beneath them, and out of an impossibly huge chamber, the monster that had once been Elijah wriggled free, reaching for them with huge tentacles and shrieking from its thousand-toothed maw. It was at least 200 meters tall and barely reacted to any amount of firepower. It seemed like they were all doomed until Captain Hollis had a truly crazy idea. With the help of Samsara, she led the bloodthirsty abomination down through the cryonic center and into an Olympia-class testing chamber. There, as the leech boy was bearing down on them, Hollis opened the gates to two adjacent 
and containment cells, and something beyond incredible happened. Two of the most powerful SCPs ever known, a giant sword-wielding Gate Guardian and the reality-bending Cosmic Deer, SCP-2845, entered the arena. What followed was one of the most epic showdowns in the history of the SCP Foundation, as the Deer and the Gate Guardian went to battle against the all-devouring Leech. While the monsters fought, Hollis ordered her team to get the rest of the survivors to safety. She and Munro of the Samsara team remained behind to prevent any of the anomalies from escaping as the entire base began sinking into the ground from the combined forces of the battle raging around them and the Thresher's continued onslaught on reality. Even if the survivors escaped, would the anomalous developments inside Site-13 escape and wreak havoc on the world at large? That's when Hollis received a vision, a horrific, charred, post-apocalyptic world roamed by inconceivable powerful entities and nightmare gods. It was a vision so horrific that just seeing it nearly broke her mind. She knew what she had to do, the only way she could truly defeat this terrible place and ensure safety for mankind. While Leech Boy, the Gate Guardian, and the Deer continued their battle for the ages, Hollis ran to Thresher and forced the machine into overdrive. Up above, the remaining members of Samsara, the Mole Rats, and the Game Wardens escorted the survivors to safety. Downstairs, Thresher emitted a blinding white light as the system began overloading. In her final moments, all Hollis could do was laugh. Perhaps it was a laugh of pure insanity, of a mind broken by the horror she witnessed. Or perhaps it was a laugh of victory, knowing that in spite of the immense powers all around her, she had won the day. She had saved not only the survivors and her teammates, but possibly all of humanity. And all it cost her was everything. Outside, the survivors had reached a safe distance away when the entirety of Site-13 imploded in a final brilliant flash. When the dust cleared, SCP-1730 was gone. All that was left was an immense crater where the impossible base should have once been. Captain Hollis had done it. Through overloading the Thresher machine, she'd taken this anomaly out of the world the exact same way it had entered. It was torn from its moorings on our Earth and kicked in the infinity of space-time, perhaps never to be seen again, along with everything it contained. SCP-1730 was reclassified to neutralized. Of course, the Foundation would have plenty of other anomalies to pursue soon after, but the nightmare of Emerson's Site-13 was over once and for all. Those blasted Foundation rats had done it again. SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, sat in its tank of highly concentrated acid and seethed at the world it had been placed in. And what a miserable, terrible world it was. He hated it, and he hated every single soul that occupied it, and especially the hypocritical monsters in the lab coats that ran this sham of an organization. Whenever the reptile wasn't speaking, normally to bark threats and profanities at its human jailers, it was quietly listening, taking everything in, and how the things it heard made its blood boil more than the corrosive fluid forever eating into its carapace. What high-minded ideas these worthless apes had about themselves. We're cold, not cruel. <laughs> what a sick joke. Every moment for the reptile was a different kind of hell. The baseline of existence was a certain dull, fizzling pain as he melted as quickly as his cells could divide. His only reprieve from this was being dragged into a testing chamber for some even worse pain. Perhaps burned, or sliced, or chewed at by a mutant rabbit, or crushed by bananas, or torn apart by wires and hooks, or beaten and bashed by some mad swordsman, or having his mind invaded and attacked by a rogue soul in a cursed necklace. If this was only cold, then the reptile hated to even imagine what the SCP Foundation considered cruel. After all, there were monsters more powerful than him out there. The Hanged King or the Devourer of Worlds could handedly destroy their wretched ball of rock, if they so choose to. He wasn't the most sadistic or evil of the beasts these maniacs in white coats had faced. Those who warred with him met a quick death at his claws and fangs. Would that nightmarish old man afford his victim such a luxury? Or that unstoppable psychopath in the old police car? And yet, it was his file that bore the addendum. SCP-682 must be destroyed as soon as possible. And why? Seemingly only because he could take it. And the Foundation always had new toys it wanted to test on their favorite punching bag. Of course, he attempted to escape. But wouldn't you? Is freedom not an inalienable right? The Foundation would cry, but look at the terrible crimes he's committed. Look at the lives he's taken, as they always do. Let he who is without sin draw the first acid bath. 
He knew on some level if he were to make a tally, the Foundation's crimes would far outnumber his own. The only difference was that they deluded themselves into believing all acts of cruelty are permissible in service of their greater good. If they all had but one head, the reptile would claw it from their shoulders. A group of incredibly well-armed and well-armored guards entered the room, training all their weapons on him. He hadn't summoned the energy to escape today, and that meant only one thing. They were going to take another swing at killing him again. Oh, goody. Another attempt that would leave him momentarily in absolute agony and allow neither of them to gain any ground. He'd grow numb to attempts on his life by now. Whatever they had waiting for him in the other room, he'd be ready for it. The guards removed him from his acid bath, and while he was still trying to regenerate his muscles and nerves enough to move, they dragged him into the testing chamber. It was always a mystery, wondering what they'd be poking or prodding him with today. But when he was first dragged into the chamber, it was empty. Those were always the worst ones. When he was left some sitting duck waiting for the Foundation and their infinite malice to choose the form of the would-be destroyer, what would be behind door number one? A box. A large wooden box was pushed into the room, and the door closed behind it. How curious. The hard-to-destroy reptile began to approach the box, sniffing at the air. It made no sound in there, but something about that smell. Something eerily familiar. It was different this time. With a soft pop, the box fell apart, its walls falling in different directions like the petal of a blooming flower. And the second the hard-to-destroy reptile saw what lurked inside, it felt an unfamiliar cold barb of terror hook into the soft, warm flesh of its heart. The thing inside the box had been called SCP-173 by the SCP Foundation, but that wasn't how the reptile knew it. It was a primordial nightmare, an ancient horror. The stone devil, the killer in the dark. The Coitern, which had mercilessly and gleefully slaughtered so much of the reptile's very species, back when 682 was known as the Atanti Kilpeño, and here it was, ready to finish the job. SCP-682 let out an involuntary screech of pure horror and fled backwards, keeping its eyes fixed on the monster at all times. He moved back until he hit the far wall of the containment chamber, until he could go no further. His mind was flooded and his heart was racing. He never thought he'd see this monster again. He'd hoped it would never cross his path again. Perhaps he even held out hope that the abomination had been slain, destroyed, scattered to the winds. And yet here it was, looking at him. The reptile called out, You fools! You have no idea what you've done! This thing! Mark my words, it will be your ruin! It will slaughter every single one of you. But its appeals to reason with its captors, in their own interest for once, fell on utterly uninterested ears. Six hours of this passed, the reptile spending every second of it for the first time in a long time fearing for his life. A group of observing Foundation scientists merely noted a peculiar reaction of distress from 682, and ordered a decorated mobile task force sharpshooter with a Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle with armor-piercing rounds to initiate phase two of the cross test. In a sudden flash of sound and pain, the sharpshooter blew away both of SCP-682's staring eyes. The simultaneous instruction went out for all observing members of personnel to avert their gaze. Just for a moment, 682 could certainly regenerate its eyes quickly, but nothing was quite as fast as an unobserved SCP-173. The reptile screeched in pain as it heard the monster snapping its body parts, leaving it thoroughly mutilated. When the group of observing scientists looked back, they saw it. Which is to say, SCP-173 standing before a heavily damaged SCP-682, as though incredibly proud of its handiwork. Internally, 682 thanked a creator it despised for the fact that the observers looked back and spared it from the onslaught that soulless stone monster had unleashed on it. A scientist working for the Foundation would later remark, After review, it appears SCP-173 was unable to do lethal damage to SCP-682 due to a major difference in physical size. A possible repeat of this test may be made if SCP-682 is damaged enough to reduce its physical mass to a level equal with SCP-173. 
But 682 knew deep down this wasn't the truth. It had nothing to do with physical size. If the Koitern had truly willed it, he never would have left that room. The monster only wanted to extend the torment, and this time, SCP-682 wouldn't let him. He regenerated, adapted, and came back ready. 682 developed a number of eyes, far more than before, that remained fixed on SCP-173, paralyzing it. He crawled back up onto the wall and simply stared. Once again, the observing scientists ordered the sharpshooter to take aim and open fire, but this time the bullets had no effect. SCP-682 had developed a thick, clear carapace over the surface of its new eyes, ensuring that nothing would break its eye contact with that murderous little monster. This time, it would not lose. But for all the time that 682 stared, 173 said nothing as always. It just stood there, the strange pattern of its face. That nasty, bloody Rorschach splotch looked almost like a mocking smile. It conceded nothing. It seemed to say, go on, get an eyeful. I have all the time in the universe, and everyone looks away eventually. Even you, Atanti Kilpenyu. Let the eternal silence of your brethren be a lesson to you. All you will hear is crunch. 682 kept up the staring contest for 12 hours before it was taken back to its acid bath, thoroughly shaken by its experience. It had always despised its terrible captors, but now a new shade of darkness had entered its narrow emotional lexicon. Fear. True fear. An acknowledgement deep down in its muscle tissue and guts that there was something out there that could truly hurt it. The terrible Koitern was alive and thirsty for blood. The researchers who conducted this test considered it an interesting partial success. While 682 was quaking in its tank thinking about 173, they were brainstorming the best move to take next, regarding potential pairings between 682 and 173. A plucky researcher noted that 096 had also gotten SCP-682 on the ropes, so maybe they should send in 173 with a photo of SCP-096 taped to its chest. A member of the O5 Council intervened before this got too far, saying, No, absolutely not. Setting aside the problem of SCP-682 and SCP-173 that cannot be observed for fear of triggering a response from SCP-096 is a self-perpetuating catastrophe that the Foundation does not under any reasonable circumstances have the slightest desire to unleash. Denied with vehemence. The researcher who suggested this idea felt supremely embarrassed and retired briefly to one of the employee bathrooms to have a good cry before returning to the brainstorming session. Researcher Matus, a more experienced member of personnel, had a stroke of genius. He reminded the assembled researchers that they'd recently performed another semi-successful experiment on 682. Using their deadly high-precision blades, they were able to slice and dice 682 into a series of amorphous blobs. Sure, these blobs may have attacked and killed some D-classes before reforming into the OG nasty reptile, but each of these blobs were the perfect size to be murdered by SCP-173. It eliminated the size differential and put these two on an even playing field. And on that even playing field, it stood to reason that SCP-173 might win. The cross-test was greenlit, and a researcher named Dr. Shenron was put in charge of overseeing the operations. And this time, due to Foundation incompetence and a greater degree of mental preparedness by SCP-682, they were in for a complete disaster. 682 and 173 were brought into the same containment chamber. 682 could feel the latent fear welling up inside itself, so it did the thing that it knew the best. It tried to stoke up its rage, its hatred, the fury and spite that had kept it going through so many torturous attempts on its life. It would not die at the hands of this stone monster. And if it was its destiny, then it would ensure with its dying wretched breaths it would destroy this terrible beast once and for all. It would shatter it and ensure it never put itself back together. Suddenly, the high-precision blades were deployed. It was an endless volley of cutting that dashed the two deadly anomalies to pieces, like a giant as-seen-on-TV slap chop. Because the machine had been calibrated for its body, 682 was sliced into 12,000 perfect cubes, and 173 had been cut into a pile of lumpy, irregular chunks. A vacuum system was then activated to separate both anomalies into different chambers, so 173 could reform and begin the assault. But miraculously for 682, 
the vacuum system failed. Two D-classes were sent in to recalibrate the system, but things quickly got even worse. Many of the 682 cubes formed the same gelatinous masses that they did in the previous high-precision blades test and began attacking and killing one of the D-classes. The other naturally turned to look at this horrifying display, which meant nobody was paying attention to SCP-173. Immediately, the sculpture reformed and snapped the surviving D-class's neck before turning its attention to SCP-682. The emergency incineration system failed, so all the Foundation could hope for was mutually assured destruction until they got the situation back under control. However, the Foundation had underestimated 682's intelligence and tactical reasoning. While the gelatinous mutated globs of its flesh attacked 173, smashing and cracking its concrete body as it killed and splattered them, the remainder of 682's flesh formed a smaller version of itself, which began staring at 173. This froze the sculpture in place while the mutated flesh monster smashed into it, slowly breaking it down. For the first time in as long as it could remember, 682 felt genuine glee, the thrill of revenge, the glory of an ancient foe vanquished. It would now slay the terrible Coitern, as its ancestors had tried to do so many times before and failed. But this reptile would not fail. Until, of course, the SCP Foundation, monsters that they were, decided to put their finger on the scale. The same Foundation Mobile Task Force sharpshooter, who'd been there during the first 173 cross-test, was still there, still ready to carry out his duties. On the order of the researchers, he fired another two shots, blowing out the eyes of this new, smaller 682. While it regenerated its precious eyes, 173 went on a rampage, mercilessly slaughtering every single one of the eyeless blobs of mutated flesh. It smashed each one beyond repair, until only it and the smaller 682 remained. Luckily for 682, its eyes regenerated, complete with the familiar bulletproof covering, just in time to hold back 173 from killing it. The two remained locked in a staring contest of pure hatred for a solid 17 hours before the test was eventually called off. But the horrors continued. Exhausted by the ordeal already, SCP-682 was sedated and returned to its containment chamber without incident, where it regenerated back to its default state. Things weren't so easy with SCP-173. While the team transported it back to its containment chamber, there was a power outage in the hall, and things went dark. And considering SCP-173, in addition to the sculpture and the peanut, could also be nicknamed Instant Killing Spree Just Add Darkness, it won't surprise you to hear there were no survivors. 173 killed everyone in the hall, then escaped out into the wider facility, causing a site-wide containment breach and a huge number of casualties. The cause of the electrical short that kick-started this massacre was traced back to Dr. Shenron's tampering with the incinerator system. This got the doctor formally reprimanded, stripped of his titles and his memories, and relieved of his duty. But the worst was still very much to come for everyone involved, including SCP-682. Because the true terrifying potential of SCP-173 was soon going to be unleashed, and when that happened, nowhere would be safe. On what was otherwise a very normal day, in a very normal procedure when a few D-classes were sent into SCP-173's cell, something extraordinary and terrible happened. SCP-173 multiplied. Like a single-cell organism undergoing mitosis, 173 somehow just split into two equal copies of itself. Two D-classes were killed in this first duplication event, but they were just the beginning. Soon enough, people would look back so fondly on the days when there were only a mere two of these things. The Foundation and 682, for all their disagreements, are very much alike. Both are always vying for control over their situations, and both achieve this through understanding and adapting to whatever is threatening them. As SCP-173 continued to multiply, the Foundation did what they could to adapt and regain control. They tried to contain specific instances in smaller containment units. They tried to create new methods for permanent observation. They even tried shipping them off to the moon, but none of it did any good. SCP-173 continued to duplicate. They escaped, began spreading further. They killed half a million civilians in 48 hours, and believe us when we tell you, they were just getting started. The ever-growing army of 173 instances went on massive killing sprees every night, taking out huge swaths of the civilian population as they scrambled and panicked in the dark. 
and they weren't just going after civilians. Evidently, much like 682, 173 had a grudge against the SCP Foundation. For all those decades of imprisonment, the 173 Army began locating, surrounding, and destroying entire Foundation containment sites, and killing off all the staff and the anomalies inside. Of all the entities in containment that might one day go XK and destroy the world as we know it, not many people had 173 on their bingo card. If only they'd listened to 682's warnings and reallocated their termination resources to 173, things may have turned out differently. And speaking of our scaly old foe, 682 sat in an empty chamber. It'd been days since anyone had come in to check on it. All fled or dead from snapped necks, one of the two. He thought about escaping containment, but given the bloodbaths going on outside all the time, what would even be the point? All that was really left was time, and that was a rapidly depleting resource. He just needed to wait for that thing to come and see him again. SCP-682 blinked, and there it was, standing before him, looking, blink, and there was more, blink. So many of them, so, so many, blink. Surrounded on all sides by that terrible creature. Too many to fight. Too many to win. Just waiting. Watching. Mocking him. There was only one thing left to do. Blink. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword, capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own sun. For reference, the sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself, 
and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001, on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale, and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request, and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated, as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, and the researcher site as well as the researchers themselves were immediately obliterated by an unknown force though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered. And according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked, and venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. 
If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the Guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073, the anomaly otherwise known as Kane. Kane is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze, much like the Gate Guardian. SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Cain is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory, keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Cain was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Cain's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001, with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh God, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, the Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, 
ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site Zero. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site Zero, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission, but they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy, while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. 
Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead. But there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine, killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat, and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam, and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. Everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully, nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it, to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000. But all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them, claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later, Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that 
his heart rate was too high, but cautioned that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped making any sense until finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now, the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually, another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it'll wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world, or simply drive us all insane? Pietro Wilson tossed and turned as the nightmares from the previous day filled his dreams. In his restless sleep, he watched the slaughter of his colleagues at Site-22. The unknown men who entered the facility had gunned down everyone who worked there. Everyone, except Pietro. He remembered running deeper into the facility, only to be cornered in a windowless concrete room. There he had found SCP-5000, an exclusionary suit that allowed him to become undetectable to human senses. It was a step beyond invisibility. He successfully made it out of Site-22, but the eyes of the men he killed to get away haunted him. Pietro had never taken a life before. The only solace was that it felt like the suit he was wearing had taken over, so his actions were not technically his own. But he had to wonder, what would he have done without the suit? Would he still have killed another human to escape? After leaving the facility, Pietro had made his way to an SCP safe house. This was where he now lay. The slaughter of hundreds at Site-22 was bad, but what he found when he turned on the news at the safe house was worse. <gasps> SCPs had been let loose around the world and were killing people by the millions. What was going on? Pietro was startled awake from a nightmare. He was hyperventilating, but his body almost immediately recovered and his breathing slowed. A heads-up display flashed on in front of his eyes. Pietro Wilson was still contained with an SCP-5000. The suit would not let him go. He instinctively went to rub his eyes, but the metal hands of the suit just clanked against the helmet that covered his head. He wanted out of this suit. Pietro stood up and walked over to the television. He reached out to turn it on, but paused. He thought, do I really want to see how bad things have gotten since I fell asleep? But he had to know. He was filled with dread as the TV came on and he saw the first images. The world looked as if it was ending, and it seemed like the SCP Foundation was responsible. How could this be? 
They were supposed to protect humanity, not destroy it. Pietro needed to uncover the truth behind what was happening. SCP-5000 had a log entry function that he could use to record everything he uncovered. Even if he didn't make it out of this live, maybe one day someone would find the suit and be able to access what he had learned. The date of his first journal entry was February 1st, 2020. As Pietro watched the carnage unfold on TV, he began to put together the pieces of what he had witnessed himself. He knew a special ops squad had executed everyone at Site-22 where he worked. He knew that the SCPs had been let loose. He knew the world was ending. But why? As Pietro pondered this, a newscaster appeared. What you have just witnessed are reports from around the world of monsters ravaging cities and towns. This all started with a mysterious message from an organization that calls itself the SCP Foundation. Their ruling body, named the O5 Council, released the following statement. For those who are not currently aware of our existence, we represent the organization known as the SCP Foundation. Our previous mission centered around the containment and study of anomalous objects, entities, and other assorted phenomena. This mission was the focus of our organization for more than 100 years. Due to circumstances outside of our control, this directive has now changed. Our new mission will be the extermination of the human race. There will be no further communication. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The SCP Foundation had declared war on the human race. How could this be? What had led to the O5 Council changing their entire mission from protecting humanity to ending it? Could it be possible that a powerful SCP had taken control or influenced the Council's decision? Pietro turned on the radio, flipped through TV channels, and scoured the internet for information on what had happened over the past 24 hours. The first image he saw was a human-like creature with arms and legs twice as long as they should have been, with deep black eyes and a mouth curled up into a silent screen, showing teeth as sharp as razor blades. From the files he could access, Pietro learned that this was SCP-096, a creature that was docile until someone saw its face, at which point the SCP would start to shriek and cry before hunting down whoever saw its face and slaughtering them. He quickly changed the channel, the file said that even if SCP-096 was seen on a screen, it would find the viewer and tear them limb from limb. Surely that couldn't be true. There were potentially millions of people who had just seen it on TV. What would happen to them? What would happen to him? On the next channel was footage of a gigantic animal in the middle of the ocean. This was SCP-169, a leviathan from the Precambrian era. The creature was around 5,000 kilometers long and slowly swam just below the surface of the ocean. The feed suddenly changed to footage of devastating tsunamis and destruction caused by earthquakes. When SCP-169 had been awoken from its slumber by the Foundation detonating nukes on its back, it began trying to escape the danger. The movement of the massive creature caused natural disasters destroying coastal communities around the world. On another channel, Pietro was watching as the Chancellor of Germany gave a speech, announcing that the country was declaring war on the SCP Foundation. Off camera, the sound of a tinkling bell could be heard. A man dressed as a Victorian-era butler entered and picked up a pen from the Chancellor's desk. He approached the Chancellor and raised the pen in the air as the camera cut away, but the sound of gunshots and yelling could be heard before the feed went dead. The news reported that similar events involving world leaders by the exact same butler had been occurring since the SCP Foundation changed its mission. Pietro searched through the suit's files to try and figure out what was happening, and found that SCP-662 must have been connected. Next was a strange skin disease plaguing New York and Delhi designated SCP-610 that covered its hosts in rashes and boils before seeking to take over their bodies. Finally, some good news, though. As the outbreak looked to be contained by the combined efforts of the Global Occult Coalition and the Church of the Broken God. And then some bad news, as SCP-682 had also been released. A massive crocodilian monster, its sole mission was to destroy all life. It was fueled by hatred for living things, making it the perfect tool of the O5 Council's new stated mission. Pietro had heard rumors of SCPs that could instantly end the world, but clearly the Foundation hadn't gone down this route. Yet. Did they want to keep the rest of the planet intact? Or maybe there were holdouts in the SCP Foundation who were trying to stop the O5 Council from carrying out their mission. All Pietro knew was that right now, there were some real nasty SCPs running around wrecking havoc.
Pietro suddenly heard an explosion in the distance, far away, but still close enough to make him nervous. Maybe he was better off staying in the safe house and waiting out the apocalypse. The suit was keeping him healthy, nourished, and undetectable to foes. Any sane person would have remained there in seclusion and safety, but Pietro needed answers. He felt it was his responsibility to log and try to make sense of everything the SCP Foundation was doing. He brought up a map of SCP sites in the area on his display. The closest was Site-19. It was time to venture out into the end of the world and find some answers, but he was about to be faced with even more questions. On the way to Site-19, Pietro came across something strange, a squad of Foundation soldiers in a clearing. They were standing at attention as their commander paced back and forth, up and down the line. The soldiers' uniforms had the insignia MTF Epsilon-6 embroidered on them. The commander stopped in front of the first soldier in the line, clapped her hands, and informed the soldier she would be beginning the check now. The commander pulled out a long knife and plunged it into the soldier's shoulder. Strangely, the soldier did not move make a sound, or react in any way. She moved on to the next soldier and repeated the process. This continued on the line until she reached the eighth soldier. This time, when the commander stabbed the shoulder of the soldier, he noticeably winced and cried out in pain. The commander shouted, Got a live one! Pietro watched as the soldiers raised their guns and fired at the one who had cried out. He dropped to the ground. The commander moved on to the last soldier and put the knife in his shoulder. There was no reaction. All right, we're clear, yelled the commander. Let's move out. Pietro waited until the squad was out of sight and made his way to the corpse lying on the ground. He scavenged weapons and basic medical supplies. Then he buried the body and recorded what he had seen in SCP-5000's log. He had no idea why the soldier was killed or why the others didn't feel pain. Maybe they weren't human at all. Maybe it was a squad of SCPs that had a human infiltrate their ranks. None of this makes sense, Pietro thought before continuing on. Upon reaching Site-19, Pietro found it in disarray, and worse, practically all of the SCPs that were held at the site had breached containment. He was able to walk into the compound unnoticed, and deep in the facility he found scientists and researchers going about their business as if they had no idea what was happening out in the world. They must have been following the orders of the O5 Council. Pietro listened in on conversations about how to create the maximum number of human casualties and which SCP should be released next. He felt a deep hatred for the people in the facility. How could they be so casual about wiping out humanity? As he observed more of the workers at Site-19, he noticed something strange. Everyone's eyes were cold and dead, like there was no humanity left in them, as if something had got to these scientists and removed the very souls from their bodies. Pietro stealthily stole a senior staff member's credentials and found an empty office where he could access logs from the facility to try to get a better idea of the timeline of events that led to the SCP Foundation's war on humanity. He logged into the mainframe and brought up the entries from the end of the previous year. He found that late in 2019, a project called NUMA became of great interest to the O5 Council. From what Pietro could tell, the project had something to do with the collective human consciousness, also called the psychospace. Apparently, SCP researchers had a breakthrough in mapping out the psychospace. Unfortunately, many of the files had been redacted, and there was no way for Pietro to access the unredacted version. After Numa had been brought to the attention of the O5 Council, a series of orders were sent out to all senior staff and site directors, but frustratingly, these orders had also been redacted. All he could see was that after the orders were sent out, a wave of resignations were submitted across the Foundation. Suspiciously, a wave of suicides had also occurred at roughly the same time. What was in these orders? The O5 Council then sent out a number of files to all senior staff and site directors with instructions to disseminate the materials among those serving under them, after which both the resignations and deaths immediately ceased. Pietro searched everywhere for what was in those files, but like so much of the SCP database, this information had been redacted as well. What was clear was that the SCP Foundation had begun gearing up for the extermination of humanity the following year. The entry log for February 1st, 2020 read, Mobile task forces are dispatched to all exclusionary sites to execute all personnel. Immediately following the conclusion of these missions, the Foundation declares war on humanity. This was where Pietro Wilson's journey had started. He slammed his hands down on the computer monitor in frustration. The suit absorbed all of the impact and crushed the monitor in half. 
Pietro moved to a new non-Smash computer and logged in again. This time he brought up the most current entries to see what the O5 Council was up to recently, to see if there were some answers in the present. The SCP Foundation had been busy while he was making his way to Site-19. They had released SCP-1048 in Paris, which now led a horde of bears down the Champs-Élysées. In the distance, Pietro thought he could almost make out a massive red teddy bear walking between the buildings. The SCP Foundation was also launching counterattacks on any organization that tried to oppose them. They used SCP-1290 to hurl projectiles at the Global Occult Coalition's base. They were also using SCP-1440 to brainwash people and convince them that they needed to riot. This caused widespread destruction as people panicked and were trampled to death. Pietro thought it was sad that such a kind-looking old man could cause so much destruction. He recorded as much as he could before deciding that it was time to get out of Site-19. Although SCP-5000 still made him undetectable, he couldn't shake the feeling that the lifeless eyes of the staff were beginning to look his way more and more often. As Pietro exited Site-19, the sky glowed orange with the fires of countless burning buildings. He needed to find more answers. He needed to uncover the reason the SCP Foundation was trying to wipe out humanity. He had learned a lot from Site-19 and was sure that if he could just get to the next site, he would finally be able to figure out the Foundation's motive and maybe even how to stop them. He took a step forward, but his heads-up display suddenly went completely dark. The suit constricted tighter around his body, slowing the blood flow to his brain. He couldn't move as his vision got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until he blacked out. Pietro woke to find himself halfway across the country. It had been three months since he had been at Site-19, and he had no recollection of anything that had happened since. His body had taken a toll in these months. He had new scars and a bandage wrapped around his head, but the SCP-5000 suit did not seem to have a scratch on it. Strangest of all, though, was the briefcase that Pietro had in his hand and the uncontrollable need to deliver it to the mysterious SCP-579. Think back to your childhood and ask yourself, what was the most pain you've ever felt while growing up? As we develop, our understanding of pain evolves according to our different experiences. The older we get, the injuries we suffered as children like a scraped knee or a bee sting rarely cause us the same level of distress as they used to. Of course, when you are young and unfamiliar with sensations of pain, what you really need in that moment straight after you've fallen off your bike or tripped playing soccer is someone to pick you back up and give your sore spot a kiss. Perhaps you even need a bowl of warm soup to comfort you. Luckily for you, SCP-348 is exactly that. While many of the anomalies held in containment by the SCP Foundation have earned the Euclid or infamous Keter class designations, SCP-348 is one of the few considered to be safe, both in the sense it poses no containment risk and in that it wouldn't hurt a fly. It is neither an ancient, eldritch abomination from another dimension spreading its influence in our world through mimetic stimuli, nor is it a recording of a basketball game in which all the players and spectators are trapped inside. It isn't an indestructible, limb-generating reptile or a towering winged being wielding a flaming sword and guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. To put it simply, SCP-348 is a bull a white ceramic bowl, the kind you would find almost anywhere in the world. It may even look indistinguishable from the one in your kitchen cabinet. Of course, SCP-348 is hardly as ordinary as it outwardly appears to be, and it certainly isn't the only inanimate object that the Foundation keeps safely stored away. The key thing that differentiates SCP-348 from most other anomalies is how genuinely harmless it is. Its anomalous properties do not cause injury to any individual that interacts with it, nor does this bowl have any adverse effects on the world around it. SCP-348 cannot bend or reshape reality. It does not cause the person eating from it to have premonitions of their own death, and using it certainly does not manifest a contract-making entity at the opposite side of the table. So what makes this bowl in any way anomalous? What about it categorizes it as an SCP and not just a harmless piece of fine crockery? Well, why don't we start with how SCP-348 was first discovered? Some time ago, the SCP Foundation was made aware of rumors surrounding a child living in an unknown part of the world. According to the intelligence gathered by the Foundation, this child seemed to possess some sort of healing ability. 
or at least this is what rumors suggested. Upon further investigation, the source of these so-called remarkable recovery abilities wasn't the child, but appeared to come from a small ceramic bowl, which we now know as SCP-348. This is not to say that the bowl has any inherently supernatural healing properties, and it doesn't impart any regenerative power to those that eat from it either. It does heal in a certain sense, but not in the way you're probably imagining. When the SCP Foundation recovered SCP-348, there were no markings on it indicating where the bowl came from or who it was manufactured by. The only visually distinct details worthy of note were flowery patterns that appeared to be hand-painted around both the inside and outside of SCP-348. The ceramic surface also bore the Chinese letters Shang Xinyi, which translates to the phrase, thinking of you. The child that first discovered it found the ceramic bowl in the attic of their home. The child's parents were both full-time workers and seemed to be somewhat neglectful of their child, although they refused to comment on this. But according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, the child had come to rely on SCP-348. Deciding to further investigate the anomalous properties of SCP-348, the Foundation began testing it. Given that the child who first discovered the bowl had relied upon it, Tests involve Foundation researchers presenting certain children to SCP-348 and observing the results. So was this bowl haunted? Perhaps harboring some malicious spirit or entity that sought to corrupt these children, maybe even healing them in order to somehow use them as a vessel to break into our world? No. And while it may have not healed in any overt or expected way, it did heal in at least a metaphorical sense. If presented with an injured child sporting any form of minor ailment such as a cut or a runny nose, SCP-348 fills with warm soup. And yes, that's right, we said soup. What kind you may ask? Well, that seems to vary. Sometimes it is tomato soup, other times it might be chicken noodle soup. While the ingredients used in the soups are often different, there are notable consistencies to how SCP-348 heals. If anyone between the ages of 4 years old and 18 years old sits down in front of the blue flowered bowl, then SCP-348 will fill with soup. Numerous young test subjects brought in by the Foundation to eat from this particular bowl of soup have reported that they enjoyed their meal, usually finishing the entire bowl when permitted to by research staff. Many of the injured children that were tested have stated that the soup they eat from SCP-348 reminds them of their parents' cooking. These children have expressed contentment and feelings of comfort after acquiring their various cuts and bruises. Some even claim that even though they were in a room all alone, they didn't feel lonely when they were eating the soup. And all the anomalous properties don't end after a child finishes the soup. Usually, although not always, the bowl will leave the child a message, often some brief words of reassurance or comfort. These messages materialize on the inside rim of the bowl and seem to be specifically tailored to the subject that has just eaten. The words will not only be written in the child's first language, but are often linked to the child's home life or relationship with their parents. Messages that appear on SCP-348 usually fade over time, normally disappearing after a few hours or when the bowl refills with more soup. One test of SCP-348 saw a little girl, age 8 and suffering from a sore throat, brought before the bowl. According to a background screening made by research personnel, the girl lived with her biological parents and apparently had a good relationship with both her mother and her father. When SCP-348 filled with soup for her, the girl took almost half an hour to finish eating and afterwards reported that she felt her sore throat get better as she ate. By the end of the meal, this test subject remarked that she felt completely normal. In this instance, no message appeared within the bowl. Another child was brought in to continue the testing of SCP-348, this time a boy of 10. Unlike the previous test, this boy was not on good terms with his parents and often argued with them. At the time of testing, the boy had sustained several minor bruises, the result of a small accident that occurred while the boy had been out riding his bike. Much like the little girl, this subject ate the soup that SCP-348 presented him with. This time though, the bowl offered a message to the boy. The lettering found on the ceramic surface of SCP-348 simply read, Don't forget to brush. Messages also appeared when an 11-year-old boy with a slight cold ate soup from the bowl. This child had been adopted by a foster family, and after eating from SCP-348, he saw the message, 
I'm glad you're happy appear. Another young test subject, a boy age six, had a similar experience. In this instance, the child had several scrapes and scratches from playing with his friends. His parents had divorced, and he was living with his mother at the time of testing. This time, SCP-348's message to this boy read, I'm sorry, son. A seven-year-old girl suffering from a cough was brought in before SCP-348. She had lost her father to a traffic accident some time before testing commenced, and received the message, I love you, after finishing her soup. Further testing conducted by the Foundation revealed that anyone over the age of 18 years who attempted to eat soup from SCP-348 experienced things slightly differently. Unlike the children, older subjects mostly displayed a disinterest in finishing their meal. A common complaint among those over 18 was that the soup was missing something. However, in a few isolated cases, testing SCP-348 on older candidates still revealed messages, although the words seemed to be faded, not the clear hand-painted blue that appeared when the children had finished their soup. One woman aged 30 who was suffering from a headache sat down in front of SCP-348. Much like it had done before, the bowl filled with soup and the woman ate. As with some of the younger subjects, a key aspect of this woman's background seemed to be what triggered the message to appear. Specifically, she admitted to being on bad terms with her mother and father. The woman explained that she had opted to live on her own, isolating herself from her family. In fact, she even described having rejected an offer her father made to her many years earlier, refusing some career training that he was willing to give in order to help her secure a job. When she finished the soup, one word appeared in the bowl. Why? Another woman, who was 40 years old, was also brought in for the SCP-348 testing. Much like the previous subject, she had moved away from home and became estranged from her parents over the years. But unlike the previous test, this woman had taken it upon herself to not only send money to her parents, but also arrange senior care for both as well. Prior to testing, her father had died peacefully of natural causes after spending his last days in the care that this woman had paid for. As the woman ate the soup from the bowl, she remarked about its apparently bitter taste, but also described her meal as fulfilling. After she had finished, the words thank you appeared within SCP-348. One other adult subject that produced a noticeable result from SCP-348 was a 40-year-old male. The results of this test appeared to be the most distinctly different from any previous adult or child. By now, researchers working for the SCP Foundation had determined that familial history seemed to play an important role in the outcome of any interaction with SCP-348, and this individual was certainly different to most. The man in question had murdered his father roughly a year before the testing took place. He began the test with SCP-348 while afflicted with aches in his back. After one taste of the soup that appeared in the bowl before him, the murderer was immediately repulsed. He complained about the taste, refusing to eat any more from SCP-348. Shortly after, the man began to experience severe stomach pain. The potentially poisonous soup was disposed of, but SCP-348 immediately filled with salt water, which took three hours to disappear from the bowl. Despite conducting numerous tests with subjects of all ages and ailments, the SCP Foundation researchers have so far been unable to determine the origins of the messages that sometimes appear in SCP-348. Some have theorized because of the family histories of some children and adults tested that the words somehow come from the father of whoever eats the soup. Since even when a subject's father is alive or present in their life, the message seems to convey feelings that their father has or would have. Other researchers claim that this is just the purpose of SCP-348, to provide comfort to small children dealing with pain, both inside and out. After all, isn't providing comfort what a good bowl of soup, anomalous or not, is best at? Dr. Lola Bergman was an accomplished senior researcher for the SCP Foundation. Her years of hard work studying anomalies and dedication to the Foundation had earned her a Level 3 security clearance, allowing her to access a bevy of secret information across the Foundation's vast network. As a researcher and a scientist, Dr. Bergman was the naturally inquisitive type. She wanted to know everything there was to know about the strange and esoteric universe around her. That's why, when she heard about the file for SCP-2000, one of the organization's best-kept secrets, she was hooked. The only problem was that just to view the file, you had to be on the O5 Council or have a special subset of Level 4 clearance known as 4-2000. 
Unfortunately, Dr. Bergman was only a level 3, but you know what they say. The forbidden fruit always tastes the sweetest. Dr. Bergman had given the Foundation years of service. What could the harm be in breaking the rules and getting a peek behind the curtain just this once? Through somewhat deceptive means, Dr. Bergman managed to get her hands on some 42,000 clearance credentials and decided to access the file on an encrypted personal device. They'd never even know. But as she entered the credentials, she found herself suddenly looking at an image. On its face, nothing. An image of a dirt road in a field with tiny white text reading, remember us. But this was a powerful cognitohazardous image capable of causing immediate incapacitation. The next thing she knew, she was laying on the ground, unconscious. When she woke up, she was no longer a doctor at the SCP Foundation. She was on a street corner, unable to remember her own name, let alone her history. All she could do was murmur something about a secret under Yellowstone National Park. Dr. Bergman's years of service had meant nothing in the end. SCP-2000 is an anomalous asset so vital to not only the Foundation, but the entire world, that so much as attempting to access it without the proper clearance leads to immediate termination. But what's really hidden under Yellowstone National Park? And why are the Foundation higher-ups so intent on keeping it secret, even from most of their own ranks? Of course, Yellowstone National Park itself is no stranger to anomalous activity. The entire national park is technically an SCP known as SCP-1422. While it since has been neutralized, SCP-1422 caused all members of the SCP Foundation to have no awareness of Yellowstone National Park prior to 2007. But the true nature of SCP-2000, the secret hidden under Yellowstone National Park, is not only stranger than SCP-1422, but also, depending on your perspective, either profoundly relieving or utterly terrifying. But before you can truly understand the purpose and gravity of SCP-2000, or the Deus Ex Machina, we need to talk about the end of the world. In Foundation parlance, K-Class scenarios are events which have drastic implications on the state of society, normality, or even life. The most dangerous and feared of all of these are XK-Class scenarios, which are, for all intents and purposes, the apocalypse. There are a worrying number of anomalies capable of bringing about an XK-Class scenario if the Foundation ever dropped the ball on their protection or containment. While the Foundation believes that prevention is always preferable to the cure, what happens when prevention doesn't work? What happens when our worst fears are realized and the end truly comes for us all? The answer is SCP-2000 happens. Simply put, the anomaly is a reset button a chance to start over when all life has been compromised by anomalous activity. 2000 is a giant and mysterious facility beneath Yellowstone National Park. The entrance is disguised as a disused park ranger station, feeding into a facility that burrows miles down into the earth. It's a place that contains incredible anomalous technologies capable of bringing the world back to its former glory, even after the worst happens. Only a select few personnel are allowed to work at the facility, keeping its machinery maintained in case the day comes where we ever need to use it again. These personnel are not allowed to come and go as they please, and their memories of 2000 are wiped if they're ever reassigned to different Foundation duties elsewhere. Why all the secrecy? SCP-2000 is the Foundation's and humanity's lifeboat, and as such, the base is well guarded both from potential human threats as well as anomalous activity and reality warpers. The surface-level entrance to the base is surrounded by a number of strategically placed Scranton Reality Anchors, or SRAs. These devices, largely constructed of corrosion-resistant beryllium bronze alloy, keep certain type of reality-bending anomalies from manifesting their powers within the vicinity of the base. However, these are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the state-of-the-art Foundation technology employed within and around SCP-2000. You probably have a lot of questions, and that's understandable. What kind of technology can possibly reverse an apocalypse? And what did we mean when we said we may need to use it again? Well, listen up, because this is going to be a lot to take in. SCP-2000 is powered by a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, stabilized by five Zyank Anastasikos constant temporal sinks, and hosts to the most miraculous technology of all. 500,000 bright Zartion hominoid replicators. Utilizing geothermal energy from the volcanic activity in the area, the base could potentially remain operational forever if Foundation staff kept up with maintenance. 
The grand majority of the space in this huge subterranean facility is taken up by building materials, construction equipment, factory machinery, agricultural equipment, and computer database storage. Why? Well, let's explain the process of the apocalypse and how it relates to the activities of SCP-2000. In any K-class or end-of-the-world scenario that doesn't destroy SCP-2000 in the process, any surviving Foundation member can enact Procedure CYA-009, while any Foundation facilities globally can monitor the unfolding situation. While SCP-2000 is waiting for the all-clear to do its thing, remaining Foundation sites set in motion what is known as the Ganymede Protocol. This involves collecting and preserving materials which could be useful during the recreation process. However, it's extremely possible that in a sudden XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, there may be no surviving Foundation personnel, or at least, not enough to maintain any kind of organization. Thankfully, there are fail-safe measures for such a scenario. During the periods of extended inaction caused by an apocalypse that destroys most human life, SCP-2000 will gradually, autonomously, relax its security measures. Any personnel, regardless of clearance, will be able to activate the next stage of the process when this occurs. If such a thing doesn't happen for an extended period, the security measures lapse further, to the point that even the presence of an animal could activate it. This would set into motion Procedure Lazarus-01, humanity's last hope for survival. That's where the 500,000 bright Zartion hominoid replicators, or BZHRs, come in. These incredible pieces of anomalous technology are capable of perfectly cloning the entire human race from any given period in the last 20 years, even down to their ages and memories, thanks to Class G hallucinogens and developmental hypnotherapy. With a warm-up period of five days, these machines are capable of creating 100,000 viable, non-anomalous humans per day. The facility keeps records of all known human alleles and is capable of recreating any lost human genomes or generating as many new and unique genomes as necessary to repopulate human civilization. Which humans the machines generate depends on the period of time the machine is ordered to replicate. It will first reproduce prominent cultural and political figures, as well as the acting top brass of the SCP Foundation to coordinate the recreation effort, of course. The machine will then recreate, well, everyone else. You're probably wondering, if the world outside SCP-2000 has been destroyed, then what good is creating all these new humans if they have nothing to go back to? Thankfully, SCP-2000 has a contingency for rebuilding both the infrastructure of civilization as well as society itself. The first generation clones will have one mission, rebuild, and they will have quite literally all the resources in the world to do it. In addition to having all the physical equipment for buildings and agriculture, SCP-2000 stores an immense amount of data, which is appropriate, considering the whole facility is basically a huge backup drive for life itself. They have the entire internet backed up, as well as the sum of all human memory, and a wide cultural base with copies of thousands of famous works of art, music, and literature. They have all the scattered jigsaw pieces of the time that came before, and it's their job to put the whole thing back together. It's expected that many of the first generation of clones will die in this process, but that's fine. With the BZHRs working at full capacity, anyone can be replicated. As the population increases and spreads across the globe, rebuilding and recolonizing old settlements, population growth will increase exponentially. Once society returns to some kind of normal, decades after the activation of Procedure Lazarus-01, it becomes the Foundation's task to restore the psychological and historical status quo. Administrators will falsify dendrochronological, astronomical, and radiometric dating records to make it seem as though history never paused. They'll then employ amnestic agent NUE-5 and mass to erase and reconstruct the memories of the entire human population up until the chosen time prior to the end of the world. As far as civilization knows, nothing ever happened. History never stopped, and life goes on. It may seem comforting at first to know that the ultimate contingency is out there. Even if there's a containment breach of astronomical proportions and the world as we know it ends, there's still a way out. It means that there's hope, even in the bleakest situations. But of course, there are always caveats. After all, if a deal seems too good to be true, it's safe to assume it probably is. Whether any of this works is dependent on two factors. The first is that no anomalies or human insurgents infiltrate the SCP-2000 facility and destroy the equipment within. 
It's for this reason that discussion of the facility is so restrictive. If ever a powerful reality warper discovered and gained access to the facility, we would lose our lifeboat. The second factor is the overall integrity of the machines. After all, without proper maintenance, it's not hard for the technology to malfunction, often to truly horrifying results. The failure of some SRA and X-AX components is believed to have caused erroneous BZHR activity, resulting in the production of 10 million humanoid entities with internal biology wildly inconsistent with humanity. These beings remained unconscious for five weeks before dying. In the event of an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, well-maintained machines can reproduce the human race, but all it'd take is one little malfunction to release 10 million mutants who are effectively dead on arrival. Even with SCP-2000 in our back pocket, the fate of the world still lives on a knife's edge. But in a way, that's not even the most frightening part of the existence of SCP-2000. Seeing as the machine can perfectly reproduce reality without leaving a trace behind, it raises the question, how many times has this happened? You may be surprised, but the Foundation can confirm this occurred at least twice in recorded history. But can you ever really be sure of how many times your clone has crawled out of the BZHR? We received a disturbing clue to the reality of the situation when human remains were discovered on site at SCP-2000. All tests indicate that the remains are between 450 and 700 years old, and have been matched to the very much alive Dr. Alto Clef, who has no knowledge of how these remains came to be there. The only other thing found within the remains was a note, hermetically sealed in a plastic document sleeve. The note read, Why do we have to build this thing? When did we do it? How long have we been doing it? Do we even know? And the answer? No, we don't. And for everyone's peace of mind, it's probably best to just forget about it. If you can. It was a beautiful September day but Sean Taylor was trapped in his car in one of the worst cases of gridlock he had ever seen. He tried to look on the bright side, though, and while he was stuck in an unmoving car, at least he had a pleasant view of the wide, shimmering lake just off the road next to him. He was admiring the scene when tiny drops of rain started landing on his windshield. That's funny. There wasn't a cloud in the sky a moment ago. There was something off about the rain, though. It looked dirty, a rusty red color. Was that blood? He didn't have time to think about it, because just then, a thick, dense mist began to roll over the lake. A fog of blood. Just off the side of the road, he could see a huge silhouette rising out of the water. Is that an old submarine? What Sean didn't know was that he was about to have an encounter with SCP-1861, also known as the HMS Wintersheimer, a ghostly submarine with strange and terrifying effects. Sean and the other drivers stuck in traffic that day were far from the first people to have a dangerous brush with this legendary vessel. According to SCP Foundation records, the HMS Wintersheimer has been appearing since as early as 1916. The first recorded incident occurred in the British seaside town of Innsmouth-on-Sea. You won't find this town on any maps or in the history books, and you're about to find out why. The 500 population of the town, which had already reduced by the wartime draft into the currently raging Great World War, awoke to red skies on February 6, 1916. Citizens left their homes to investigate, only to find their entire town had been enveloped in a thick red mist. The swelling crimson clouds up ahead began to rain, showering the town in a hail of viscous red goop. Anyone unlucky enough to taste it would say that this strange rain was a dreadful mix of salt and copper. This was because, as the Foundation would later determine, the rain and fog was a disgusting combination of salt water, human blood, and human cerebrospinal fluid. But the real threat was rising just beyond the beach. Technically speaking, the HMS Wintersheimer vessel is designated as SCP-1861-A. It appears to be a World War I-era British B-class submarine, designed by Vickers for the Royal Navy in 1904. By 1916, this particular type of boat was already on its way to being obsolete, and were largely deployed in Malta, far from the active fronts. So one of these vessels appearing on an otherwise unremarkable stretch of English coastline should have been a clue that something was terribly wrong. But the poor residents of Innsmouth-on-Sea didn't know the half of it. 
Soon, figures in what appeared to be archaic diving gear began emerging from the Wintersheimer and made their way into the township. They seemed terrified, running up to and frantically screaming at any local they could find. Please listen to me. Something terrible is about to happen here. We need you to come with us or you're all going to die. You must believe us. The locals were frightened by what they heard. They'd been listening to news reports of the Great War unfolding across the globe for two years now. Had it finally come to them? They pictured shells raining down from the sky, decimating their defenseless little town in a rain of fire. The Navy must have been brought in to save them before the German bombardment began. While some took more convincing than others, the men in diving suits, known as SCP-1861-B, eventually managed to persuade the entire town to join them and lead the townspeople down to the water. One by one, they were all boarded onto the submarine, hundreds of them. Many couldn't believe their eyes as they watched scores of people disappear in front of them into the dark bowels of the Wintersheimer. Where were they all going? How would they all fit in there? But it was too late for any of them to back out now. The vessel submerged once more, and everyone was gone. The entire population of Innsmouth on Sea had disappeared in a rain of fog and blood, never to be seen again. The Foundation wiped all records of the town from existence and delivered appropriate amnestic treatment to anyone who still mentioned or remembered Innsmouth on Sea. The fate of those who board the HMS Wintersheimer is always the same vanish from the face of the earth, explained away by the Foundation as accidental death by extreme weather event. There have been hundreds of documented sightings of SCP-1861, and the anomalous weather event can occur near any body of water wide enough to accommodate SCP-1861-A's comms tower and topmost platform. Depth does not seem to be any hindrance of the submarine appearing, and it can even manifest in water that's just a few inches deep. As Sean and the other unfortunate victims of the rush hour traffic were being showered in thick red droplets from above, a crimson mist rolled in between the cars. Sean had heard of so-called freak weather events before, like raining frogs and fish, but this was something different, and it frightened him. He could see now that the silhouette rising from the lake really was an old submarine, and he watched as a legion of mysterious figures disembarked from the vessel and began spilling onto the road. The men in ancient-looking diving suits walked among the cars and one of them approached Sean's car. He began tapping frantically on the window and Sean could tell he was yelling something. Sean was scared and more, but more than anything else, he was confused. Against his better judgment, he rolled down the window just a crack to hear what the man was saying. His British-accented voice muted by the diving suit, the man frantically told him, Sir, please listen to me. I'm Lieutenant Samuel Ramsey of the HMS Wintersheimer. We're evacuating the area. Please, you've got to come with me. We're in danger out here. HMS? Sean thought. Isn't that what they call British ships? What was a British submarine doing in the middle of a lake in the United States? Through his windshield, Sean could already see other men in diving suits leading people from the cars out towards the submarine. Something had to be going on here. Something big. Lieutenant Ramsey was still banging away at the glass of Sean's window, becoming increasingly agitated. Sir, if you won't comply with my orders, I'm within my rights to take you by force for your own safety. Sean could feel the fear setting in, but he didn't know what else to do. He turned off the car and took off his seatbelt. He was just about to open the door when there was a tap on the passenger side window of his car. It was a soldier in what looked to be advanced tactical gear. There were several soldiers directing cars to drive on the shoulder to get around the mess of stopped automobiles. Sean looked to his left, and the man in the diving suit was gone. The soldier tapped again, and Sean didn't need to be told twice. He followed his directions and drove around the traffic jam and out of the mist. A half mile down the road, Sean was stopped by another group of soldiers and given an amnestic. He drove away never knowing how close he had come to vanishing in the bowels of SCP-1861-A. Sean was lucky that one of the SCP Foundation's mobile task forces had taken over the situation, but they were too late to help those who had already complied with SCP-1861-B's orders and boarded the Wintersheimer. The task force made it their business to save whoever they could but that wasn't their only directive. The Foundation had recorded a huge number of SCP-1861 instances since 1916, and now they were finally going to figure out what was going on inside. 
The Foundation had already discovered that those taken onto the Wintersheimer don't simply disappear. Once on board the submarine, they are forced into a diving suit of their own, which transforms them into new instances of SCP-1861-B. Upon realizing this, Foundation scientists devised an ingenious plot. Six months before this latest instance of 1861, the Foundation dispatched two members of D-Class personnel who were familiar with one another into the Red Mist. One was instructed not to interact with SCP-1861-B, while the other, named Sal, was ordered to enter the submarine. His mission was to report back all findings to Foundation researcher Dr. Clutch during the next 1861 event. The D-Class who remained on shore was brought in once more by the Mobile Task Force during the September event that Sean witnessed. They checked each diving suit wearing anomaly until they heard a familiar voice, muffled by the mask. It was Sal, and he'd been transformed into an instance of SCP-1861-B. The human D-Class, receiving questions from Dr. Clutch via a remote broadcast, commenced the interview of his former friend. It is from this vital interview that much of the Foundation's knowledge of the mysterious HMS Wintersheimer is drawn. According to Sal, the interior of the Wintersheimer, which is a long, narrow passageway, is a spatial anomaly that seems to stretch on forever. This explains how vast number of people, like the entire population of Innsmouth on Sea, can disappear into the submarine at once. Sal reported that, about an hour after entering the vessel, the hatch closed and the interior began rapidly filling with water as the submarine descended. Prisoners of the Wintersheimer were faced with two choices, suit up or drown. Few chose the latter option, and as soon as the suit was on, the transformation had begun. As soon as everyone was suited up and the submarine had fully descended, causing the 1861 weather event to dissipate on Earth, the Wintersheimer had effectively entered an alternate dimension. The airlock opened and the new recruits were instructed to step outside and take a look around. The Wintersheimer veterans informed the new sailors that everyone on land was likely already dead by this point. When Sal first exited the submarine, he commented on everything around him looking eerily similar to how it looked on land before the mist descended, but with one key difference. It seemed as though everything was underwater. Well, not quite that. It was almost as though everything was water like the world had taken on a kind of flowing liquid state. Sal and the others existed in this otherworldly land of living water for six months, and as the months passed, things only got stranger. They found that they neither needed to eat nor sleep. According to Sal, all they did was breathe, and pass the time by exploring and talking to one another. Anyone who attempted to take off their suit would dissolve and diffuse into the same liquid that surrounded them. Dr. Clutch asked Sal about the other inhabitants of this alien realm, and this was when things got truly disturbing. There were dead humans and animals floating all over the place, missing their eyes as though they'd been scooped out, and missing their mouths, as though they'd been bitten out of their face by some kind of huge predator. Their empty eye sockets bled constantly, and Sal theorized that this may have something to do with the anomalous blood mists of SCP-1861. When asked to provide more information on why all the corpses were mutilated in this way, Sal said that one of his superiors on the Wintersheimer told him, The watcher of eyes and biter of teeth deemed them worthy. Whatever this mysterious being was, it seemed to be a powerful figure within 1861's water world and Sal felt lucky that he never had a direct run-in with the creature himself. For his final request, Dr. Clutch asked Sal to attempt to remove his suit. The Foundation had learned in previous instances of 1861 that the diving suits have anomalous durability, and it was impossible for anyone other than the wearer to remove them, hence why the Foundation could never deal with 1861-B by using brute force. Naturally, Clutch was interested in finding out what was going on underneath. Sal expressed fear and anxiety at first, wondering if after all he'd been through, whether he could ever be considered human anymore. Eventually, he was convinced to remove the suit, and his worst fears were confirmed. The second Sal removed his helmet, gallons of seawater poured out, and the now empty suit collapsed to the ground. Sal's body was never found. Only some teeth and a pair of eyes were recovered. The eyes were later confirmed to be belonging to a young girl, and the teeth were identified as having come from a European red deer. And so, 
The dark mystery of the HMS Wintersheimer continues. Because of the unpredictable nature of its appearances and the resulting difficulty of containing it, the Wintersheimer has earned a Keter classification. The only containment procedure currently employed by the SCP Foundation is for mobile task forces to try and intercept the submarine when appearances are reported and hopefully prevent, or at least reduce, the kidnapping of civilians. With so many questions left unanswered, all we can say for certain is that if a red mist ever descends on you, and a stranger in a diving suit tells you you're in grave danger, he's absolutely right. Being a D-class for the SCP Foundation is a lot like playing Russian roulette. One day, you could be assigned to a tickle fight with a friendly blob of slime, and next you're getting your femurs broken to lure a sadistic old man back into his containment chamber. So, when D-9781 was told to simply sit in an interrogation room and wait, he really didn't know what to think. But the last thing he probably expected to see was when the door behind him creaked open, was for a well-dressed stranger to step in. This man wasn't like any member of Foundation staff the D-Class had ever seen. He was a short Caucasian man with a receding hairline and a neat black mustache. Instead of the standard lab coat and shirt normally seen around the facility, this man wore a black waistcoat, a pair of white gloves, and a wry smile that betrayed a sinister intent. He looked like a butler, and not just any butler, but the quintessential butler. If you were asked to doodle a cartoon butler, this would be the man you drew. The D-Class almost laughed in sheer confusion. He had no idea that, in a mere moment, he would be dead. Now what's the deal, Jeeves? He asked with a mocking half-smile, but he didn't get to hear a response. The butler approached at frightening speeds. The D-Class, in his last moments on Earth, saw the glint of something metallic under the overhead lights moving too fast for him to see what it was, and then felt a sharp pain across his throat. The butler was standing beside him now, still with that wry little smile. The D-Class could see now that the butler was carrying a small buck knife, dripping with red. Just as he was piecing together what had happened to him, the D-Class collapsed onto the table he was sitting at, his throat expertly slit. His grisly task completed, the butler gave a polite nod and exited the room, smiling at the Foundation guard standing outside. Who is this man? Why is he dressed like this? And most importantly, why is he allowed to murder D-Class personnel on Foundation grounds without consequence? We can answer that first question right now, because this isn't a man at all. He's the anomalous product of SCP-662, also known as the butler's handbell. First, we need to go back to the beginning and see how this anomalous object first fell into the hands of the SCP Foundation. Like a lot of anomalous objects now under the care of the Foundation, its true origins remain mysterious, and it spent quite some time underground. We mean that literally, by the way. It was buried with its last owner, a man whose name has since been redacted from Foundation files. Clutched in this unknown man's skeletal hand, it was extremely likely that the bell might never have been seen again. But then a petty thief and grave robber by the name of George Dixon came along and dug up the grave. A simple, greedy act that has changed a number of people's lives forever. Not knowing the true value of what he held, Mr. Dixon made his way to a pawn shop for his payday. There, the store owner made the mistake of lifting up and ringing the bell. As if on cue, he heard footsteps approaching behind him. The store owner turned and gasped. He saw a complete stranger emerging from the stockroom behind him. He was a short, well-dressed man, smiling as he advanced towards him. The proprietor of the pawn shop didn't know who this guy with the strange outfit was, but he assumed he was an accomplice of the man in his store and that the two were trying to rob him. He grabbed a shotgun from underneath his counter, turned to the butler, and blasted him in the chest with both barrels. The butler fell back dead, and George Dixon fled the scene in a blind panic. Contrary to what the owner may have believed, nothing that happened here had been planned. Dixon was just as surprised as he was to see this mysterious butler emerge from the stockroom. So what had just happened? The pawn shop owner reported the incident to the authorities and the butler's body was taken to the local morgue, while the silver bell ended up in a police evidence locker. Later that same night, things went from a strange bungled robbery to a full-on anomaly, attracting the attention of the SCP Foundation. First, the butler's body disappeared from the morgue the second the mortician took her eyes off of it, and then reappeared, now alive, in the police storage locker. 
Why? Because an unwitting sergeant just so happened to ring the little silver bell. Agent Bradford of the SCP Foundation was promptly on the scene. He pretended to be an FBI agent and escorted the butler off the premises, claiming that this was a notorious escape artist who was wanted for federal crimes in several states. Things didn't go as Bradford planned, though, when he discovered that the butler had disappeared from his handcuffs when no one was looking. Agent Bradford theorized that this had something to do with the bell, and he confiscated it for testing. Later, when he rang the bell inside an SCP containment facility, the butler turned up once more. He introduced himself as Mr. Deeds and said that he would happily perform any service that Agent Bradford required. Despite being offered the phenomenal power of a seemingly magical butler, Bradford politely refused the offer and instead handed the bell over to his superiors. But don't worry, Agent Bradford wasn't left completely empty-handed and was given the esteemed SCP Foundation Pat on the Back Award for performing such a professional and selfless act in service of the Foundation. The superior who ended up with the bell, however, wouldn't have quite the same level of professionalism, but more on that later. The bell, cataloged as SCP-662, was small and made of pure silver, with no obvious anomalous elements at face value. It was a mere 4 centimeters tall and 2 centimeters wide, with a small inscription reading, Forever Mine, SJW. Researchers studying the bell also noted that it lacked its ringer, but whenever the bell was rung, a chime would still sound from somewhere in the room to signal the arrival of Mr. Deeds, the anomalous butler. The object was classified as safe and was kept in high-value storage locker 23C between uses for experiments. It's an extremely low-maintenance anomaly, with the only real requirement being a regular polish to keep the silver from tarnishing over time. But what of Mr. Deeds, the mysterious butler summoned every time someone rings SCP-662? The Foundation needed to find out more, so he was placed under the watchful eye of Foundation researcher Dr. Mirth, who performed the first interview with Mr. Deeds. As you can probably expect from such a classy servant, Mr. Deeds was unfailingly polite during the interview. He always addressed Dr. Mirth as Sir and was extremely accommodating, within reason. Mr. Deeds' true name, birthplace, and date of birth were still a mystery to him. He could only vaguely remember that he was of English ancestry, and that during the time of his childhood, the horse and buggy were the most popular form of transport. When asked about personal details or his past, Mr. Deeds would often appear to become distressed before apologizing for his inability to remember the details. The most important piece of information that Dr. Mirth obtained early on in the interview was the primary function of Mr. Deeds. He was an entity that quite literally lived to serve. Like a genie being summoned from his lamp, Mr. Deeds would try to perform any task that the summoner gave him, whether it was cooking dinner or robbing banks. There were certain limits to these powers, though, and these limits were what Dr. Mirth needed to discover. Dr. Mirth first asked for a glass of iced tea from Mr. Deeds. The butler happily obliged and left the room walking down the hallway. While attending agents kept their eyes on him, Mr. Deeds continued to merely walk. However, the second they looked away, the cameras observing him malfunctioned. Deeds briefly disappeared and then returned with a tray of iced tea. Dr. Mirth remarked that it was perhaps the best iced tea he'd ever tasted. Mr. Deeds couldn't recall how the tea was made, though, or how he obtained it. Dr. Mirth next asked for a bar of gold at 99.98% purity, and Mr. Deeds delivered almost the exact level of purity Dr. Mirth asked for. From this, he deduced that Mr. Deeds can only perform his teleportation and manifestation abilities when he's out of people's direct lines of sight. He soon discovered that certain requests were off the table, though. Dr. Mirth asked for Mr. Deeds to fetch him a blue 1963 Corvette convertible. Mr. Deeds did not immediately procure the car, instead telling the doctor that such a thing was impossible because there were too many impractical steps involved in getting the vehicle. Dr. Mirth was disappointed by this, since he really wanted that car. It seemed, though, as Mr. Deeds' powers, while enhanced by teleportation and the ability to manifest simple objects, are limited by things that a mostly normal and very persistent person could conceivably do. For example, on Dr. Mirth's orders, Mr. Deeds politely declined to assassinate an insurgent leader in the Middle East, seeing as he was too well guarded and very far away. However, when given the command, he was more than willing to head into the next room and murder a member of D-Class with a knife. 
Dr. Mirth was interested in getting a closer look at what was going on with Mr. Deed's biology, and so asked him to slit his own throat with the same knife he used to murder the D-Class. Mr. Deeds politely obliged, commenting before he did to Dr. Mirth that it had been an absolute pleasure serving him. The body was kept within an agent's line of sight at all time until the autopsy could be performed, just to make sure it didn't disappear. The autopsy showed that there was nothing inherently anomalous about the physiology of Mr. Deeds, and he would appear as good as new the next time the bell rang. Things took an even stranger turn after that, though. Despite it appearing like the Foundation now knew everything they needed to know about Mr. Deeds and the SCP-662 bell, Dr. Mirth insisted on performing further studies into what exactly Mr. Deeds was capable of. For example, he requested a deep tissue massage, and found that it completely cured his back pain. Dr. Mirth also asked Mr. Deeds to clean his car, and found that it was clean to a truly impeccable standard. During his tenure as the lead researcher on the 662 project, he also asked to receive a haircut from Mr. Deeds, and found out that while Mr. Deeds excelled at many tasks, he made a pretty bad barber. He was great at laundry, though. Dr. Mirth was eventually removed from 662 duty by the O5 Council, once it became clear his research had just become an excuse for Mr. Deeds to do errands and chores for him. Of course, Mr. Deeds had no complaints either way. Whether it's serving up delicious tea, cleaning a certain selfish researcher's home, or murdering a D-Class personnel with a buck knife, one thing cannot be denied. Mr. Deeds is one hell of a butler. Please, good sir, I beseech you, as a man of science, nay, as a man of reason, you mustn't stifle my research at this critical juncture. You have no idea how close I am to finding a cure for this blasted pestilence. I need only a handful of live subjects to complete my research. The Plague Doctor's emphatic pleas fell on deaf ears, as a stone-faced researcher took notes on his latest pontifications. The Doctor, whom these clods had reduced so rudely to a mere number, SCP-049, banged his gloved fist up against the wall. And to think he once thought of these men as intellectual equals, fellow travelers on the road to scientific enlightenment. What a positively sick joke. Before the doctor got another chance to appeal for his right to experiment, the researcher left him alone once more. A truly sad state of affairs. Nobody appreciated a true scientist in this day and age. It was sure to be another day of languishing alone in this cell, wishing he had the capacity to do more. So he was surprised as anyone when the alarm started going off, and the door of his cell swung open automatically. The Plague Doctor stepped out of his cell and into the hall, where many other humanoid anomalies were roaming, confused as to why they'd been suddenly released, what was happening. As it turned out, what was happening was one of the most brutal chaos insurgency raids the staff of Site-19 had ever seen. It had been planned immaculately. You see, guards rotate semi-regularly at Site-19 due to the high-pressure nature of the job. Lots of deaths and mental breakdowns, as you probably correctly predicted. Even the administrative staff of the SCP Foundation are only human. Well, mostly anyway. So they're not immune to little oversights here and there. And it's in those oversights that expertly trained Chaos Insurgency infiltration agents make their living. No less than 15 of them had been working undercover in Site-19 for just over two weeks, and they did a fine job of lowering the metaphorical drawbridge for a heavily armed invasion force. The guards who weren't plants were quickly murdered by the infiltrators, and even some of the on-site task forces were quickly overwhelmed and gunned down by the high-precision rifles of the Chaos Insurgency's finest. While the frontliners were distracted by the sudden assault, the infiltrators found their way to the site's security control room and massacred everyone inside. Opening every single door in the site was as simple as putting in a few stolen key codes and flipping a few carefully remembered switches. Consequently, while Foundation agents and Chaos Insurgency mercenaries clashed sabers, high-priority anomalies like SCP-049 simply wandered the facility, watching the calamity unfold within. The Foundation was beset on all sides, shot at by heavily armed maniacs, and attacked from within by the numerous roaming anomalous entities that were eager to get their hands on Foundation personnel. Definitely not an ideal situation, to say the least. The Plague Doctor only had one thing on his mind, though. 
Hmm. This definitely won't do my research any good. Unless I can escape and find my way to a suitable laboratory. Oh, now there's an idea. But his scientific fantasies were soon interrupted by a Chaos Insurgency soldier swinging the butt of his M4 carbine into his avian exoskull with a supremely unpleasant crack. The doctor was dazed by it momentarily, the pain coming at him like a thunderclap, but the insurgent never got the chance to take another swing. Before the insurgent could do anything, the plague doctor lunged out with practice speed, grasping him by the throat. Immediately everything went black, and the insurgent's limp corpse collapsed to the ground. Serves him right, the doctor internally mused. Soldiers attacking medics is violating even the most basic rules of gentlemanly warfare. Then another flash of immense pain, as a different rifle butt collided with the back of his head. The doctor fell to one knee, feeling dizzy, but before he could retaliate, he felt the two sharp prongs of a cattle prod pressing up against his neck. The sudden rush of electricity surged through his neck, sending his muscles into a wave of involuntary spasms. The insurgents crowding around him chimed in with their own agonizing cattle prods, relentlessly shocking him until the flashes of white-hot pain soon became an oppressive blanket of total dark. Even on his most cantankerous days, the SCP Foundation had never treated him like this. When he eventually came to, he was still in darkness, standing upright, with high-tech shackles holding every limb in place. It was beyond uncomfortable for the poor plague doctor, but it succeeded in the task of keeping him under control. He couldn't move an inch. There were muffled voices beyond the dark, beyond the confines of this new containment, the modulated gas mask voices of insurgents and something else. Faintly accented, oddly familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. Soon the voices were replaced by another sound, the grinding of crowbars levering nails out of cheap wood. With a creaking tumble, a rectangle of bright light opened up in front of him, populated by a number of silhouettes. On either side were Chaos insurgents in familiar tactical garb, and in between them stood a tall, well-groomed man with an expensive-looking purple smoking jacket and a pencil mustache. For a few fractions of a second, his face was a portrait of excitement. But as he took in the sight of the plague doctor standing before him, all the joy drained from his snooty countenance. What the hell am I looking at here? The man in the smoking jacket said. The doctor, indignant at such a response from the man who'd presumably ordered his assault, rasped, A man of science, good sir. The man in the smoking jacket ignored him and continued to berate the chaos insurgents with an odd level of confidence for someone reprimanding trained, cold-blooded killers. I wanted SCP-650, the startling statue, not this clownish Ren Faire cosplayer! What the hell did I pay you ruffians for? I was told you chaos insurgents were the very best at this, and for your hefty price, I expect excellence! The rant continued much like this, leaving everyone in attendance, the insurgents, the plague doctor, feeling thoroughly exhausted by him and unable to do anything about it. You see, this wasn't just any Chaos Insurgency client, your average tin pot dictator or arms dealer. You know the type. This was the one and only Pascal Leggett, one of the most famous or rather infamous Anart collectors in the game. He'd been a founding person of interest for years due to his dealings with the Chaos Insurgency and Marshall Carter and Dark Limited, all to the end of expanding his Anart collection, but his vast wealth and connections had always shielded him from Foundation probes. For those unfamiliar with the subculture, Anart, short for Anomalous Art, is exactly what it sounds like. Artistic projects with anomalous properties to give it that extra kick. One of the most popular groups of interest dealing in Anart is the iconic Are We Cool Yet? which, incidentally, had recently excommunicated Pascal Leggett for being an exceedingly wealthy, uptight square who really didn't represent the Collective's rebellious ethos. And considering his response was to pay the Chaos Insurgency to raid Site-19 for a few pieces for his own private collection, costing him millions of dollars and both groups' many lives, it was safe to say he wasn't taking it well. Look, we got you that other statue and that thing killed four of our best guys, so how about we just call it even? said one of the insurgents. I'm sure you can have fun with bird brain here too. Pascal tutted and reluctantly dismissed the hired guns. Having the plague doctor here definitely wasn't ideal, especially considering he wanted to host the ultimate Anart exhibition to put Are We Cool Yet Worthless Somme Nous Devernus Magnifique to shame. 
but he would make do with what he had. Perhaps he could say that 049 was a commentary on the ever-present nature of disease in mankind's life and our forever archaic approach to it. Yes, yes, that would do nicely. Needless to say, the Plague Doctor was infuriated by all this. The violence against his person, the kidnapping, the disrespect, and most of all, the interruption to his precious research, especially considering how close he'd gotten to finding a cure for the pestilence. But instead, he was soon spirited by a legion of heavily armed goons from his wooden box to a glass one in one of Leggett's many opulent hallways. There were other glass cases on either side of him, and more on the other side of the hall, all too reinforced for the Plague Doctor to even smash through it on his own. Damn it. Leggett's own private anarch exhibition, probably wedged between his oversized dining room and his jewel-encrusted crapper. Occasionally, Pascal himself would jaunt down the hallway to gaze upon his new stolen anarch pieces, and of course the Plague Doctor would try his best to reason with him. I am a patient man, Monsieur Leggett, but this is simply barbaric. By what right do you imprison me here? Is your intention to deprive the world, the entire human race, of my valuable medical breakthroughs? Could you live with that on your conscience, good sir?" There was never any meaningful response. The Plague Doctor soon learned that Pascal Leggett didn't like his art interactive. It was simply meant to languish away in a glass box, being watched, being passively looked at. Those Chaos Insurgency louts hadn't even bothered to bring his notebook or medical bag, so he was without the tools to even perform his experiments. As loathed as he was to admit it, this was even worse than being locked up by the SCP Foundation. But all this wasn't entirely unfamiliar. There was something in the glass box across from the Plague Doctor that he vaguely recognized back from Site-19. He'd never seen it up close, but he'd heard researchers speaking about it, and even seen a few pictures. And such a strange construction it was. A peculiar, haphazard sculpture made from concrete, rebar, and spray paint. Quite ugly, in this humble doctor's opinion, but there was something oddly entrancing about it. And for reasons beyond the doctor's recollection, four of Leggett's men stood around the glass box in where it was being stored, always watching. The men were frequently switched in and out, as though they were watching in shifts, always fixing their gaze on its peculiar, malformed body. Maybe it was all the electrical shocks and knocks to the head, but he just couldn't remember why Pascal was having the piece so carefully observed. But he knew on some primal level that the secret to this would perhaps be the key to his own escape, if only he could remember. Still time passed. Pascal drifted in and out, sometimes with guests. The Plague Doctor had learned not to speak. These animals could not be reasoned with. As a scientist, he would instead carefully observe until his observations bore fruit. He noticed that Pascal's guests, all people who looked equally as wealthy and pompous as Pascal himself, all seemed to look right over him, and instead focus on the ugly statue across the hall, still forever observed by any four of Pascal's men. Some of them looked actively nervous, just being in its presence. Curious, the Plague Doctor made a mental note of this, just as he did when Pascal gave his guests a reassuring pat on the shoulder and told them, Please calm yourself. It's harmless while my personnel are keeping an eye on it. Little by little, the Plague Doctor's memories of his infamous neighbor had begun to return. He knew what he must do to escape. Now all he needed to do was wait for the perfect moment. Soon enough, Pascal's mansion was filled with a bevy of Anarch snobs from hither and yarn, a private soiree to show off his new collection. They wandered the halls in three-piece tuxedos and designer ballroom dresses, sipping champagne from imported crystal. All such lovely, refined, high-society people. And if the good doctor's plan went off, as he intended, they would all be such lovely, refined, high-society corpses. The Plague Doctor waited until, mercifully, he and the four members of personnel watching the sculpture were the only ones left in the hallway. He'd been so good, so patient, that none of the men guarding the sculpture at present had ever heard him make a noise. He was so invisible to them that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't even notice he could make a sound. And that worked for his purposes just fine. Though in any case, if he wanted this to work, he would need to time his plan perfectly. Even a fraction of a second out of place and the whole thing would have dire consequences. Still, the doctor was still a Frenchman at heart. And as a Frenchman, he knew he would rather die nobly in the process of escape 
than remain captured by this worthless buffoon. He'd be sure to take as many of these men down with him in the process as he was able. The plague doctor exhaled deeply, drawing a lung full of air, then bellowed as loud as he possibly could. The sudden, unexpected noise was so shocking that it jogged the four watchers almost reflexively to turn and look at him. And in the split second that they did, the plague doctor closed his eyes. In the dark, time seemed to move slower. Perhaps due to the doctor's keen focus, cultivated over many a century, he listened carefully to the sequence of sounds, glass shattering, four choked gasps in sequence, four brutal crunches, then nanoseconds later, more glass shattering. The plague doctor's eyes snapped open just in time. Just as predicted, the sculpture, being entirely unobserved, had smashed through its glass case, murdering all four members of personnel by snapping their necks, and then smashed through his own glass case to do the same to him. The plague doctor had cut it so close, in fact, that he opened his eyes to the face of the sculpture staring into his own, its concrete limbs wrapped around his neck. Very good timing indeed. With a sigh of relief, the plague doctor slipped out of the sculpture's concrete grasp and back down the hallway, keeping his gaze fixed on the sculpture the entire time. He'd heard it decimate Pascal's men. He certainly didn't fancy undergoing the same fate. The second the plague doctor backed around the corner, rendering the sculpture, or as the SCP Foundation called it, SCP-173 out of sight, he could hear terrified screaming coming from the other end of the hall. He was not a sadistic man, but the plague doctor would be lying if he told you he didn't take just a little bit of pleasure in hearing that sound. Somewhere else in the vast mansion of Pascal Leggett, the sculpture was slaughtering its way through servants and party guests, while the plague doctor searched for some kind of exit. Anyone who dared get in his way was given a swift and merciless touch of death, sending their body unceremoniously to the ground. Anyone in his way was preventing him from finding a cure for the pestilence, and thus endangering countless lives. It was, of course, regrettable to have to kill anyone, but some sacrifices must be made for the greater good of mankind. Well, it's not necessarily always regrettable, per se. On his way out while the murderous rampage of SCP-173 seemed to distract anyone of note, the Plague Doctor just so happened to encounter a fleeing Pascal Leggett, hoping to find some kind of escape himself. It seemed that now fate was on his side once more. To have his jailer right here in the palm of his hand would be such a perfect parting gift. Funnily enough, Pascal was far more talkative to him now. He rattled off a rapid-fire series of threats, bribes, and pleas, claiming in the end that he never meant any harm. He was the one who freed the Plague Doctor from the SCP Foundation. They were on the same side here. All this was for the art. No offense was ever intended. Pascal Leggett simply lived for art. Then die for it, good sir, the Plague Doctor said. And with a single touch, Pascal's eyes rolled up into the back of his head, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was one of the few non-scientific deaths that he felt truly no guilt for. After some time searching, the screams around the rest of the mansion eventually went silent. That did wonders for his focus. It didn't take long for the Plague Doctor to locate an exit, a fine mahogany door with elaborate adornments befitting a man as gaudy as Pascal and began strolling towards it, his chest swollen with pride and a sense of accomplishment. Then he blinked, and a few feet in front of him stood the sculpture. It was there so suddenly that the plague doctor fell backwards in shock, but he devoted everything to keeping an eye on that monstrosity. With everyone else in the mansion presumably dead at this point, it had now come back for him. It stood there staring silently, ready to exact the terrible price for freeing it as soon as the doctor dared to blink. The Plague Doctor began crawling backwards down the hall, just wanting to put some distance between himself and the sculpture. As the seconds passed, he could feel his eyes drying out until the inevitable blink. The sculpture was standing right in front of him now, gazing down, almost mocking. It had closed the distance so quickly. If the Plague Doctor blinked again, he was sure that his eyes would never open again. All it had to do was wait as the seconds passed, and the Doctor began to feel his eyes drying up again. That subtle sting quickly grew into a nagging pain that could not be denied. Sooner or later, he was going to have to. Bang! The front door flew open, and in an instant the hallway was filled with heavily armed troops, all wearing the familiar black and gray of the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor had never been so relieved to see the organization that had kept him locked up for so many decades. 
for once they'd saved him from something even worse. Of course, the sculpture didn't say anything, but the disappointment of losing that one more victim seemed to radiate off of it like a lingering bad smell. The Plague Doctor willingly gave himself up, and heavy machinery was brought in to pick up SCP-173, with the help of the iPods to make sure it didn't try any funny business in transit. Pascal had gotten away with his shady dealings for years, but the brazen attack he funded against Site-19 was now enough for the Foundation to track him down. When his corpse was found in the halls of his own home with no obvious cause of death, we can happily tell you that nobody was disappointed. By the evening, the Plague Doctor was happy to be back in his cell. His research could continue here, and in time he knew that the personnel of the SCP Foundation would listen to reason and comply with his demands. After all, science marches on, regardless of who chooses to march with it. But he would forever feel a little nervous in Site-19 after that, knowing the concrete monster he was sharing the building with. He hoped that if ever there was another containment breach involving that thing, that it didn't feel like paying him a visit for old time's sake. A swarm of bloodthirsty entities waits outside the protective boundary that surrounds the solar system. They surge through the vacuum of space looking for vulnerabilities in the force field that protects us from their destructive powers. The creatures ran themselves against the barrier again and again, trying to break through. Upon impact, the force field shimmers a golden color and displays a series of thaumaturgical symbols, but it holds. Suddenly, something flies through the protective shield from inside the solar system. It leaves a hole. Two creatures enter our solar system before the shield closes. This may be the end for humanity. The sixth overseer sits at a computer terminal massaging the bridge of his nose. He has just logged into the Foundation database to gather information on an anomaly whose intentions are still unknown. The O5 Council wants him to vote on an extreme measure, but he requires more information first. There is something coming, he can feel it, and he thinks it has something to do with SCP-1548. O5-6 straightens his back and sits up in his chair. He logs back into the Foundation database and brings up the entry for SCP-1548. He knows that this SCP has been connected to some odd occurrences recently, but what are its true intentions? Is SCP-1548 trying to help save the universe, or is it a malicious entity hell-bent on destroying it? O5-6 must find out. He scrolls through the first few entries. SCP-1548 itself is a series of solar phenomena that occur at the south pole of the sun. During these events, the sun's plasma morphs into different thaumaturgical symbols. Each symbol is tens of thousands of miles across. The symbols themselves have not all been classified by the Foundation yet, but there are three that have been observed multiple times. The first is an unnamed symbol that, when inscribed on a telescopic device by a person with thaumaturgical abilities, can identify psionic entities with malicious intents. The second symbol is known as the Calfastian Isle, which when displayed on a material, strengthens it immensely and gives it the ability to absorb kinetic and electromagnetic energy. The final symbol is the Twelve Holy Owls of Cerinthium. When this symbol is affixed to an object, any entity that is killed by it will immediately annihilate and take everything in its radius with it. O5-6 jots a note on the pad of paper sitting on his desk. He has seen some of these symbols before. They are connected to the Ortuthan mythology. The practitioners of this religion are known as the Church of the Second Hytoth and are a mix of human and alien entities whose main purpose is to aid the guardian deity of the universe, Rakmu Liosen, in combating any threat that may try to wipe out this existence. There must be a connection between the Church of the Second Hytoth and SCP-1548, O5-6 thinks. He scrolls back through the SCP-1548 file to the entry logged on May 17, 1983, the first time an event connected to SCP-1548 was recorded. A probe picked up the manifestation of thaumaturgic symbols on the south pole of the sun. It was odd, but nothing other than the manifestation of the symbols seemed to occur. This event was recorded as Extra Normal Event 9008 and logged into the SCP database. The event was all but forgotten until December 23, 2016, when the activity of SCP-1548 really began to pick up. 
On that day, SCP-1548 began manifesting protection symbols in rapid succession. Over the next few months, a dense cloud of ionized gas formed around the solar system. This ionized wall of radiation surrounded the heliopause, the boundary where the sun's radiation gives way to the vacuum of space. Over time, this cloud became thicker, until no light from outside of the solar system could enter. Foundation censorship protocols were quickly used to disseminate false data, suggesting that the solar system was passing through a dense cloud of cosmic dust, and that was what was altering the night sky and causing the stars to disappear. But as O5-6 continues to scan the files, he knows what the true cause of this phenomenon is. It must be SCP-1548. But why? Is the anomaly trying to protect us from something outside of our solar system? Or is it trying to trap humanity within, with no means of escape? O5-6 stands up and stretches. Ah, oh, that's enough for today, he says out loud to the empty room. He walks towards the door and reaches for the handle. All of a sudden, sirens start going off and red lights begin to flash. O5-6 spins around and runs back to the computer terminal. An emergency alert begins coming through. The Falcon Light 5 rocket that launched earlier in the day to bring supplies to the International Space Station has spontaneously lost 50% of its mass mid-flight. O5-6 frantically begins typing. He brings up videos from surveillance satellites. The overseer watches in horror as pieces of debris and bodies of the crew flow through the silence of space. The rocket looks like it has been cut directly down the middle and half of the structure has vanished from existence. What is happening? Suddenly another alert comes in. All communication has been lost with the International Space Station. Without warning, the space station begins broadcasting a series of cognito hazards. O5-6 quickly changes the channel to stop the signal from transmitting through his computer. Reports start coming in from around the world that anyone who continued listening to the cognito hazard signals began entering trances. Then their brain completely evaporated from their skulls. There is a surge of thaumaturgic particles in orbit around the Earth. O5-6 traces the particles back to their source. They came from SCP-1548. The signal from the ISS stops abruptly. The entire space station changes course. It is on a trajectory to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The friction and heat will rip the space station apart. O5-6 can't believe what is happening. It seems as if SCP-1548 helped humanity in a way by stopping the signals from the ISS. But how can he be sure that SCP-1548 wasn't responsible for the cognito hazards in the first place? He needs more information. O5-6 searches for answers as more anomalies connected to SCP-1548 start occurring around the world. During a political demonstration in Berlin, a thaumaturgic way opens up that leads to a pocket dimension. Soon after, the appearance of the portal, Koru Archpriest Farah Atenas, the leader of the Church of the Second Hightoth, makes an announcement. He claims that the way leads to a shelter, which will protect people from the coming doom of the universe. The people in the area, along with the members of the Church of the Second Hightoth, make their way into the portal. Two undercover Foundation agents follow the group. After everyone has entered, the way immediately closes, and there is no further contact. What does the Church of the Second Hightoth know that we don't? O5-6 wonders. He continues monitoring the situation and looking for answers. Suddenly a message comes through all Foundation channels. It is coming from the Sun. It is not SCP-1548. Instead, it is SCP-179, the humanoid permanently in space near the Sun. 179 sends out one clear word in its signal. Defend. Who is SCP-179 talking to? O5-6 thinks. What needs to be defended? Is it humanity? Our solar system? The universe? Another alarm begins to go off. What now? O5-6 screams. He brings up the alert. The screen flashes to the moon. O5-6 focuses in on where the alert is coming from. It is a foundation base called Area 32. What remains left of the base is reporting that SCP-2821 suddenly expanded in size, formed a wormhole that led to another region of the universe, and then vanished through it, taking 38 Foundation members and 10 anomalies with it. Sirens continue to go off. Distress signals are being picked up on every channel. It seems as if the world is coming to an end, and everything that is happening is somehow connected to SCP-1548. A static-filled transmission begins coming in from SCP-3417. 
The words are urgent. All our Tuthans here. All our Tuthans must listen now. The stars are lost. Static breaks up the transmission for a few moments before it resumes. Ago the first invasion occurred. The gods were unprepared, never comprehending the fragility of the universe after its creation. The worlds must fight. The transmission cuts off. Everything goes silent. A pulsating SCP icon appears on the screen of 05-6's computer. It is the part of the puzzle he has been waiting for. In 1999, the O5 Council unanimously voted to launch a mission called Seraph-1 to explore beyond the heliosphere. And the mission's true purpose was to explore the plausibility of extraterrestrial SCP objects in space. The message that O5-6 just received is from Seraph-1. It is relaying information back to Earth. The video shows the barrier of ionized radiation that SCP-1548 had created glowing orange at the border of the heliopause. The radioactive wall seems to be made up of complex geometric patterns around 6,000 miles across. Seraph-1 accelerates towards the barrier. It smashes through the protective shell. The probe has entered interstellar space. O5-6 knows that everything he is seeing is on a delay as the information being sent back by Seraph-1 needs to travel vast distances, and it takes significant time for signals to reach Earth. After passing through the ionized barrier, the connection to Seraph-1 is lost. Over the next few days, O5-6 tries to link the anomalies happening in the solar system to SCP-1548. The Foundation still hasn't concluded if 1548 is harmful or trying to protect the solar system in some way. Then a message comes in from Seraph-1. It has briefly regained communication with the Foundation. Most of the probe's instruments have been destroyed, but its rear-facing camera is still broadcasting. O5-6 pulls up the feed. He stares at the screen in horror as the images unfold before him. The camera captures swarms of unknown entities surrounding the heliopause. The bodies of the entities are asymmetrical with countless appendages and unknown structures jutting out from their cores. They seem to range in size from 10 kilometers to 10,000 kilometers across. Although some seem so large that their size can only be hypothesized. The swarms crash into the protective barrier that SCP-1548 has created around the solar system. Each time part of the swarm rams the barrier, thousands of thaumaturgic symbols and solar flares appear at the point of impact. Two entities that are later classified as 1548 Omega-1 and 1548 Omega-2 are captured entering the solar system by Seraph-1's camera. Video from Seraph-1 shows that as the probe exited through the protective barrier, it created a hole that remained open for a few moments. During the time that the shield of ionized radiation was vulnerable, 1548-Omega-1 and 1548-Omega-2 entered through it. They are now inside the solar system. SCP-1548 launches countermeasures in the form of glowing red sigils that create shockwaves to slow down Omega-1 and Omega-2. Omega-1 is shaped like an eel with five contorted arms radiating from its body and a mouth made of impossible geometric shapes. Omega-2 has a tetrahedral structure that leaves a trail of black rocks in its wake. As the two entities move towards the sun, SCP-1548 becomes more active. It closes the hole in the barrier before any other creatures of the swarm can enter and then launches hundreds of concentrated blasts of thalmic energy at Omega-2. The flares vaporize the entity in seconds. The last thing the video feed of Seraph-1 captures before it cuts out is Omega-1 disappearing from view as it creeps towards the center of the solar system. It has escaped the protective measures of SCP-1548. After the O5 Council reviews the footage, they decide to deploy the SCPS Cortana to intercept Omega-1. The orbital vessel is fully equipped with experimental anomalous weapons and propulsion systems. The Council is sure that the Cortana will be able to destroy Omega-1. Data coming in from other satellites indicate that Omega-1 has destroyed Pluto and other Kuiper Belt objects. It is slowly making its way to the center of the solar system, annihilating everything in its path. The Cortana intercepts Omega-1 near Jupiter and engages the creature. After 10 minutes of battling, communication with the ship is lost. Probes in the area capture footage of the Cortana and Omega-1 in mid-battle when they are suddenly surrounded by a black substance and both vanish from sight. O5-6 and the other council members watch in anticipation 
unsure of what has just happened. Then the black substance dissipates. The SCPS Cortana sits motionless in space. The entity is nowhere to be seen. A cheer erupts from the overseers and foundation members in the room. It seems the entity has been defeated. Then, without warning, the Cortana accelerates rapidly. It is on a collision course with Mars. As the ship hurtles past one of the probes in the asteroid belt, the Foundation members see an organic mass resembling that of Omega-1 attached to the hull of the ship. The Overseer Council watches in horror as the SCPS Cortana smashes into the Red Planet, leaving a crater 250 miles wide. The energy released from the impact instantly ionizes the thin atmosphere of Mars, causing the surface to turn into molten rock. From the epicenter of the impact crater, a black organic mass begins to crawl across the planet. The overseers are frozen in fear, but SCP-1548 immediately deals with the entity that is devouring the surface of Mars. From the sun comes the largest SCP-1548 instance ever recorded. A solar flare is jettisoned towards Mars. The impact causes a fusion reaction so intense that for a moment, Mars shines as brightly as the sun. The planet explodes. Its debris is cast across the solar system. Over time, it will create a second asteroid belt in the orbit that Mars once inhabited. The Overseer Council is now convinced that the threat has been dealt with. SCP-1548 is holding the swarm at bay outside of the solar system, at least for the moment. O5-6 returns to his office. He brings up the file on SCP-1548. He is still unsure of this SCP's true intentions. It seems to be protecting humanity, but why? O5-6 sits back in his chair and scrolls to the end of the file. There is an update to the file by O5-3, something that wasn't there before. O5-6 opens the new entry and reads the caption, All that's left of our infinite, ever-expanding universe. O5-6 scrolls down. The image is a picture taken by Seraph-1 before contact was lost forever. It is a picture of all that remains of the universe. There are two dots of light, and nothing else but blackness. The swarm has destroyed everything in the universe, except for those two faraway stars, and our own solar system, which was protected by SCP-1548. But how long can it hold out against a universe-destroying force? Only time will tell. It was the year 2000, and seven-year-old Xenia Chow was like a lot of children her age. Bright, but ignored. She had a youthful enthusiasm for knowledge and learning, and with the right encouragement, it was obvious she'd go on to do great things. But her parents were both working two jobs apiece to make ends meet, so outside of school hours, little Xenia spent a lot of her time alone. She learned to cook and clean for herself, since it would often be way past her bedtime when her parents finally got home from work. They communicated largely through sticky notes left for her on the fridge before they left for work in the morning. It would be easy for someone like Xenia to fall through the cracks, her potential wasted, and get forced into the same endless rat race as her parents. And that probably would have happened if her brush with SCP-5094 hadn't changed the course of her life forever. Like a lot of parents who couldn't spend as much time with their children as they'd like, Mr. and Mrs. Chow gave Xenia occasional gifts as a way to try and make up for their absence. Mostly, they gave Xenia new books to add to her growing collection, but their two-bedroom apartment only had so much space for books. A year ago, the family had bought a new desktop computer to share. These days, this would be the answer to a lonely bookworm's prayers, but the internet was still in its infancy back then. Everything changed when her parents bought her a copy of the Miss J's Whiz Kids Schoolhouse CD-ROM. Miss J's Whiz Kids Schoolhouse was never a popular program. Produced by Shoot the Moon Software in 1999, the game sold poorly on the CD-ROM market for five years until the company filed for bankruptcy in 2004, but that didn't matter to Xenia. As far as she was concerned, receiving a copy of Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse was nothing short of a miracle, and she was far more right than she knew. She didn't have just any piece of primitive educational software on her hands. Xenia Chow was playing with magic. After the software loaded, a cheerful figure appeared on Xenia's monitor. This was Miss J. 
a stylized 2D teacher in a low-res but colorful 3D classroom. What can you learn from Miss J? Well, pretty much anything. And Xenia, as a lonely kid without many friends, had all the time in the world. She spent days on end learning from Miss J, and soon Xenia went from a bright child to a bona fide child genius. Her largely absent parents barely even noticed when their child started demonstrating an advanced knowledge of mechanical engineering and a newfound fluency in Swahili. And not only did Miss J, now known to Xenia as Miss Joyce, teach her students with supernatural effectiveness, she also seemed almost like she was alive. She was a warm, calm, encouraging figure who took a genuine, personal enthusiasm in the education and happiness of her students, more than many real teachers even. But sadly, not all good things last forever. When Xenia turned 12, her family bought a new computer, and the old Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse CD-ROM was no longer compatible with the new operating system. The disc gathered dust in the closet while Xenia passed through high school and then got into a prestigious college. She received her PhD several years earlier than expected and showed such promise in her scientific field that a certain organization took notice. You guessed it, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation is only interested in adding the best and brightest to their ranks, and thanks to the tutoring from Miss J, Xenia Chow certainly fit the bill. She was assigned to the role of junior researcher, and little did she know, she was about to run into an old friend in her new line of work. The Foundation first discovered evidence of Miss J's anomalous qualities while researching a series of strange forum posts in 2012. On a thread discussing abandonware, which is software for which official support is no longer available, there were multiple reports of a so-called living character in an old CD-ROM many of them had owned as children. Seeing as the technology to use the CD-ROM was obsolete, Shoot the Moons had reportedly extremely low sales for the title, and nobody on the forum had kept their copy. The Foundation classified this apparent anomaly as neutralized. No problem. That was, until then junior researcher Xenia Chow was briefed on this particular SCP ten years later. She remembered exactly what the forum posters were talking about, and what's more, she still had her old copy at home. The senior Foundation researchers were astounded. An opportunity to study this forgotten anomaly had just fallen into their laps, and it was all thanks to their brilliant new junior researcher. Xenia's superiors ordered her to bring in her copy of the Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse CD-ROM, and then real testing began. And after rigorous examination of the software, it appears by all accounts that Miss J really is the world's greatest teacher. In spite of the fact she's a collection of pixels on a basic CD-ROM program from the tail end of the 90s. What Miss J seemed to specialize in was intensive courses. She had the ability to make students certifiable experts in almost any subject through courses that can last upwards of 30 hours and spread out over just a few days. But this isn't as students become so enraptured in learning that they forget accounting for their most basic needs and experience a decline in process story. Miss J's lesson plans account for regular bathroom, meal, and even recreation breaks for students. Her talents easily account for Xenia Chow's remarkable academic success, the same success that got her picked up by the SCP Foundation. Naturally, if they had a technology on their hands that could reliably create experts and geniuses with seemingly no negative consequences, the Foundation knew that Miss J and what she had to teach could be immensely valuable in their mission to effectively secure, contain, and protect other anomalies. But we're not talking about the chaos insurgency here. The Foundation would never start to use an anomaly for their own benefit without proper testing. So that's exactly what they did. Their experiments on SCP-5094 began at Site-15, and after ascertaining that Miss J posed no real threat to her students, they recruited a local elementary school to provide human test subjects closer to Miss J's intended demographic. The Foundation found that there were a few constraints between every lesson given by Miss J to one of her students. Before teaching the really mind-blowingly complex stuff, she would always begin with a basic primer on letters, colors, and numbers, 
to make sure she and her students were all on the same page. Another constant was that all her students would refer to her as some variation of Miss J, with examples including the names Miss Julie, Miss Jenny, and Miss Joy. One experiment was performed on Amy Myers, a little girl from the third grade. Her academic record showed she was a bright and eager student, but she was described by her teachers as being especially shy. Amy referred to Miss J as Miss Janie, and asked to be given a lesson on her favorite animal cats. Of course, Miss J gladly obliged, and gave Amy a 15-hour lesson split over the course of two days, which the Foundation closely observed. By the time the lesson was completed, the results were truly astonishing. Amy demonstrated knowledge of feline behavior, diet, and physiology on the level of professional animal behavioral scientists. She became upset when the session ended and the program was switched off having become attached to Miss J. No further anomalous effects were reported. The next subject was a student from the second grade named Devon Williams. Devon had a poor academic record and behavioral issues stemming from several learning disabilities. In the past, teachers had reported Devon having real difficulty engaging with their lessons, and the Foundation wanted to see if Miss J's supernatural teaching abilities fared any better. Devon chose to be educated on the subject of trains, and was given a 15-hour course on the subject spread over two days. Devon had no difficulty engaging with these lessons, and after their conclusion, he displayed a level of knowledge on railway engineering comparable to a graduate-level education on the subject. Devon was so engaged in his lessons that he had to be physically removed from the room once the course had completed because he'd become so attached to his new teacher. The Foundation was feeling extremely optimistic about the prospect of using Miss J to train potential recruits, seeming as she seemed to be able to teach even the most difficult juvenile subjects. However, the Foundation needed to prove that Miss J could be just as effective teaching adults. For the next test, they recruited D-14417, a 24-year-old member of D-Class personnel who described himself as a poor student and tested poorly on pre-screening attentiveness and focus evaluations. He was the perfect candidate for the first adult test of Miss J. To the delight of the Foundation higher-ups, D-14417 excelled. Miss J made him a verifiable expert in law, and he was able to pass a mock bar exam with a grade of 310 after his course. Much like the children, he felt intense sadness once the experiment ended, stating that Miss J was the best teacher he had ever had. He's since been selectively anesthetized, released, and is pursuing a degree in criminal law with his new knowledge. Needless to say, the Foundation was impressed. The last thing they needed to know was who exactly this Miss J truly was. To do this, they'd conduct an interview, and thankfully, they already had someone who had a pre-established rapport with the subject, mm -hmm. Zenya Chow. When Zenya began the interview, Miss J recognized her immediately. She was delighted to see one of her students go on to find such success in her chosen field. Zenya questioned Miss J on what she truly was, and Miss J responded that she honestly wasn't sure. All she knew for sure was that she was passionate about helping lonely children who love to learn embrace their education. That's really all there was to it, and it appears she was telling the truth. Mm. So far, the Foundation has found nothing that hints at a nefarious motivation behind Miss mm. J's actions. It would appear she truly does just want to help children. Xenia, touched by the kindness that this safe class anomaly showed her as a neglected child, and having now seen the positive impact that she had on children like her, thanked Miss J for all she'd done, and left the interview happy that there was an SCP out there who just wanted to change people's lives for the better, and probably all of us would be a little better off if there were more. After all, this was one of the few SCPs who changed a few good people's lives for the better and all of us can probably learn something from the kindness and patience of Miss J. Down in the depths of Facility 23, a group of scientists stand before a massive, rumbling piece of machinery. They all hold their breath as the gigantic mechanism suddenly stops. It's eerily quiet for a moment before a door slides open. The scientists crane their necks to see inside, to see what the result of their great experiment was. These were some of the greatest minds in the SCP Foundation, but nothing could prepare them for what they had created. 
September 9, 2008 was an unseasonably frosty day when Dr. Charles Gears, one of the SCP Foundation's most iconic scientists, parked his Honda Civic outside of what seemed like an innocuous government cold storage warehouse. He sipped his coffee and surveyed the building, which he, along with about a hundred others in total, knew to be Site-19, Facility-23. Why was Dr. Gears, former director of all Euclid-level containment at Site-19, here today? Because official testing was about to begin on SCP-914. The Foundation had acquired the machine now known as SCP-914 some time ago. But only after its recent reclassification to 914 had it been relocated to Facility 23. It must have been important because the entirety of the facility was being repurposed for SCP-914 research. They were dealing with an immensely complicated piece of anomalous technology here, and the same question was on everybody's lips. What exactly does this thing do? Dr. Arthur Hackett, the facility director, had requested the cold, clinical assistance of Dr. Gears in providing the answer. Once he'd finished his morning coffee, Dr. Gears headed inside. The facility's security chief, Agent Alan Sedna, had been beefing up security at the building, and at least two mobile task force units were already on call in case anything happened. The first day of official testing is always a crapshoot. You might get a nice drink out of it, like with SCP-294, or you may get an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. You never really know. All Dr. Gears knew as he walked up the granite steps to the main entrance, was that he was already feeling exhausted. When you've dealt with anomalous objects and entities for decades on end, the sense of wonder and mystery begins to wear off, only to be replaced with a kind of tedium any office worker knows all too well. Everyone knew that Dr. Gears was devoted to the job, perhaps more than anyone else, but he approached the job with an emotionless effect. You wouldn't know from looking at him if he was thinking about the deadly anomalous creature in the next room, or what he was going to have for lunch that day. The doctor passed through security and was briefed in the break room by Dr. Lucius Veritas, director of research at Site-19. He explained that the machine seemed to work in the absence of any power source. Its mechanical structure is similar to machinery from the Industrial Revolution, but it's exceedingly complex for something constructed in that time. Foundation analyses into the structure of the 914 machine have shown it to have as many as 8 million moving parts, and that might even be an incomplete estimate. Dr. Gears wore his trademark blank face as he listened, solemnly nodded, and asked to be shown the anomaly. He was led into containment chamber 109B by a pair of guards. According to all current Foundation tests, the machine doesn't appear to pose any active risk of containment breach or danger to the guards, earning it the rare safe designation. As a result, aside from guards stationed on site, containment procedures for 914 were minimal. Whether this designation would need to be changed after testing was something Dr. Gears would soon find out. SCP-914 was a truly impressive sight to behold, a giant clockwork mechanism taking up around 18 square feet with an unfathomably complex combination of screwdrives, belts, pulleys, springs, and gears. A less stoic researcher might see the humor in recruiting a Dr. Gears to test such a device, but comedy definitely wasn't one of Dr. Gears' specialties. He stared at the machine with a detached fascination, analyzing its vital components at a glance. Gears noted a large mainspring beneath a rudimentary selection panel. The panel is copper, with a large selection knob fixed to an arrow above a series of different options. Rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, and very fine. There was also a large key below the selection panel, for the purposes of winding up the mainspring and initiating whatever procedure this machine was designed to enact. Next, Dr. Gears noticed two large booths connected to the machine by a pair of equally large copper tubes. The booth on the left labeled intake and the right labeled output. Incredibly, Dr. Gears was able to immediately deduce the purpose of this machine. It was designed to enact some kind of transformative process on whatever was placed into the intake booth. But what kind of transformative process? That's exactly what Dr. Gears was here to find out. The experiment was simple. They would gather a series of samples, both inanimate objects and living tissue, and use them to explore the different permutations of the 914 machine's transformative abilities. This initial series of experiments were approved by O5 Command and the Site Director, and with the 47 researchers present in Facility 23 at his disposal, Dr. Gears commenced his research into SCP-914. 
To minimize risk, Dr. Gears decided the first test would be a simple kilogram of steel. On his orders, the steel was placed into the intake booth. With the doctor's approval, a junior researcher set the control panel setting to rough and began twisting the main spring key, at which point the booth's doors closed and a small bell inside chimed. The machine began to rumble, its eight million working pieces churning into life. It continued like this for around 10 minutes before falling silent, at which point the output booth opened. What had once been a single lump of steel weighing one kilogram was now an uneven pile of smaller lumps with evidence of laser cutting. Dr. Gears may note of the fact that having lasers within such a machine is both anachronistic and anomalous, and that the rough setting appears to messily cleave the object placed within the intake booth into pieces. Dr. Gears also noted that it would be unwise to test any kind of explosive material on the rough setting, unless, of course, they wanted to destroy the building. The research continued. Dr. Gears used another one kilogram lump of steel to test the one-to-one -one feature. This time, the result was far more peculiar. The output booth contained the exact same weight in steel screws. This result was sparking even greater connections in Dr. Gears' impressive analytical mind. Firstly, the one-to-one -one feature caused the 914 machine to transform the output into something different from, but similar to, the intake. And while this would require further testing, it appeared that the 914 machine, despite being anomalous, does still follow the laws of physics. Samples passed through the machine conserve their mass and would not be transmuted on an atomic level from one element to another. Next, Dr. Gears pushed another lump of steel through the machine on the fine setting. The result this time was a kilogram of steel carpet tacks. From this, Dr. Gears was able to ascertain that the fine feature improves the samples placed within the intake booth somewhat. However, things got even stranger when Gears performed the same experiment on the very fine setting. The output booth provided several unknown gases and a lump of unknown metal with anomalous qualities. Namely, it was resistant to heat up to 50,000 degrees, impossible to bend or break with any force, and was a perfect conductor of electricity. Dr. Gears suddenly realized his task here may be more interesting than he'd initially imagined. Was that a bit of a smile on his face that one researcher spotted? Surely not. This was the famous unflappable Dr. Gears, after all. The doctor decided to take it up a notch and began to test more complex items in the 914 machine. He removed his own wristwatch and placed it into the input booth before setting the machine to course and letting her rip. Literally, in this case. When the output booth was opened, the watch had been painstakingly disassembled into its component parts, with no damage to said parts. Dr. Gears noted the coarse feature as a more mild version of the rough, in the sense that it was able to take an object apart without any kind of fundamental damage. He also made note of the fact he'd need to get himself a new watch. Dr. Gears then asked one of the researchers to surrender their cell phone for testing. While none were excited at the prospect of their phone getting eviscerated by a clockwork behemoth, one of the researchers eventually surrendered their BlackBerry curve to the doctor. He placed it into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting, and 10 minutes later, the output booth released a brand new Apple iPhone. Sadly for the researcher who donated his BlackBerry, he wasn't allowed to keep the new device. Naturally, Dr. Gears was interested in trying out the anomalous, very fine setting on a more complex object. Seeing as no other researchers were eager to hand over their personal effects, he took a Colt Python revolver from a member of security and ran that through the machine on very fine. The result was an extremely powerful energy weapon containing gamma radiation, which fired a beam capable of disintegrating anything in its path. While the weapon's power was immense, it was also too dangerous and unstable to be added to the Foundation's armory for general use. Having collected a wealth of data from more complex objects, Dr. Gears was eager to move to the next stage, live test subjects. While his fellow researchers had some reservations, the experiments pushed on, beginning with mice. A single white mouse was put into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting and the machine was activated. The result five minutes later was an almost identical creature, save for the fact that it now had brown fur. Encouraged by the fact that the mouse survived the refinery process, Dr. Gears next applied for the use of two chimps in his SCP-914 experiments. The first chimp was run through the machine on the fine setting. The result was a chimp of human-level intelligence, who has since begun working for the Foundation under the alias Dr. Bobo. 
and the data from this test has been expunged from the official reports to protect Dr. Bobo's privacy. The second primate test, this time on Ruff, was not quite as positive. The chimp was dismembered, with the mutilated corpse showing evidence of cutting from high heat and crushing. Of course, everyone knew where these tests were eventually going. Dr. Gears requested two members of D-Class personnel for testing. The first was a 42-year-old Caucasian male weighing 108 kilograms and standing 185 centimeters tall. Dr. Gears ran him through SCP-914 on the one-to-one -one setting, resulting in a slightly taller Hispanic man with a slightly lower body weight. He immediately became severely confused and agitated and attempted to attack the guards present, leading to his unfortunate termination by Foundation staff. It was on the final live test that tragedy truly struck. A 28-year-old Caucasian male was run through the machine on the highly anomalous, very fine setting. The result was an utterly nightmarish creature. So horrifying that the majority of the details on its physical appearance have been expunged from the report. The creature made a sudden escape, breaching the relatively minor containment procedures intended for the inert SCP-914. This highly dangerous creature killed eight guards, as well as two senior researchers upon emerging from the output booth. A special response team was dispatched to take the creature down, but that proved harder than expected. SCP-914 had massively improved upon the human original, especially when it came to its killing ability. Eventually, it was captured, but the special response team suffered injuries and memory loss as a result of the creature's anomalous powers. The creature was also severely wounded, and its blood caused corrosive damage to the plumbing in Facility 23. The creature expired from its injuries several hours later, turning into a cloud of blue ash that blinded a nearby research team. Dr. Gears would later comment that the experiments were ultimately still a success, in spite of some minor hiccups. Testing on the device continues to this day in an effort to understand the full potential of the machine. Though, for obvious reasons, biological testing on the machine has since been forbidden without direct authorization from O5 Command. After all, if an already dangerous SCP was ever subjected to the very fine transformation setting, we could be dealing with something beyond our greatest nightmares. It's an unusually calm moment in the SCP Foundation. No one is in the hall besides a scientist and a young female subject. There are no tests going on, just observation. The scientist calmly asks her questions as he escorts her down the hallway, hoping to get more insight into her unique abilities. So why does she look so utterly terrified? As the scientist tries to get her attention, the young woman becomes more preoccupied, staring nervously around the hallway. Does she fear the scientist? Why does she keep muttering strange phrases that don't make any sense? How did it break through such a heavy door? That door is nearly a foot thick. How did it manage to destroy it? The scientist is looking at his notes and tries to make sense of the young woman's statements when he notices something terrible. She's staring at one of the doors containing another, highly dangerous SCP in top-of-the-line restraints, but it's safely locked away, right? The scientist swears he can hear the sound of scratching behind the steel door. It was 17 hours later when the dangerous SCP broke out of its containment cell and could have laid waste to the entire SCP containment facility if it wasn't for the heavily armed response team waiting outside to contain it and return it to its cell. The huge loss of life was only avoided because the SCP Foundation had advanced warning, all thanks to the greatest secret weapon the Foundation has ever seen, SCP-187. But the Foundation's most powerful defense against dangerous SCPs is probably its most unlikely, a completely normal-looking young woman in her early 20s, whose only distinguishing characteristic is how thin and haunted she looks. Despite being no danger to anyone in the Foundation, She's one of the most carefully guarded SCPs in the facility, to protect her from herself. SCP-187 is one of the most powerful precognitives ever found, but her abilities are a danger to her own mind. This average-looking girl has a unique telepathic ability where she can see into the future of whatever she's looking at, seeing it simultaneously in two frames of existence. She sees it as it is now, as well as what it will look like in the future. Say, for instance, she's looking at a baby tiger cub. Aw, cute. At the same time, she also sees the massive, fearsome jungle beast it'll become. She won't see minor changes to its state, so she won't be able to tell you how your next haircut will look. 
But if something drastic is about to happen to someone or something, she'll be able to predict it with perfect accuracy. There's only one problem. She can't turn it off. This involuntary ability goes off whenever she sees someone or something that's about to undergo a major change in its status. This means that at any time, she can be bombarded with horrible visuals, and that even includes food. Ever since her abilities kicked in, SCP-187 has been unable to eat normally because whatever she eats or drinks, she sees it in its future state. When she looks at a glass of water, she'll see it as a liquid, but a little more yellow than it usually is. As for solid food, she'll see it as what it comes out as after it's been digested. Not exactly appetizing, so for a while it looked like she was likely to starve herself to death in the Foundation's custody. Fortunately, the administration scientists were able to find some workarounds around her ability. Feeding and hydrating her intravenously was an option, but further study of her abilities made clear that her power was processed through her eyes. That means that when she's blindfolded, she's able to eat without her precognition kicking in. Being assigned to the detail for SCP-187 is very different from most SCP details. If you're assigned to SCP-682, you're constantly worried that the horrible carnivorous beast with a hatred for all things human is going to get loose and tear you to shreds. Not so much with SCP-187. This duty is more like a medical team, where the patient is highly valuable to the institution and can't be allowed to get free or to harm themselves in any way. The Foundation has taken the highest precautions to ensure SCP-187 is safe, including a set of medical restraints that she's strapped into, except when out of her cell or participating in tests. Even when given more freedom, her hands are always in soft mittens, to keep her from trying to damage her own eyes as a way to neutralize her powers. Her team blindfolds her before every mealtime and feeds her with some mild sedatives added to her food to keep her calm. Through consistent care, she's starting to recover from her self-induced starvation. The personnel chosen for this assignment are carefully screened before being sent in to interact with her. They need to be the most responsible and detail-oriented members of the staff, who won't miss a thing when it comes to her care routine. Just because 187 is harmless doesn't mean she can't move fast, and one misstep could cost the Foundation their most valuable asset. And unlike most SCPs, 187 is rarely handled by D-Class personnel. They don't have access to higher security specimens, and they don't have the training due to their short tenure. But there's another reason the Foundation keeps 187 away from the lowest men on the totem pole. D-Class personnel are frequently used to test out dangerous SCPs, and are lucky if they get to end their service intact. When she was exposed to some D-Class personnel early in her stay, she saw them as horribly bloated, with holes in their heads, or missing half their body. Those unfortunate personnel soon met horrible fates, sucked out into the vacuum of space, shot while trying to escape, and bitten in half by an escaping anomalous creature. Additionally, while most D-Class personnel are amnesticized after their service, some are terminated for breaking protocol or trying to escape. SCP-187 would see any of these unfortunate personnel walking around as the corpses they'd wind up as. The Foundation wants to learn the full extent of her powers, though, and this means tests. Lots of tests. When she first came into the Foundation's care, they were focused on figuring out how her power worked. They gave her IQ tests, and she got every answer right on the written test. Her IQ was measured as being off the charts, at least 300, which would make her the smartest person alive. But her normal behavior didn't seem to match up with this level of superintelligence. Confusing them even more, when she was given a computerized IQ test, she scored slightly below average, with a score of 97. The scientists assigned to her case studied the results and created other tests, until they understood how her precognitive ability works. She can see the future of anything that's physically affected, so when an answer is marked down on a piece of paper, that's a notable change. But when an entry is typed into a computer, the computer remains the same. So her ability wasn't able to help her on the computerized tests. But her abilities could still help the Foundation, especially when it comes to improving security for other anomalies. She had inadvertently prevented the escape of an especially deadly SCP creature by predicting it would break through the door. But how would her powers manifest in more complicated cases? 
Some Foundation researchers postulated that she might be able to see into the future of deadly, indestructible anomalies like SCP-682 and figure out a way to eliminate it. But temporal experts warned this could create a paradox. After all, she would be looking at an elimination protocol that didn't exist until she looked at it. But her powers and how they might help in other ways other than neutralization warranted further exploration. So personnel were assigned, and the SCP-187 experiments began. SCP-162 is a horrible mass of fish hooks, wire, and other sharp implements. It exudes a psychological pull, and any unfortunate person who touches it winds up being pulled in by the barbed objects and absorbed into its mass. SCP-187 was kept at a safe distance and examined it, and was undisturbed. She saw it only as a pile of melted slag, indicating that it would be neutralized at some point. SCP-529 a normal and friendly cat, except for the fact that its back half appears to be completely missing. The cat acts as if it's whole, and when SCP-187 was exposed to it, she didn't seem to notice anything wrong with the cat. She played with it briefly and seemed to be calmer than any other time she was examined. The Foundation is considering using SCP-529 as a motivating tool after she requested to revisit it. Other tasks had much more disturbing results as SCP-187 discovered things about subjects that researchers were previously unaware of. SCP-003, a strange organic circuit board made of hair and nails attached to a stone tablet, appears to be an ancient machine. But when SCP-187 was introduced to it, she greeted it like a person and had a conversation with it as the staff looked on confused. When she was interviewed after, she described the entity as a very nice lady. What is SCP-003 evolving into? The Foundation is studying it closely thanks to SCP-187's advance warning. When exposed to SCP-015, a massive network of pipes that seems to be slowly growing and defends itself from any attempts to work on it with tools, SCP-187 observed few differences from its current state until she opened a door. Inside, she reported a massive network of pipes reaching for miles with no end in sight. SCP-015 had been reduced to a manageable site and its danger had been contained, but SCP-187 indicated that it may be getting ready for its biggest and most dangerous expansion yet. SCP-415, a seemingly normal human man with an ability to regenerate his internal organs, has been a subject of the Foundation's investigation since his arrival, particularly due to the strange physical alterations he underwent to make it easier to access his organs. He's one of the more peaceful SCPs at the Foundation, but as soon as SCP-187 was exposed to him, she became disturbed. She begged to be removed from the room, and upon interrogation revealed that she saw SCP-415 as a deceased corpse. What is going to happen to the seemingly immortal man? SCP-187 was also exposed to some of the more dangerous SCPs in the Foundation, including SCP-173 a seemingly living statue that moves in unpredictable ways whenever it isn't observed, and has been responsible for the deaths of many D-Class personnel who enter its enclosure for cleaning. But it seems to be stable in containment, so why, when exposed to it, did SCP-187 begin screaming immediately, have to be removed from the enclosure, and fall into a catatonic state for two days? She remembered nothing from the vision she had of the statue, and it took days for her to recover fully. The Foundation is keeping a close eye on the statue, even closer than they were before. SCP-106, also known as the Old Man, a depraved killer resembling an elderly rotting corpse, is known for its frequent escapes and sadistic attacks on anyone near it. When exposed to SCP-187, the observation lasted less than a minute before the Old Man attempted to escape. SCP-187 looked to be in direct danger from the Old Man, but he never touched her or harmed her in any way. When she was interviewed after, she explained that the old man wanted an audience, someone to watch it. The incident was recorded as a close call, and an indication that some of the other entities may have their own plans for SCP-187. SCP-187's power works without fail, and that tempts many people to try to use her to get answers to important questions. But they should be careful what they wish for, as one doctor found out during an examination. SCP-187 looked at the woman's hand and observed that it was odd that she wasn't wearing her wedding ring. But the doctor was, and had been for the last 19 years. 
But the next day, her husband filed for divorce. And SCP-187's prophecies proved, once again, correct. So what are the future plans for SCP-187? The Foundation is being careful with her abilities, both to preserve her sanity and to prevent any potential time paradoxes. A routine has been established to keep her safe, fed, and protected from some of the worst effects of her ability. But the experiments using her visions aren't going to stop anytime soon. Many of her visions predicted dangerous new evolutions in Keter-class anomalies, giving the team time to prepare and up security measures. No one knows where SCP-187 came from, or what the source of her unique abilities is. But while the SCP Foundation is keeping some of the most dangerous entities in the world safely locked away, their most valuable asset may be one of the most harmless. Because as long as SCP-187 has her visions, the next breakout or apocalyptic event can be stopped in its tracks before it happens. It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, that meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom. Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feeds showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, 
The foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the Blood Pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid, and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. 
That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall, because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point. But we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. It was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature. Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-Class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, it gets bigger and stronger every day, and now, we've made it angry. It had happened again. Some absolute schmuck of a junior researcher had left a certain door ajar. The door that kept SCP-049 the Plague Doctor locked in his containment chamber. As a result, the good doctor had wandered out, and given the junior researcher a hug of appreciation for freeing him, leaving his dead body sprawled out across the ground. Typical, a problem solving itself. But this time, the problem had been a little more severe than just the one responsible facing immediate consequences of their actions. The Blake Doctor had grabbed the junior researcher's corpse and dragged him back into his cell, leaving the door once again slightly ajar. With a variety of equipment from his magical medical bag, the doctor had transformed the junior researcher's corpse into a disfigured zombie, in hopes of curing him of the pestilence and released him into the facility. 049 had followed him out to observe his behavior, and in the process he'd given several guards and members of janitorial staff a congratulatory hand touch, sending them to early graves. By the time people realized what was going on, six people were dead, several zombies were wandering around the building, and 049 was spotted in a lab stealing medical equipment. Dr. Clef, who was on duty at the time, was getting sick of this nonsense. This was actually the third breach that the Plague Doctor had been involved in this month, and it was only the 14th. He was frankly ready to wash his hands of this particular anomaly, because it wasn't just the fact that the Plague Doctor killed people that bothered Dr. Clef. After all, Dr. Clef himself had killed a considerable number of people. It was the fact that the Plague Doctor was also so damn sanctimonious about it. 
Clef breathed a sigh and rubbed his temples to subdue the incoming headache. It was time to have a little tribunal and decide what disciplinary action he would take against this freaky physician. The plague doctor was on his knees, locked into place by heavy chains and restraints around his neck, arms, and legs. These weren't even official Foundation property. Dr. Clef had brought them in from his private leisure room back at his house. Oof. As usual, the doctor was preaching the immense value of his work. The pestilence runs rife, Dr. Clef. Surely you must see that, the doctor cried. You're a man of science yourself, allegedly. Surely you can empathize with my mission. I just want to help people, can't you see? I'm just like you. Blah, blah, blah. Always this goddamn pestilence. Do you ever turn off? Clef said, waving away the doctor's words. I don't know about your pestilence, but I'm definitely looking at a pest right now. What the hell am I supposed to do with you? No matter what allowances we give you, you just keep escaping. The doctor hung his head. He hated when people treated him like this, like some wild animal. Of course, occasionally people died, but it was only in the pursuit of saving so many more lives. He tried to convince Dr. Clef that the costs would pale in the face of the rewards, but the gung-ho Foundation researcher simply wasn't interested in hearing it. Instead, he was brewing up a new idea, one that might rid him of the Plague Doctor forever, even without breaking the Foundation's goofy rule against killing anomalies. You know what, Dr. Clef said, affecting a voice of mock kindness. You finally got your words through my thick head. I get it now. I get how important your research is. All this time we've been stepping in the way of Nobel Prize winning work. I don't know how I'll ever live with myself for this. I just want to say personally on behalf of the SCP Foundation, we are truly sorry. Suddenly, the plague doctor perked up. My goodness, he thought. I've finally gotten through. He was practically vibrating with glee. Your apology is accepted, good sir, the plague doctor proclaimed. Let us not obsess over the past. We will look towards the future. Exactly, Dr. Clef cut in. That's why, by way of an apology, I plan to reassign you to a special research facility where you get to run the show. You'll have live test subjects aplenty and no accountability to the Foundation whatsoever. How does that sound to you, Doc? The Plague Doctor somehow rose to his feet despite the chains, perhaps propelled by the sheer force of his love for science. I suggest we leave at once, he said. Thank you, Dr. Clef, you kind, kind man. I always knew that you were the reasonable one. Even Dr. Clef had to resist the urge to laugh about that one. Smash cut to the next day, when Dr. Clef, the Plague Doctor, and a group of mobile task force officers were crowded into a helicopter heading towards SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. Of course, the Plague Doctor didn't know that. He thought he was heading towards the state-of-the-art research facility that Dr. Clef promised him. Clef, on the inside, reasoned that what this bird brain moron didn't know wouldn't hurt him. The helicopter landed within the perimeter established around the abandoned Ikea, and the Plague Doctor was herded off the vehicle. He'd bought Clef's lie, hook, line, and sinker, and as such was unusually cooperative with the guards. Dr. Clef pointed to the building and instructed the Plague Doctor to head inside and just keep walking. He'd find the test subjects and the facility soon enough, and why would the Foundation be lying to him? They'd even let him take his medical bag in there. When you get in there, ask for Hugh. He'll be your lead assistant, Dr. Clef told him. Lead assistant? You mean to tell me I will have multiple research assistants? The plague doctor said. Oh, splendid. I cannot wait to meet this Hugh. Oh, yeah, Dr. Clef said, biting his bottom lift to stifle a laugh. His name's Jazz. Be sure to mention that. It'll help speed along the process. The plague doctor nodded his head in thanks. Much appreciated, Dr. Clef. Rest assured, I will not forget this kindness. As the plague doctor wandered into the abandoned store, his heart swelling with pride, Dr. Clef began to quietly laugh behind his back like the big old jerk face he was. When he could no longer see the plague doctor, Clef turned to one of his colleagues and jokingly asked, does that mean we'll need to reclassify 3008 as Thaumiel now? Not looking forward to that paperwork. On the inside of the infinite Ikea, the plague doctor was chuckling to himself with glee. After all these years of hard work, his merit had been recognized, and he'd been given the respect he deserved from his peers at the Foundation. He was so wrapped up in his own sense of personal pride that he didn't even register it as strange that he was surrounded by odd, sterile living rooms, bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens, all in a seemingly random configuration. 
with signs next to them in a mix of the king's English and what he believed to be some form of Swedish that he didn't quite understand. Still, he didn't mind too much. He just assumed that these must be the accommodations for himself, his patients, his test subjects, and his research assistants, and to think they'd built this whole place just for him and his research. It lifted his soul to know that the SCP Foundation had finally recognized the pestilence for the danger that it is. From now on, everything would change. He'd probably find the cure in the next few years. Then, it suddenly occurred to him, he was a little lost. The layout of the research laboratory was incredibly strange. It seemed like an utterly arbitrary configuration of bizarre rooms, separated by wide aisles. It didn't seem sanitary at all. Where were the sealed laboratories, the gurneys, the patient beds, the medical equipment? And on top of all that, where was Hugh? Some kind of shenanigans were afoot. That much was clear now. The plague doctor quickened his pace through the halls of this strange building. One way or another, he would get to the bottom of this. Nothing would get in the way of the important research he planned to conduct here. After what felt like hours of aimless walking, the plague doctor encountered some other sentient beings, a group of three people wearing ragged post-apocalyptic looking clothes, all carrying defensive kitchen knives and hammers. The doctor was overjoyed to see these people he could actually converse with. The others, upon seeing him, were a little taken aback. Had some Renfair cosplayer somehow accidentally wandered into the building? What on earth was going on here? Excuse me, good sirs, the plague doctor called out. I'm searching for a huge jazz. That caused the group to break into laughter, immediately lessening the tension. The de facto leader of the group, Calvin, replied, aren't we all? 049 didn't get it. But these humans nonetheless liked the cut of this new guy's jib. All three of them had been in here for at least a year each, and it had been a while since they had a good laugh in this terrible labyrinthian place. Calvin stepped forward, lowering his weapons now that he could see that this weird cosplayer guy didn't seem like a threat. He cleared his throat and asked, Mind if I ask who you are, fella? The plague doctor was taken aback by this question. Did they not prepare you in advance for my arrival? The group shook their heads. How strange, the plague doctor said. Well, I suppose some proper introductions are in order then. I am your new leader, as appointed by Dr. Clef of the SCP Foundation. I am a reasonable man, a man of science, and under my leadership, we will be a scientific force the likes of which the world has never seen. Together we will cure the pestilence and save all of mankind. There was a long pause after that. None of the group of humans really knew how to react to this. Calvin thought to himself, Great, we got ourselves a major space case. Let's get him back to the camp before he gets himself killed. He forced a smile and nodded, pretending to be impressed by the plague doctor's bizarre ranting. Well then, doctor, he said, we better get you back to our camp. We're not going to get anything done while we're just standing around, will we? The plague doctor couldn't agree more. He followed the group of his three new research assistants further into this incredibly strange scientific building. The plague doctor indeed appreciated Dr. Clef putting all this together for him, but he would privately indulge in the thought that Dr. Clef seemingly could not put together a laboratory to save his life. This place was a bizarre, confusing disaster, but he would still make it work one way or another. However, his musings were interrupted when the lights went out. The three people with him began gasping in shock and horror. Calvin was repeating to himself, No, this is impossible. I timed it. I swear I timed it. But the plague doctor found their attitude to be utterly baffling. These were supposedly to be intrepid men of science, and yet they were afraid of the dark. It seemed they really did need his leadership to get anything done here. Follow me, gentlemen, the plague doctor said. It's merely a failure of the lights. I'll get this rubbish sorted out. He began to walk forward as the three human beings began to panic behind him, telling him that if he keeps walking, he'll die. He needs to come back. They need to stick together. But he kept walking. He didn't get this far by being a coward, after all. At least the others are following him now, wielding their hammers and kitchen knives. He'd whip them into shape. Then his attention was stolen by something altogether stranger. It was a creature, humanoid but not human, standing about ten feet away from him, seemingly ignorant to his presence. The Plank Doctor was simultaneously fascinated and horrified by what he saw before him. It was in some kind of yellow and blue uniform, with a hideous, malformed, faceless head and two long, tangled arms that it dragged along the floor behind it like an orangutan. It was a truly repulsive, pitiful creature, one that made the plague doctor sad to even look at it. Clearly this had to be an advanced case of the pestilence. 
While the plague doctor was filled with scientific curiosity, his three human traveling companions were filled with terror. They were still so far away from the camp, and the staff had found them already? Because there's never just one. They're like big, deadly cockroaches. If you can see one, more are on the way. Their best bet is just staying incredibly quiet and trying to sneak past. Hello there, you poor fellow, the plague doctor said, stepping forwards and waving. It seems you're in dire need of some medical assistance. Calvin and his two companions were mortified. So this was how they were going to die? After making the mistake of being kind to a clearly deranged man dressed as a medieval plague doctor, what a way to go. The second it heard the plague doctor's voice, the member of staff was activated, as were several others in a 10 meter radius. They all suddenly stood upright, muscles taut with violence waiting to happen. They began chanting their dreaded phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. While converging and running towards the plague doctor like a pack of hungry dogs, it was a terrifying sight to behold. But not for the plague doctor himself. There were so many of these poor infected people, and clearly the pestilence had not only warped their bodies but broken their minds. After all, this wasn't a store. This was the new research center specifically designed for his research. Dr. Clef would surely never just lie about something like that. He was an honorable man. Then again, maybe that was exactly why Clef had sent him here. So many victims of advanced pestilence would make perfect test subjects. A paradise of research. The plague doctor couldn't be happier as a group of 10 staff members converged on him. Calvin and his men could barely look. The new guy may have been crazy, but he didn't deserve to go out like this. However, the last thing they expected was for the plague doctor to calmly raise his hands, allowing the members of staff to run right into his deadly touch. In the following moments, all 10 of them were lying on the ground, dead. The three men were utterly speechless. What had just happened? Had the man in the strange costume snuck in a secret knife or a silenced gun? Had he gone into some hyper-advanced instant-kill kung fu move that was simply too fast and subtle for them to perceive? Or had he really just killed 10 members of staff in mere seconds just by touching them? The plague doctor turned to them and said, Well then, gentlemen, let us not dilly-dally. Grab one each and we'll carry them to the laboratory on the double. Soon after, the plague doctor and his three research assistants arrived at a nearby encampment. Several other members of staff had attacked them on the way, but a single touch from the plague doctor had killed each one. The human's perspective on this mysterious stranger had changed entirely. He'd gone from a goofy crank to a godlike savior. For as long as they'd been in here, they'd lived in terror of staff. But they were nothing to this man. With a single touch from him, they were gone forever. As the doors of the camp were closed behind him, the people of the camp began running towards them, confused and curious. The plague doctor was delighted to see that there were so many other research assistants here to help him on his divine mission. Dr. Clef, that beautiful, sweet man, had given him such a boon. Perhaps now, the pestilence may finally be cured. One of the camp leaders ran over furious and yelled, What the hell are you doing? You know you can't just bring those bodies in here. It'll only attract more of them, you fool. Fool. The plague doctor found this rather rude, but he'd overlook it for the sake of the greater good. He'd spent his whole life dealing with the aspirations from lesser intellects who couldn't even begin to understand his work. The masses rarely understand processes, only results. And here he knew he would be able to give them results. Worry not, good sir. I am a medical man, the plague doctor said, simply walking past the naysayer and bidding his first three research assistants to drag the bodies after him. I will bring this place up to code. You will see soon enough that my scientific leadership is second to none. Now I will retire to my office and begin dissecting these samples. Before the camp leader could say anything else, the plague doctor had retired into a staff room, which had been retrofitted as a kind of headquarters for members of the camp. That's when Calvin approached the camp leader and told him the astonishing news. Look, boss, I know he looks like a goofball in a Halloween costume, he said, but this guy, he's special, he's something else, he can kill the staff. The camp leader scoffed. So can we, he said. Calvin shook his head. No, you don't get it, boss. Not like us. This guy, he can kill the staff just by touching them. And the camp leader had no response to that. In his new study, the plague doctor was dissecting one of the dead staff members and was astonished to see what was happening within. The creature had no organs. It was simply that strange, slightly yellow tissue all the way down. He'd never seen the pestilence have such a profound and horrific effect on its victims. It had horribly altered them, 
all the way to the core. Was this what the Great Dine was truly capable of in its later stages? The Plague Doctor shuddered, both with horror and scientific excitement. He'd barely been here a day, and he'd made some of the most incredible discoveries. He took fastidious notes on these new revelations, feeling the picture coming together in his mind. His deep scientific thoughts were interrupted by the door opening, and Calvin and the camp leader stepped in. The camp leader was different than before. He had none of the bluster and arrogance of his first words. He showed fealty, like he was standing in the presence of a divine being. I I'd like to formally welcome you to our camp, Doctor, the camp leader said. We're extremely fortunate to have you here. Please, if you need anything, don't hesitate to let us know. We are truly at your service. The Plank Doctor was delighted to hear this. With a polite nod, he replied, More test subjects like these will do just fine, good sir. I believe I am very close to a breakthrough here. They'd spent hours making the costume. The two young boys, let's call them Johnny and Max, had always been on the creative side. Sometimes they got teased for it at school, but they didn't care. As long as they had each other, they could handle anything. They were best friends. Maybe one day they'd build great things together out of concrete and steel, but for now they worked with cardboard. Prior projects had included building a rocket out of cardboard in Johnny's backyard, like the kind that put a man on the moon. They'd also made a box for it like no other, more a box castle really, the kind that would stand for a hundred years, as long as it didn't rain, of course. But all of that felt like nothing compared to the tunnel monster. To these two young friends, it was a thing of beauty. A fully articulated cardboard monster costume meticulously cobbled together from boxes, masking tape, cardboard tubes for arms and legs, and a little twine to bring it all together. Frankenstein, Dracula, Freddy Krueger. Those silver screen phonies were nothing compared to the tunnel monster. They even cut out eye holes in the head and drew the scariest snarling mouth that they could write below. The making was over, and now they were ready to play. Johnny and Max took the costume down to one of their favorite places in town, the abandoned Brechter construction site. To many would seem like a strange and dangerous place for two young children to play, but for Johnny and Max, it was perfect. After all, they were the age where they had more imagination than sense. Max would be the one wearing the costume. Johnny helped him put it on piece by piece, using extra masking tape and twine where necessary to fasten all the pieces together. Little by little, Max became the tunnel monster. The transformation was complete, and it was finally time for the games to begin. Johnny ran, wielding a stick as a defensive weapon while Max gave chase. He could feel his own hot breath within the cardboard mask. It was oddly exhilarating. He gave a monstrous roar and charged after his friend, chasing him into the child-sized pipes of an unfinished water drainage system. It was more fun than anything they could have imagined. Max really got into his role. He lunged forwards, grabbing Johnny with his cardboard gauntlets and tried to drag him back into the tunnel, all while giving low, guttural growls. Johnny laughed and swatted at Max with his stick like a knight wielding a sword. They ran and crawled through the tunnels, the best of friends having the best of times, making the kind of memories that would last forever. And in that sense, they were right. Something they made that day would echo on forever but it wouldn't be something they would look back upon fondly. If they weren't so busy running through the tunnels, Max and Johnny might have noticed that something was amiss. They might have seen that, even though it was only 3 p.m. on a summer's day, the sky was beginning to darken. It may not have saved them, but it might have given them time to prepare for what was coming. Max was still chasing Johnny down a pipe, still fully in character as the tunnel monster, his arms extended to grab his fleeing friend while Johnny tripped. Max stopped to help him up, but something was wrong. When Max helped Johnny stand up, Johnny instinctually pushed him away, as though it wasn't actually his friend anymore. Max stumbled backwards in shock and horror. He could feel something changing beneath the cardboard. He suddenly was in pain. This terrible pain. Like he was being pulled apart and put back together. He started to scream. It was a horrible sound like nails on a chalkboard. Johnny had to hold his ears as the screaming got louder and louder, but Max couldn't stop. He was hurting too much to stop. Johnny was crying. He didn't know what was happening, only that his friend was in terrible pain and that there was seemingly nothing he could do to stop it. Even Max didn't know much more than that. 
but he thought it might have something to do with the suit. It felt like it was full of fire ants, crawling and biting. It felt like his body was full of fire ants. He needed to take the suit off before it got any worse, but he couldn't. The suit wouldn't come off. He reached for the cardboard mask and tried to tug it off his head, but it wouldn't budge. He felt like he was tugging at the skin of his own face. He could suddenly feel everything that brushed against the cardboard, like it was connected to his nerve endings. The fear and the panic got worse and he kept screaming. It was a deafening, ear-splitting scream. He didn't know it, but anything electrical within a 200 meter radius was dying. TVs shut off, radios fizzled out, cars stopped running. Nobody who didn't work for the SCP Foundation would ever know why. It wasn't even 3.30 p.m., but the sky above looked black as midnight. Max was afraid, but all he could do was cling to the familiar. He lunged forwards and grabbed Johnny, pulling him into his trembling embrace. Is he still Max now? No, he doesn't think so anymore. He's something else entirely. As he held his friend, Max tried to dig his fingers into the mask and tear it off. They pierced through the cardboard, tearing holes into it. It was agonizing, but the mask stayed put. There was no escape. He closed his eyes just for a moment. Maybe it was a bad dream. Maybe he could make it disappear, but it didn't disappear. Only he did. Max was no more. There was only the tunnel monster. When Johnny woke up, he was disoriented and afraid. He was in complete darkness, but he could feel the old metal of a rusty railroad track beneath his feet. He didn't remember how he got there, and he didn't remember Max either. Not his face, or even his name. But that's alright, Max didn't remember him either. When the terrified Johnny eventually found his way out of the old railway tunnel he'd somehow found himself in, he was rescued by emergency services and treated for dehydration. Because of the incredibly strange circumstances of his disappearance and reappearance over 4,000 kilometers away, it was only natural for the SCP Foundation to check in. But seeing as Johnny had no memory of where he was or who he was with prior to his mysterious teleportation, all they ever did was investigate the tunnel he'd appear in. Of course, they didn't find a thing. The case was closed shortly afterwards, written off as a kind of one-off spatial anomaly. Johnny was given amnestic treatment and reintegrated back into his normal life. He would never remember his encounter with the tunnel monster, but many would for decades and decades to come. There would be stories and scattered witness accounts from all kinds of people. Maintenance workers doing electrical repairs on subway tunnels, sewer workers cleaning up blockages in pipes, road workers fixing the asphalt in underpasses. The challenge with being an SCP Foundation field agent is often separating the genuine leads from the urban legends and spooky stories. But the details here were all too similar and specific. After all, it would be such a strange thing to make up. A moldy old pile of cardboard boxes getting up and running towards you. But stranger still, these incidents and encounters were occurring all over the United States with the only commonalities being that all of them happened in tunnels or tunnel-like structures. The Foundation didn't know if they were dealing with one entity or many. Another peculiar factor they observed was that sometimes people who had encounters with the tunnel monster then themselves appear in tunnels extremely far away from the ones in which they first encountered it. As far as the Foundation was aware, besides transporting them vast distances, it never actually harmed any of its victims. But according to one Boston sewer worker, Gus Zagrelia, when the tunnel monster laid its cardboard hand on him, he felt the most profound sense of paranoia and dread. He described it as feeling like a thousand eyes in the dark, watching you die. Then he blinked and he woke up in an Arizona viaduct roughly six hours later. Everyone who reported a similar experience with the tunnel monster was detained, debriefed, and given amnestics by the Foundation. Eventually, they gathered enough data on prior encounters to accurately predict the next tunnel that the tunnel monster would manifest inside. A new mobile task force was formed to secure the creature, MTF New 4, also known as the Box Cutters. What they didn't expect was that when they finally engaged the beast was that it was no larger than a human child. It wasn't some huge tunnel-dwelling nightmare even after all these decades. The tunnel monster was little more than a frightened, lonely little boy. He growled, attempting and failing to come off as intimidating to these hardcore MTF members. 
and referred to himself as the Tunnel Monster. When they didn't react with fear and surprise like the others, he became subdued. They were able to peacefully apprehend him and take him back to Site-54 for testing and containment. Preliminary x-rays found that the cardboard costume hadn't just fused with the boy, it had completely transformed him. On the inside, he was filled with crude cardboard copies of all the major internal organs, with his blood vessels and nerve endings made out of colored pieces of string. They couldn't find any information on who the boy was, if he had ever been a boy at all and he was given the designation SCP-3663. In order to find out more, one of the leading researchers on the SCP-3663 case, Researcher Doyle, decided to conduct an interview with the Tunnel Monster. It had been the only interview with the creature to date, due to the emotional distress it caused the creature. When asked about its identity, it replied with only the Tunnel Monster. When asked why it attacked and teleported people to different locations, the creature replied, The Tunnel Monster captures people. That's me. I'm the Tunnel Monster. I capture people and take them into the tunnels where I live. In the tunnels. The pipes. I'm the Tunnel Monster. As the interview progressed, the Tunnel Monster became increasingly upset until it began weeping through its cardboard face finally culminating with its crying out between sobs, Please, I don't want to play anymore. SCP-3663 only feels comfortable in tunnels, and will teleport away in distress if confined anywhere else. As such, its containment chamber is technically the maintenance tunnels underneath Site-54, where it seems to have made a home for itself. Occasionally, if it experiences fear, damage, or stress, it may de-manifest and appear in tunnels elsewhere. At that point, the box cutters are deployed to collect 3663 once again and bring him back to Site-54. So far, there has only been one major containment breach with SCP-3663, but it was a little more deadly than you might expect for a boy-sized creature made of cardboard. The tunnel monster escaped from the Site-54 tunnels and began wailing in pain. It went positively berserk, attacking surrounding staff and trashing parts of the facility. Anyone who heard the wails of the Tunnel Monster reported becoming extremely psychologically disturbed by them. During this four-hour rampage, the monster also tried multiple times to destroy itself with various implements, but was unsuccessful. After SCP-3663 was recontained, two deceased members of personnel were recovered from the scene. Autopsies showed the cause of death was a buildup of paper residue and wood pulp in all of their major blood vessels, as well as sinuses, ear tubes, and the majority of the digestive and respiratory systems. A number of other staff members were found to have been affected to a lesser degree, but are expected to make full recoveries. What triggered this explosive and deadly outburst? Not even the tunnel monster itself knew the answer to this question. But we do. At exactly the same time, a 79-year-old man passed away from natural causes after what seemed like a thoroughly unremarkable life. That man's name was Johnny. Does the black moon howl? No, not yet. See the boy. He was born in a time before names. There weren't enough humans around to need them back then. He was one of a handful occupying a coastal village, using a tongue long since dead. They eked out a simple life, hunting, gathering, fishing. The only thing on most of their minds was surviving to see the next sunrise. Yes, a simple life, free of complications. Until the hermit appeared. The boy would remember this man for eternity. Haggard and thin, skin weathered by time and pain. A man that, emaciated, walking with a long, gnarled cane that honestly looked healthier than he did, shouldn't be alive. Even the boy, who had scarcely seen beyond the bounds of his village, knew that the hermit was unnatural, an aberration, an anomaly. He walked into the center of the village, sat down on a large stone, and waited. Nobody dared ask his business, nor what the hermit waited for. Then, a few days later, the black moon howled. The boy saw the village's youngest hunter freeze one evening while out on a walk. Not simply stand still, but freeze. Then, for an instant, he became solid black, a coal statue. And as soon as he'd changed, he was gone. Obliterated, not a trace of him remained. Such is the power of the black moon. 
It can make any conscious being disappear in an instant, turn black, then wiped from our plane of existence, never to be seen again. Its choice of victims seemed, at each instance, to be utterly random, but it would come for all who lived eventually. This is known to some as the Howling of the Black Moon. Later that same night, the boy found himself talking to the hermit, who asked with small, frantic eyes what he had seen. When the boy told him, he let out a deep, rattling sigh. The boy, curious, asked him if he knew about the nightmare he'd just witnessed. The hermit looked up. He'd been the first one in the hermit's millennia of pursuit that had ever asked. In that moment, he knew that he had found his successor in the hunt for the death of ages. The hermit told the boy it went by many names. The Great Finale, the Pale King, but most common of all was the Black Moon. The entity existed beyond the veil of our reality, a creature of pure energy, though nobody could really be sure of its true nature. The hermit had been tracking it, learning about it, and trying to destroy it for thousands of years. And yet it only took him four pathetic minutes to tell the boy everything he knew. The boy, knowing still that something about the hermit was unnatural, asked how he came to be in this position. The hermit told the boy he was the counterbalance, a kind of chosen one, destined to face and perhaps even defeat the Black Moon someday. The counterbalance receives a number of truly extraordinary gifts for inheriting the responsibility, eternal life, eternal youth, near physical immortality. But they will be haunted by their purpose, doomed to watch everyone they love die around them, as they continue to hunt their only true equal and opposite, the Black Moon itself. The hermit in his own eyes had failed at his duty. He had grown weary, and now he needed to pass the duty of counterbalance on to another. That other would be the boy. He felt a sudden and profound change, along with the knowledge that nothing would ever be the same again. He was no longer just the boy. Now, he was the counterbalance. He watched the hermit give him a slight nod of respect, and then crumble into dust before his eyes. The boy, the counterbalance, looked up at the sky and saw the stars twinkling, so bright and so beautiful. Little did he know his battle with the Black Moon would outlast every single one of them. Does the Black Moon howl? Not without blood. The boy grew into a man as his village aged and then died around him. Decades passed, then centuries, then millennia. Tens of thousands of years watching humanity develop and grow around him as he continued his pursuit of that one elusive foe. As science and diagnostic technology gained ground, absorbing and then evolving beyond all the old superstitions, the counterbalance gained a better understanding of the Black Moon, though even then, it still remained essentially a stranger. The entity was entropic, a being of pure randomness and chaos without consistent form. It didn't exist in our universe, but it could exercise its influence here with so-called obliteration events much like the horrible fate that befell the young hunter from the village. But that was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The counterbalance tracked and noted obliteration events. They were exceedingly rare at first, something that occurred once every thousand years or so, like a terrible curse. But he couldn't help but notice a concerning trend emerging. It started happening once a century, then once a decade. He could feel the terrible future stretching out in front of him. How, over their shared eternity, the Black Moon would gain more and more ground. Would there come a day where it took someone once a year, once a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, a second? It'd spell the end of all conscious life. A total victory for the Black Moon. The end of the universe. The death of ages. A complete existential obliteration. He was swept up in a sobering realization. He couldn't win this fight alone. However, while his hunt for the Black Moon had been largely fruitless, the counterbalance had discovered many other things along the way. Strange creatures, objects with extraordinary powers, and events that couldn't be explained with rational science. Perhaps something about these oddities, these anomalies, 
would hold the key to defeating his timeless enemy. And it hadn't just been these objects, entities, and events. He'd also discovered some truly exceptional people on his travels, minds and skills that rivaled even his own, despite his age. Perhaps they would be the ones to help him win. With the 13 most brilliant and trusted people the counterbalance ever met, he decided to form a council. And from this council, they forged and directed an organization dedicated to understanding and counteracting the strange in all its forms, with the secret hope that their search into darkness would yield the answer to the Black Moon's downfall. He called it the SCP Foundation. They would secure the anomalous, contain it, and protect all of humanity from its influence. The counterbalance also took on a new title, befitting of his new role, the Administrator. And even the Black Moon itself was given a moniker, in hopes of robbing it of some of its frightening power. SCP-001 Does the Black Moon howl? Only at the blind. The year was now 1987. The SCP Foundation had been operating for over a century, and thanks to their secret possession of anomalous wisdom and technology, their own advancement was thousands of years ahead of the rest of humanity. While there still wasn't a silver bullet solution to the Black Moon, and its deadly howls were becoming all the more frequent as the decades went on, the Foundation did have some irons in the fire to combat it. Their ability to gather intel on both the entity itself and its obliteration events had improved considerably, thanks to their new global information network. Their top minds were also working on a highly classified device known as the Singular Conceptual Bunker, which may one day come in handy for combating the extra-dimensional entity directly. But the most valuable piece of information they ever gathered about the Black Moon was this. It couldn't howl when it was being watched. The very act of engaged observation defanged it. The problem is, how can you observe something that doesn't technically exist inside your own reality? In order to pull this off, the Foundation would need to get extremely creative. Thankfully, creative solutions to strange problems are the Foundation's specialty. Flash forward to 1993. Enter Dr. Moto, a brilliant young scientist and conceptual engineer working for the SCP Foundation. With the administrator's consultation, he started the Key Project, an arm of the wider Project Oromasides, the umbrella initiative for using modified anomalous objects in the battle against the Black Moon. The goal of the Key Project was relatively simple. If people couldn't observe the Black Moon directly, then the Foundation could make proxies of the Black Moon that could be observed, almost like a kind of voodoo doll. These new anomalies would only need to satisfy three criteria the inability to operate when being observed, a hostility to conscious life, and the ability to end conscious life of their own volition when not being observed. Through conceptual engineering, a link theoretically could be forged between these objects and the Black Moon, allowing observation of them to stop the obliteration events. However, despite being a good idea in theory, Dr. Moto's efforts were marred with errors and tragedies. One object wasn't deadly enough, simply appearing behind people in a threatening pose when they weren't looking. Another one killed purely through collateral damage, a giant sculpture of a human head that immediately attempted escape by barging through Site-01, the center for anti-Black Moon operations, and killing 19 people in the process. Another one of Moto's objects, a huge black sphere, simply immediately exploded, killing 12 people. And in the most horrific misstep of all, one of Moto's objects caused a mass death event in a nearby hotel, where 142 people were spontaneously incinerated when the object, a series of interlocking stalactites and stalagmites, were left unobserved for 0.2 seconds. Almost all of Moto's objects were terminated in the aftermath, either being too useless or too dangerous to keep around. The young scientist felt a deep shame but forged on. He made one truly brilliant creation that satisfied all the criteria. A sculpture, incapable of moving while being watched, but would snap the neck of the nearest conscious entity if it left unobserved for even a fraction of a second. Its relatively minimal killing left it easy to contain without causing mass deaths. And despite all the other deaths that had sadly occurred during the key project, Dr. Moto believed that the lives saved in the long run by stopping the Black Moon's howls would justify the sacrifice. The problem is, the Key Project didn't stop anything. 
Not long after this, there was the first recorded double obliteration event in Rome, where a young tourist couple had both been obliterated simultaneously. All the deaths in the Key Project had been for nothing. The Black Moon was only getting more powerful. The shame and the guilt was too much for Dr. Moto. He left a note in his office reading, We've been looking at nothing. I'm sorry, Administrator. I failed you, sir. Moto's corpse was later found in the sculpture's temporary containment chamber. His neck snapped. The key project was, in summary, shut down, and its one surviving creation transported to Site-19 in late 1993, where it was designated as SCP-173. Another painful failure for the administrator. Back to the drawing board once more. Does the black moon howl? Not while the stars shine. Millennia stretched on. Almost everyone died except the administrator thanks to his gift. Or perhaps curse. As the calendar balanced to the black moon, science marched on, the SCP Foundation marched on, but all this progress, all this power, was nothing against the incomprehensible influence of SCP-001. The black moon was howling more frequently than ever, all the way up to the year 3156, when the Foundation launched the SEEK project under the support of Project Oromastes. As more and more people were wiped out in frequent obliteration events, the administrator became painfully aware that perhaps the answers to the Black Moon problem wouldn't be found on Earth. Using state-of-the-art technology, with a little help from the anomalous, the SCP Foundation began work on an autonomous spacefaring vessel that could search the stars for the key to the Black Moon's destruction. It was an awe-inspiring creation. A huge craft powered by artificial intelligence, with a universal translator, cryogenic units, and hundreds of autonomous drones to perform more targeted searches. Seek was waved off into the unforgiving depths of space. The administrator could only hope that it would come back with worthwhile answers. The first of the three notable planets Seek derived on was one theoretically capable of supporting human life, except for its brutal and constant blizzards and snowstorms. When Seek's drones were deployed, they did discover signs of civilization based around sentient spherical creatures but no signs of actual life remained. Records and statues found across the planet seem to indicate that the Black Moon was responsible for the destruction of the planet's civilization, causing so many obliteration events that the remaining survivors went mad from the fear and stress, leading to mass death in the ensuing chaos. The next planet was discovered centuries later, in the year 3499. While this planet could also theoretically support human life, it suffered from frequent volcanic eruptions that rendered much of its surface a flaming mess. However, there were still the dormant ruins of a once advanced civilization of conscious beings. Much like the prior planet, they'd been driven extinct by Black Moon obliteration events a century before the Seek even arrived. Unlike the last planet, however, it seems that they accepted their fate and went gently into the night. The planet was now overrun by billions of armored bat-like creatures that operated on pure instinct, and thus were not considered conscious enough to be obliterated. The final planet was reached in 3764, and was the most fruitful of the three discoveries. This planet was hyper-advanced, fully urbanized, and covered in sprawling megacities, with records and technology over a thousand years ahead of Earth. Before the Black Moon killed almost all of them, there were a species of humanoid telepathic fungi, and had developed an awareness of the Black Moon's existence that was on par with that of humanity's. They even had their own equivalent of the SCP Foundation actively working on countermeasures. And most amazingly of all, Seek found one surviving member of this species on the planet, cryogenically frozen. The craft was immediately instructed to collect the survivor and return home for interrogation. The administrator was preparing for what could be the most important conversation since he met the hermit all those thousands of years ago. Does the Black Moon howl? Only when waning. When the surviving creature, codenamed Sage, was returned to Earth, the administrator was eager to finally speak with it. Like the rest of its now extinct species, Sage spoke through powerful telepathic mind waves, which only the administrator, thanks to his counterbalance abilities, was able to receive at close range without being harmed. Incidentally, it wasn't long until the very fact of the administrator's nature as a counterbalance came up in the mental conversation. Sage could tell, just by being in his presence. They discovered a number of vital truths over their brief time communicating, 
that Sage's survival had been pure luck, for starters. The Black Moon is still very much capable of obliterating conscious beings in an unconscious state. The administrator also learned that he was merely the latest in an extremely long line of counterbalances across time, space, and species, though everyone but him had waived this duty, passed it on. Sage had one question to ask the administrator in turn, what is SCB? The singular conceptual bunker, being worked on and perfected for thousands of years by now, by the Foundation's top scientists and conceptual engineers. The administrator replied, Victory, but it will take a very, very long time. Specifically, so long that he would see the stars go out around him, one by one. Shocked, Sage asked him what good victory would do him then. Rather than say it aloud, he replied with a thought. Sage paused and said, I see. How blasphemous of you. Hopefully it works. After this, the administrator proceeded to the singular conceptual bunker and entered it leaving instructions for the Foundation to be run by a newly formed O5 Council in his indefinite absence. Thousands of years later, in the year 5011, Sage spoke one more time, repeating the words, hopefully, hopefully, before turning solid black and disappearing. The Black Moon had claimed one more victim, but billions more had gone in the interim. The Administrator had no more answers to give. At least, no more answers that anyone but him would understand. He was inside the singular conceptual bunker now, loaded into a device known as Tome, an experimental memorial module meant to pick up and record all the last messages of every dying civilization across the universe when the time finally came. All he could do was wait. And wait was exactly what we did. Does the Black Moon howl? Yes. Yes, it does. Years pass, too many to count. It's a time after names now, and Tome sits in the very center drinking in the end of the universe. The last of all the human colonies across the universe were obliterated by the Black Moon back in the year 7329. So, so, so long ago. But some of the final messages of fear, panic, and distress still echoed around in the administrator's mind. Hello? Is there anyone here? We require assistance. There's... It's it's taking people every day. We need help. There's barely anyone left. We need help. Hello? Hello? Cabal 0943, we have abandoned the false flesh. We have abandoned the false flesh. The shepherd's crook broken neath my knee. Cabal 0943, Cabal 0943, forgive us! Forgive us! We're going to leave this on. It's so dark outside now. It's blotted out the sun. It's... I have to go now. Respond. First convenience. Emergency. Situation developing. Require additional resources. My fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault! Rip my brain out now, rip my brain out now! And a small child, the last on Earth simply asking, Hello? Into an indifferent microphone. But the administrator had to wait as the singular conceptual bunker became the solitary conceptual bunker. He was the last conscious being in the universe, and still he needed to wait as the stars went dark outside. Only when there was nothing outside but black was it finally time for the counterbalance's long game to play off. There was nothing left of our universe. The only thing here was the SCB and the Black Moon itself. With everything else gone, the Black Moon only had one conscious being left to obliterate. It opened the door to the solitary conceptual bunker and stepped inside. This… this doesn't make sense. How can the Black Moon, an entity beyond our dimension, beyond physical form, take a step? Good question. The same question, incidentally, that was going through the Black Moon's mind as it entered the bunker. It didn't look at all how the entity expected. It was like a bar. A counter, with rows of bottles behind it, a jukebox playing in the corner, a man stood behind the bar cleaning the glasses. The counterbalance. The administrator. He said, <laughs> well there you are. Certainly took your time. Can I pour you a little something? This only served to increase the Black Moon's confusion. It had form here. Dark smoke compressed into a vaguely humanoid shape. It could speak. It could think. 
None of this made any sense. The being that had just wiped out all conscious life and seen the very death of the universe was truly and utterly confused. The administrator just seemed to be enjoying himself, preparing for a confrontation hundreds of billions of years in the making. The singular conceptual bunker, or perhaps the singular containment bunker, was a truly ingenious creation. A place of pure ideas, where everything inside was on the same level. Here there were no immortals, no gods, just ideas on the same level playing field. And it was time for the Black Moon's idea to come to an end. It was a trap, and the entire universe was the bait. Without warning, the administrator pulled up a shotgun from underneath the table and unleashed both barrels into the Black Moon's chest. The creature took the hit and fought back, dragging the administrator to the ground, beating him, strangling him. He could feel the light fading under the monster's relentless assault, until he managed to get his desperate hands on a glass ashtray. He beat the monster over the head with it until its grip loosened, and he was able to slide out. There, the killer of the universe was on the ground before him. He grabbed the monster, held it in place, and beat it to death. He was gravely injured by the battle, but the Black Moon was no more. Here in the singular conceptual bunker, he had won. The administrator, no longer the counterbalance in the absence of the Black Moon, hobbled over to the jukebox, produced a single beautiful coin from his pocket. He pushed the coin into the slot, wheezed a pain breath, and said, The thing is, this place is only information. There's nothing else out there. Not even matter. The universe closed its doors a long time ago. This place can go from information back to matter with just the press of a button. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we introduce something to nothing. For a second it looks as though he might fall, but he doesn't. Instead, he slams the button on the jukebox and with a relieved laugh says, Let there be light. And there was light. A bright flash of light awakens Pietro Wilson from his vegetative state. He sits up and brushes the sand off himself, looking around the desolate desert he's found himself in. How did he get here? The last thing he remembers is uncovering secret orders from the leaders of the SCP Foundation, just before they declared war on humanity. Unfortunately, the most important parts of the files had been redacted, now he's on a mission to finally discover why the SCP Foundation is trying to kill every last human on the planet. But there is something else he has to deal with first. What happened? Pietro says out loud as he looks at his vitals in the heads-up display of SCP-5000. He is still contained within the exclusionary suit that makes him undetectable to human senses. He checks the date and gasps in surprise. Three months? I've been passed out for three months? He stands up and looks across the barren landscape. The screen inside the suit indicates that he has traversed half of the country since he left Site-19 three months ago. Pietro looked down at one of his hands. He is holding a leather briefcase. Where did that come from? He wonders. Pietro has no idea what is inside the briefcase, but he knows it definitely isn't round. He tries to let go. His fingers won't open. He uses his other hand to try and pry the briefcase away from himself but his hand only clasps to it harder. Then a wave of calm washes over him. Something inside his head speaks to him, but it's not a voice, more like a feeling. It is a sense of purpose, and Pietro's new mission in life is to deliver this briefcase to SCP-579. Nothing else is as important. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath and embraces his new purpose in life. He still wants to uncover the reason that the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity but this will have to wait until he delivers the briefcase to SCP-579. Pietro doesn't know exactly where 579 is located, but he can feel a pull in a certain direction, so he begins to walk. Pietro brings up the information stored in the SCP-5000 suit from the Foundation's database. He finds that all information about what SCP-579 is has been expunged from the record, the only useful information in the file is that the Keter level SCP is located at Site 62C. At least Pietro has a destination to aim for. He travels for days without seeing a living soul, but he does pass thousands of corpses. He tries to ignore them, but one stands out to him inside a house as he searches for supplies. It's the body of a recently deceased boy. He couldn't have been more than eight years old. He was so young, Pietro thinks. 
He bends over to scoop up the body and bury it outside. As his hand touches the body, the boy's skin begins to move. It is as if hundreds of tiny creatures are scurrying just under the skin. Then from out of every orifice comes hundreds of little pale worms, each with the face of the boy. They are all cackling as they crawl out of the boy's body and into a drain a few feet away. Pietro jumps back and runs. This is the last person I try to bury, he thinks. Pietro pushes forward, the hundreds of little laughing worms haunting his thoughts, until he puts a significant distance between himself and the little boy's body. Pietro continues to walk towards the direction of Site 62C. He passes more corpses, but decides to stay clear of them. Although the suit makes it so Pietro doesn't need to rest, he can only go so fast. He enters a small, abandoned town that looks like something out of an old western movie. A tumbleweed blows across the dirt road. Pietro sits on the wooden step of the local saloon and takes a break. He looks down at the briefcase in his hand. He hasn't had the urge to open it, only to deliver it to SCP-579. Pietro puts the briefcase on his lap. He stares at it and slides his hands along the leather, stops with his thumb on the latch, and pushes. The locks snap open. Pietro opens the briefcase. A bright light beams out, and he passes out. When Pietro comes to again, he is miles closer to Site 62C. There is a warm feeling enveloping his body. He looks down at the briefcase, which is now closed. Wow, this thing is like my own personal skip button, Pietro thinks. He holds up the briefcase, unlatches the locks, sees the bright light, and passes out again. He awakes once again miles away from his last position. So it wasn't just a one-off effect. Pietro continues walking across the country, switching between using his own legs and whatever magic is contained within the briefcase. He is making faster progress now. As he walks through a dense, deciduous forest, he comes across a pack of wolves eating the remains of an SCP agent. Pietro is undetectable to the wolves thanks to the SCP-5000 suit, and he makes his way over to the pack, quietly grabbing a laptop laying on the ground next to the agent's body. Pietro takes the laptop and goes away deeper into the forest before stopping to boot up the computer. He has not forgotten about the horrors the SCP Foundation has released, and he needs to know how the world has been doing over the last few months. What he finds is… not good. The SCP Foundation has triggered the eruption of Yellowstone, destroying SCP-2000, which unknown to Pietro, contained the failsafe for rebuilding human society in the event of a world-ending scenario which this was starting to look more and more like. It was only a matter of time now before the soot and ash thrown up by the eruption blocks out the sun in much of what is left of the United States. The Foundation has also found a way to get SCP-2241 to do their dirty work at refugee camps. The young brown-haired boy is most likely being manipulated by the Foundation under the pretense that they are only doing what is best for their child. He has caused whole groups of refugees to turn on each other, leading to a massacre. The last entry says that the young boy is being sent to the Global Occult Coalition holdout in Genzir to help destroy some of the last threats to the SCP Foundation. A series of other SCPs have been dispatched by the Foundation around the world to continue the destruction of humanity. They even managed to use temporal anomalies to make it Christmas time everywhere around the world. So SCP-4666, the brutal yuletide creature that stalks the homes of children, is free to cause chaos. Pietro had seen enough. He slams the laptop shut, throws it against the trunk of a tree, and opens the briefcase again. He awakes, standing feet away from a group of Global Occult Coalition soldiers who are sitting around a campfire. Maybe they know why the SCP Foundation is trying to end the world, he thinks. He decides that it is too risky to show himself to the soldiers, but takes some solace in sitting around the campfire with other living humans. The soldiers are sharing stories about what is happening. One catches the attention of Pietro Wilson. It is strange, but also may hold a clue as to why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity. One of the soldiers recounts an event that he witnessed before leaving the Global Occult Coalition's headquarters at Genzir. They had just captured an SCP soldier trying to break into the base. The infiltrator's name was Samuel Ross. He had been strapped into an interrogation chair and questioned. The interviewers were not getting anywhere until Ross was threatened with torture, to which he responded, Do what you want. 
Once you realize you're not supposed to feel pain, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Pietro sits up straight and starts to listen more intently. He remembers stumbling across SCP soldiers on his way to Site-19 that exhibited the same no-pain mentality that this Samuel Ross seems to have. After that odd statement by Samuel Ross, there was the sound of wind. It started slow at first, then ramped up until it was howling like a hurricane. That's when the screaming started. The screams became louder and climbed to a higher pitch. Then the room went dead silent. The last thing that Samuel Ross said was, Look what you've done to yourselves. I told you you wouldn't like it, didn't you? That's why you hear your voice. But you wanted to know so badly. I really liked you guys, so I was trying to be nice. We're so kind to you, you know. We fight in the light, so you can die in the dark. Hmm, <laughs> disgusting. Pietro sits back on his haunches and rocks back and forth. He has an ominous feeling that there is a connection between the missing pain of the SCP soldiers and the reason why the Foundation declared war on humanity. The soldier who told the story of Samuel Ross stands up. After that interview is when the destruction of Genzir started from the inside. It is why the Global Occult Coalition is no more. God help us all. The soldier finished with his story, turns from the others and starts to walk away. As the soldier makes his way towards the woods, Pietro can just barely make out that he's taken his pistol from its holster before he disappears into the darkness. The world truly has gone mad. Pietro opens the briefcase and blacks out. Pietro sluggishly continues his walk. He's moving down a rocky path in the middle of the forest, and his will to keep going is slowly being drained. The only reason he has not sat down and given up is because of the driving urge to get the briefcase to 579. He wants so badly to concentrate and discover the reason that the Foundation released the SCPs on humanity, but the need to reach 579 won't let him focus on anything else. He's noticed, though, that every time he opens the briefcase to skip ahead, he makes less and less progress. The warm feeling of the first few transports has been replaced by a nauseated headache every time he comes out of the trance. Pietro exits the forest into an open field. The wind blows across the high grass looking like green waves, and standing scattered throughout the field are statues. As Pietro approaches, he sees that they are statues of Mobile Task Force Foundation soldiers. He slowly walks closer to the white marble statues. He reaches the first one and looks at the face of the frozen soldier. His eyes have been scooped out. All that remains are black, empty sockets. The arms of the soldier have been carved into blades, like a praying mantis. He walks past the first statue and proceeds to the next one, where he hears something move in the grass behind him. He spins around to look at the statue. He could have sworn it was in a slightly different position. No, that's crazy, Pietro thinks. He continues to the next statue. It is another carving of an MTF soldier. No eyes, blades for arms. This is really creepy. Pietro says aloud. He proceeds through the field. He walks up a slight hill and turns around to look at the field of statues. What he sees is terrifying. The statues have all moved and are now in different positions. It appears as if they were slashing through the area looking for something. Or someone. Pietro continues over the hill and comes upon a group of refugees. They are picking through the field looking for food to eat. A fog begins to move in. It is being swept across the meadow by the wind. Pietro watches from a distance as the fog envelops the small group. Suddenly there is screaming and the sound of blades going through flesh. The screams cease almost immediately. Pietro runs down the hill to where the refugees were. The fog lifts. The group of people have been cut to pieces. Standing in the middle of the carnage is one of the MTF soldier statues, blood dripping from its blade arms. Pietro knows what to do. He runs. After a few miles, Pietro slows to catch his breath. Those statues must have been created by the Foundation, he thinks. It's as if they are frozen in place. But as soon as you take your eyes off them, they can move with killer speed. Even in the suit, my eyesight can stop them. But they can't see me. They must know I'm there, though, since they can't move. Pietro Wilson opens the briefcase once again, for what he didn't know would be the last time. When he comes to this time, he is near Site-62C. 
He can feel himself being pulled stronger than ever in the direction of his destination. He walks down a deserted road past the husks of burnt vehicles, and at the end is the gate to Site 62C. There are no guards or security of any kind. It looks like the site has been abandoned for a long time, and the gate is wide open, beckoning Pietro Wilson into Site 62C, where SCP-579 waits. Pietro Wilson enters the dark hallway he somehow knows leads down into the crypt of Site 62C. The walls drip with what he hopes is water from leaking pipes, but it has a metallic smell, and is much too red to actually be water. He begins to feel nauseous. It gets harder to breathe. Even the SCP-5000 suit can't keep him calm. He turns and runs back up the stairs out of Site 62C. Pietro begins to sob uncontrollably as the memories of everything that has happened over the past several months suffocates his will to go on. Then, as if an invisible force that refuses to let him go takes control. Pietro feels as if a gun has been shoved into the small of his back. He is being sent back into Site 62C, whether he wants to go or not. He is unsure if what is forcing him back into the base is inside the briefcase, his own uncontrollable urge to know what is going on, or SCP-579 itself, but he cannot stop himself from re-entering the doorway and proceeding into Site 62C. He doesn't know what SCP-579 looks like, but Pietro has a sinister feeling that it is watching him. He reaches the bottom of the stairway and proceeds down a dark hallway. The power went out a long time ago, and the only light in the depths of Site 62C is the dim glow coming from the helmet of the SCP-5000 suit. Pietro notices long gashes along the concrete walls, as if someone took a giant knife and dragged it from one end of the hallway to the other. There is something at the end of the corridor that Pietro can't make out. As he gets closer, the lights on the SCP-5000 suit begin to flicker. The thing at the end of the hallway seems to move slightly each time the lights on the suit dim. The lights on the suit go out completely, and the entire hallway is plunged into darkness. Only for a second, though, and when the lights come back on, a statue of an MTF soldier looms over Pietro. Its eyes are empty sockets, its lips are turned up in a snarl, the arms have been filed into blades. No! Pietro screams. He dodges around the statue. The moment it is out of his sight, he hears the sound of blades on concrete. As the statue of the soldier comes to life and begins slashing its way down the hallway, it cannot see Pietro, but it knows he is there. It slashes all around, trying to connect with whoever is there with it. Pietro runs to the end of the hallway and reaches the door. He presses against the heavy metal door to open, straining against its weight all while the blind statue is still slashing, coming closer and closer. The door is almost open, but then Pietro feels a blade lacerate the back of the suit cutting deeply into the skin of his back, missing his spinal cord by millimeters. Another blade enters through the back of his shoulder, piercing straight through. He somehow pulls himself through the cracked doorway and kicks the metal door shut behind him. He can hear the banging and scraping of blades outside the metal door. The creature has not given up and is trying to break in. Pietro turns around to see he is in an observation chamber full of instruments and screens. Blood runs down his back from the wounds inflicted by the statue. He walks slowly over to the window. On the desk in front of him is a file labeled SCP-579. He looks through the observation glass and down into the chamber below. It is too dark to make anything out, but Pietro can feel that SCP-579 is down there looking up at him. Pietro looks to his left and sees a hole in the floor. He walks over and looks down, and leads right into the containment chamber of 579. Let's get this over with, Pietro says out loud. He holds the briefcase over the hole and tries to open his hand. His finger won't budge. SCP-579 wants him to hand deliver the briefcase. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath, closes his eyes, and steps into the opening of the hole. He falls. In the moments before he lands in SCP-579's containment chamber, something comes to him. He realizes that he isn't going to be a hero. He isn't going to figure out why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity, and he isn't going to survive. He lands hard on the ground below. It is completely dark, except for a shadow that moves in the corner of the containment chamber. Pietro Wilson creates one last log. If anyone ever reads this, please, please figure out why. Explain it to me. Someone. 
anyone. I don't get it. I just don't get it. SCP-579 steps into the glow that the SCP-5000 suit is giving off. Pietro Wilson looks up at it. Oh, so that's how it is. He says before SCP-5000 creates its final log. Life signs, lost. Vital signs, lost. SCP-5000 appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of SCP-579, located in Site 62C. The researchers monitoring SCP-579 had no idea where the suit came from, or why it contained the body of Pietro Wilson, a Foundation employee who is assigned to Site 06 and is very much alive. Wilson appears to have no knowledge of SCP-5000, or memories of the events logged in SCP-5000's databanks. Although the suit is believed to have been capable at one point of a number of anomalous functions and abilities, the damage it has sustained has rendered it inoperable, except for the storage of data files, which now have been archived and stored on secure Foundation servers. Any changes today? The younger security officer Zack asked as he stepped into the watchtower. As if replied his superior, a jaded, cynical old man who insisted on being referred to as Mr. Jefferson. The darn thing hasn't moved, spoken, or done so much as stretch one of those wings of his. Another day at the office, then, Zack jumped. Through the window, the pair of them looked through at the towering figure a few kilometers away. SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, stood motionless, its fiery sword in its hand, ever protecting its post at the precipice between our world and paradise. It had long been stationed at the entrance of a dimensional gateway that led to what was believed to be the Garden of Eden, described in the Biblical Old Testament. Much like the security officers in the Foundation's base tasked with watching the Guardian, this was pretty much the extent of the day's activities. Hey, did you see that news about the uh, transfer posting? Zack asked, trying to stave off boredom with as much conversation he could squeeze out of his fellow officer. Yeah, I saw it. Mr. Jefferson scoffed, rolling his eyes. What possesses someone like Robert Montauk to come down here? Eh, must have wanted a quieter post, Zack reasoned, looking out at the stillness of the Gate Guardian. Won't find one any quieter than here, Jefferson mused. Him showing up will be the most exciting thing that's happened here in a long while. Unbeknownst to both Zack and Mr. Jefferson, Dr. Robert Montauk would be only joining the team at the Gate Guardian observation site for a short while. Not one of them, nor anybody else within the Foundation, could ever guess Montauk's true intentions behind venturing there in the first place. He wanted an audience with the Gate Guardian itself. Approaching the colossal thousand-foot-tall being, Dr. Montauk crossed the threshold of the minimum safe distance from the Guardian. Given the sheer heat of its weapon, hotter than Earth's sun, anything within a kilometer of SCP-001 was at risk of being obliterated, vaporized into atoms if they didn't turn back. Which, through a voice that immediately rang out in Montauk's ears, the Gate Guardian commanded him to do. Leave. Its psychic message boomed. Wait, wait, Dr. Montauk urged, holding up his hands in what would have been a futile defense against the Guardian Sword. I know what you do when people don't listen to your commands, but please, just give me a minute. There was silence. SCP-001 didn't reply. There was nobody else close enough to hear Montauk speak to it. So, he continued. You are impossibly old. We know that much about you. And because of that, you must have seen things that we can't even begin to imagine, much less fully comprehend. But I've come a very long way to request that you impart some information to me, if you can." He paused again, as if waiting for a reply that never came. The Gate Guardian merely stood in the same defensive, unwavering stance. Tell me, please, how much do you know about the Scarlet King? By this point in time, although the Foundation was yet to realize, Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly going insane. His investigations into an anomalous entity known as the Scarlet King were gradually corrupting him, as he tried relentlessly to quantify exactly what this entity was and how great of a threat it posed. Little did Montauk realize that, in trying so hard to define and comprehend the being, he was inadvertently fueling its power. The Scarlet King was an interdimensional warmonger, an embodiment of hatred and chaos, and Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly falling under the King's influence. 
Upon hearing the tiny human figure utter his question, the immense gate guardian rebuted with another single word psychic command, one it had never been recorded giving before. Witness! As if his increasing instability and the creeping influence of the Scarlet King hadn't made Montauk feel bad enough, he instantly felt sick. There was a searing pain behind his eyes, like he was staring directly at the sun, accompanied by a nausea that made his head spin. It took a moment of enduring the horrific sensation before he realized what was happening. The Guardian was trying to show him something. Rather than give any information on the Scarlet King verbally, SCP-001 was imparting a psychic vision onto Montauk, a memory of events long past, the answers he sought, a warning, or perhaps all three. The vision showed Montauk a time so long ago that it couldn't ever be forgotten, for there was barely anyone alive to remember it in the first place. It was eons in the past, long before the comparatively recent dawn of humanity, a time only spoken of in the Dust and Blood Tablet an artifact of the Davite civilization, some of the earliest worshippers of the Scarlet King himself. And there, marching up to the entrance of Eden, was the crimson-clad Eldritch Abomination and a horde of horrors with him. According to the story recorded in the Dust and Blood Tablet, this would have been much earlier in the life of the Scarlet King, perhaps even before he assumed his now infamous title. Back then, he would most likely have been known as his original name of Kanthrak, one of multiple siblings born when the Tree of Life was planted, and thus created all life in the multiverse. But, being the only one of his siblings cursed with awareness, knowing the pain his existence brought him, Kamhrak would eventually set out on his lifelong mission to destroy all of existence across every dimension. And he started by killing his siblings, consuming them to claim their power for himself. Around this time in prehistory, the being that would one day become known as Scarlet King didn't quite possess the power that he would several millennia later. Although that's not to say he was an unformidable force of destruction, fueled by his singular hatred for existence. His vow to destroy extended to the Tree of Life that had caused him to be, along with the tree's creator and all of their creation. In other words, everything in the multiverse, all of creation, if you will. So what was the Scarlet King doing there so long ago, at the dimensional doorway protected by the Gate Guardian? Well, beyond the boundary, between it and the rest of the infinite multiverse, lay the supposed Garden of Eden. While it is unknown if it is, in fact, the same Eden referred to in the Book of Genesis is up for debate, especially among the Foundation. But at a glance, even through the gate, it certainly does look like a paradise. The space is filled with lush vegetation of astronomical size, populated by a number of beings that seem to resemble the Gate Guardian itself. And there, protected by its watchful caretaker, are two trees. One is thought to be the Tree of Knowledge, that Eve was tricked into eating an apple from during the Book of Genesis. The other, however, bears an unknown type of fruit, and is widely believed to be the Tree of Life. Now back in the modern age, there's never been a conclusive link between the Tree of Life mentioned by the Davites and their barbaric civilization's legends regarding the creation of the Scarlet King, but the fact that so long ago he and his most feared generals were bearing down on the Gate Guardian's position, defending a garden where there was known to be a tree of that description, well, it all seems rather conclusive now. Alongside Kahrarak were six of his seven daughters, each one of them a fearsome abomination much like their destructive father. As they approached, not one needed to exchange any words with their angelic protector of Eden. The Gate Guardian knew what these monsters were here for. They would stop at nothing to pass through his gate and uproot the Tree of Life, the progenitor of all living beings in all of existence. Even though it was early in Kathrak's career as the rampaging interdimensional warlord he so is, he was as steadfast as ever in his goal to annihilate every corner of creation, every dimension, every parallel plane of reality, every single pocket of existence across infinity. They'd all come undone if he burned the tree of life, pulled it out at the roots, and splintered it until nothing remained. To the once and future Scarlet King, that the same tree had led to his own tortured existence, it was the source of his suffering, and it had to be destroyed. The only thing standing in his way was a figure as colossal as Kamrak himself, 
wielding a flaming sword. Leave! Boomed the psychic voice of the Gate Guardian. It was like a doorman standing before a group of rowdy teenagers trying to force their way into a movie theater. Except these rowdy teens were the Scarlet King, his horrifying daughters, and the forces he had already amassed since its creation. The horde stood ready, waiting for the commands of their king, who they thought would gladly lead the charge as they marched on the Garden of Eden to begin the destruction of existence. But that's not what happened. Usually, the Scarlet King would never shy away from a fight, preferring to lead the charge when it came to a slaughter. Instead, he commanded his first daughter, Atibet, to commence the first attack on the protector who stood in their path. On her foul father's word, Atibet took her horde and charged at the Guardian. What she and her forces lacked in numerical advantage, Atibet more than made up for in her knowledge of war. She hungered for it, sought dominion. That was her seal, after all. And yet, in the face of this impending onslaught, the Gate Guardian remained still, rooted to the same spot it had as always, and would always be standing in. A number of Ativik's minions burst into flames, the very fabric of their crude form separated on a molecular level as they were effortlessly rendered into nothingness. Still, the Gate Guardian hadn't appeared to move an inch, had exerted no energy, despite the damage it had done to Ativik and her forces in defense of Eden. As his first daughter screeched and howled in despair at the decimation of her horde, her children, the Scarlet King decided he needed to better understand his opponent. With a wave of his clawed crimson hand, the King commanded his next daughter, Aghor, to send forth her own army. In a tidal wave of nightmarish creatures, Aghor sent her horrific children into battle. She possessed a far greater quantity to do battle on her father's behalf. Perhaps Aghor even believed that was the Scarlet King's plan. With a greater number of her forces over her sisters, maybe she would be able to overwhelm the Guardian. But even as her own children began to be vaporized the closer that they got to the gate, Aghor had no idea she was little more than a pawn being sacrificed so that Kanra could learn more about his imposing angelic enemy. Another of the Scarlet King's daughters, a being known as Anhwit, was the next called up to contribute to the unfolding battle. Although, to call it a battle undersells just how easily the Gate Guardian seemed to be eliminating the oncoming forces without even moving. While an outwardly frail-seeming creature, Anhui's primary strength over her sisters was a proficiency in magic, her innate ability to warp and reshape reality around her. It was that power that had caused her father to be wary of her, viewing Anhui's abilities as a threat to his leadership. And so, Kantrak had her crippled and all her children, leaving them unable to overthrow him, but still loyal to their king. Obeying her father's command, perhaps out of the same loyalty or fear that he would harm her and her children further if she disobeyed, Anhuit unfurled her magic. She reshaped the world around them, making it so that the passage of time moved so much slower. And that was what revealed to the Scarlet King his enemy's greatest strength in combat. The Gate Guardian had so far been able to obliterate both Ativik and now Akhor's forces without seeming to move, but it wasn't by standing still. It was moving, just much faster than the blink of Scarlet King's multiple eyes. Now that Anhuit's magic had slowed the passage of time, the Gate Guardian could be seen doing battle. As Akhor's atrocities spilled towards the Angel to try and overwhelm it, it effortlessly blocked the oncoming attacks with its sword. Everything the Flaming Blade connected with instantly evaporated, bursting into atoms as they were practically cleaved out of existence by the Gate Guardian's mighty weapon. Even with time slowed to a crawl, the towering Winged Protector of Eden only appeared to be moving at an average speed. But when time flowed normally, without Anhuit manipulating reality, the Guardian was simply too fast to be observed. Resisting the urge to dive headfirst into the fight himself, the Scarlet King knew it would likely lead to his untimely demise. He refused to accept that. It could not happen. But he still had yet to amass the strength he would need as he continued his ascent. So while time was slowed to a crawl and the Gate Guardian was still engaged in combat with Aghoros forces, he turned to another of his remaining daughters, Adista. If the Scarlet King and his forces couldn't get past the Guardian, they could still try to get to the Tree of Life while the Protector's focus was diverted. Adisan unleashed a wave of pestilence, sickness, and disease spewing from her in a cloud of vapor, heading straight towards the Angelic Garden and Eden's entrance beyond. 
The Scarlet King knew this latest attack wouldn't phase or weaken the Gate Guardian. He hoped the foul smog would instead pass through the gateway itself into the garden. As Adisat sent forth her power, blood and ash soaked the landscape around them. All the plants outside the entrance to Eden withered and died, shriveling and decomposing as the disgusting fog rolled towards the gate. It washed over the Guardian, whose form only seemed to glow brighter as he repelled the pestilence. It was as if it didn't even need to think about it, still focused on finishing off the rest of the oncoming army. As its glow intensified, so did the fiery sword that the Gate Guardian swung with ease and finesse. Flames burst from the blade, the encroaching fumes catching fire along with the air itself. It ignited in a wave of fire, a defensive inferno that repelled this latest attack. But for a brief few moments, while time stayed slow, before Anhuit's hold on reality inevitably broke, the king had sent forth Atilif. Of all his spawn, she was the most reserved, keeping mostly to herself, never speaking. She and her children could change their faces and forms, shift into anything or anyone, and walk undetected through the multiverse. And now her father was employing her incredible stealth abilities to slip behind enemy lines, while the Gate Guardian was finishing off the remaining onslaught from Kanhrak's other daughters. It was as Atilif drew near, creeping unseen closer and closer to the entrance, keeping the Scarlet King out of Eden, that the Guardian seemed to pause. It slowly, ominously turned its huge head, tilting until it was looking directly at Atilif. If its expression could be seen, maybe the Gate Guardian would almost be impressed that someone was able to sneak past it. After all, it was a feat that no other being in creation could ever hope to accomplish. But then again, with its steadfast conviction and dedication to its protective duty, maybe it would have looked upon Atilif with anger. With a cleaving swing of its scorching sword, the Gate Guardian unfurled a tidal wave of fire that engulfed everything around it. Not just Atilif, but Ativik, Aghor, and Adista, all the king's daughters that had attacked so far, along with every one of their own children, were instantly obliterated. They were all reduced to empty, vacant spaces where they had once been, their atoms separated by the searing swing of the Guardian's weapon. The devastating blow by his adversary did little to deter the Scarlet King from his mission. He was still set on destroying the Tree of Life, and no loss was too great in his pursuit of destroying existence. He barely cared that four of his own daughters had just been unmade by the Guardian. Anhuit was still there, clinging on to time as if it were a thrashing animal. The Scarlet King could simply make her restore her fallen sisters and their forces. He had lost nothing, but had held back for too long, and slowly drew his own weapon out of thin air. Wielding a sword that was as blood-soaked as the Guardian's was hot, the Scarlet King locked blades with the one being standing in their way. Both the ancient Angelic Defender and the attacking Eldritch Abomination were evenly matched. Every one of their vicious strikes against the other met with an equally strong parry. A weapon of extreme, all-consuming heat blocked swipes from a sharp, serrated edge that matched the deep red that would be forever synonymous with Kankrak. The force of their two swords clashing and striking each other was so great that it rippled out from their one-on-one -on -one fight. The landscape around them was flattened wiped clean of any remaining plant life that hadn't already been destroyed by the forces of the king's daughters. Despite having acquired nowhere near the power he would thousands of years after this fight, the Scarlet King was still a formidable force in single combat, and yet the Gate Guardian seemed incapable of tiring or weakening, still standing strong against the onslaught. Even after wiping multiple armies out with its flaming sword, the Guardian was still able to hold its own against the Scarlet King, who was furious, enraged at being so close to the Tree of Life, yet unable to get past his angelic adversary. He'd need to be stronger, faster, even more ruthless than the warlord he already was. Despite Anhuit slowing down time, the King and the Guardian were at a stalemate. Time. That was it. The Scarlet King needed more time. Withdrawing from the fight, he realized that this was a battle that could not be won by sheer brute force alone. His mission to destroy all creation, to get to the Tree of Life, would take cunning, deception, and more time. If he let it, the Gate Guardian could easily kill Kantra, 
its flaming weapon could cleave him out of existence, and that would end the king's torment. But it wouldn't be enough. A death would be unsatisfying knowing that the rest of existence would go on after he was gone. The Scarlet King couldn't accept that. It wasn't enough. So he did the one thing nobody would expect of him. He made a deal with the Gate Guardian. It was an action still fueled by his infinite hatred for all existence, his yearning for total chaos. The Scarlet King knew that one day, an event would arrive where the Guardian and the other beings like it in the Garden of Eden would spill forth and deliver judgment on this world. And when that rapture happened, the Tree of Life would be undefended. The Scarlet King bartered with the Guardian that he would retreat for the time being so he could spend eons amassing more and more power. Then, when the fateful day arrived, the Gate Guardian would allow him into Eden to destroy the Tree of Life, while it and its brethren were busy conducting the Rapture. Halting their fight, the Scarlet King offered a Crimson Claw to the Gate Guardian's burning hand. Returning to reality from the intense vision, still feeling sick at what he had witnessed, Robert Montauk looked up at the still, silent form of the Gate Guardian. Did you do it? He yelled, desperate to know more through his obsession with the Scarlet King. Did you tell him yes? Did you make a deal? There was no answer from the Guardian, just a single word that echoed through Montauk's fractured mind. Leave. There's an app for that. Wait, hold on, I'm Steve Jobs! Come on, no, stop it! It was a phrase so ubiquitous in the early days of the smartphone craze that it's hard to believe Apple actually has trademarked. It was a testament to a simple and immutable truth about the world these new touchscreen phones were creating. No matter how strange and obscure the need, there would be an app to fulfill it. Perhaps you remember iBeer, the app that allowed you to pretend you were drinking a tall glass of beer, for some reason. There was Car Matey, an app that reminded you where you parked your car, in a pirate voice. And who could forget I Am Bread, a surreal game about controlling a sentient slice of bread on a quest to become toast. But there's one app out there somewhere on the market that you probably didn't download. And if you did, well, you have our sincerest apologies. Because even seeing this video pop out onto your feed probably sent a chill down your spine. Well, if that chill ever even left. Take it from one gentleman whose life took a very strange turn after downloading a certain app that the SCP Foundation calls SCP-1471. Because the sentiment, there's an app for that, doesn't exclude experiencing mortal terror. Joe Lillis, an insurance salesman from Milwaukee, had just gone through another atrocious date. After a mediocre meal and an uncomfortable 35 minutes of inane babble, sensing the whole time that she really wasn't that interested, his date excused himself to take a quick phone call outside. Sadly for Joe, she never returned, leaving him to pick up the check. Of all the many words you could use to describe poor Joe Lillis, the most pertinent would be lonely. Ever since Carol, his wife of 10 years, had passed away in a freak accident, he'd been trying to find some kind of way to fill the void. They'd been high school sweethearts, intent on spending the rest of their lives with one another. As fate would have it, only Carol would get that tainted luxury. Joe would be forced to endure life after the joy of living had run its course. He only hoped he might be lucky enough to find love again. However, Joe was on the wrong side of 40, and as so many others his age were already hitched, he could feel his options going out one by one. Would he be destined to live out the rest of his days alone? Joe didn't feel like spending the back half of his life catching reruns of Seinfeld and tending to his fish. He needed to get out there. And thankfully, like the rest of us, he lived in the internet age. He had more apps, websites, online services, and hot Russian singles in his area than he knew what to do with. So surely one would have the right person for him. He tried them all. Tinder, Hinge, Match.com, Plenty of Fish, eHarmony, Bumble, Zeusk, OkCupid, FriendFinder, Deeply Lonely Singles with Low Expectations.com, and so much more. However, all it seemed to achieve was setting him up for more disappointment. None of the dates he'd managed to get ever resulted in anything getting serious. Heck, it was a minor miracle if he even managed to get any of them on a second date. Was this it? Was this his life now? Had he only ever gotten one shot at love, and the grasping claws of fate yanked it away from him without a second thought? 
Would life continue on the hamster wheel of loneliness? Sleeping, getting up, eating, working, and sleeping again. Every day getting somehow both faster and slower as life trudged on to a disappointing yet inevitable conclusion. What a terrible fate to find yourself trapped in. Whenever Joe started feeling maudlin like this, he knew it was time to get proactive again. Maybe the right woman was out there. There were billions of them, after all. Surely at least one of them would be the perfect person for him. He just needed the perfect app. He'd burned through all of the most reputable apps already, and was now perusing some of the slightlier, seedier options, most of which were likely data mining fronts from the Vulcans. However, as generic app after generic app passed, something different caught his eye. The icon was a smiling cartoon dog, and its name was Mallow, version 1.0.0. This gave him a little chuckle. At the very least, it was very different branding from the rest of the dating apps he'd seen. Maybe it had just been sorted into the wrong section of the app store. He decided he'd check it out and take a look at the app's description. The description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Well, it certainly provoked Joe's curiosity at the very least. He did want to banish his feelings of loneliness, and seeing as the app was free and apparently had no ads, he'd surely be foolish to not at least give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? He began the installation, and only then noticed that the app had no listed developer. It took up 9.8 megabytes of memory, which he wasn't tech-savvy enough to see any issues with. More than anything, Joe was just enticed by the prospect of finally having another chance at companionship with Mallow. After all, it is the next social substitute, whatever that means. However, Joe's excitement was quickly quashed when he hit the home screen button and noticed that the icon for the app never actually materialized. Strange. He checked the App Store portal again and saw that, according to them, the app had completely downloaded. What gives? Was it a glitch, or was Mallow actually just malware? Either way, he was disheartened by the fact that this immaterial app certainly wouldn't be getting him any companionship. Or so he thought, anyway. Joe was used to disappointment by now, so he didn't take it too personally. He decided to just play out the rest of his evening on autopilot, making himself some soup, doing the laundry, watching more Seinfeld reruns, taking a cold shower, and preparing to cry himself to sleep again. Mallow was already becoming a distant memory, just like all the deceptive sources of hope. But one strange thing happened that disrupted Joe's finely tuned evening routine. He received a text message. This was incredibly strange, because nobody ever seemed to text him. The last text he got was from Carol just before her accident, so it was almost surreal to hear that alert sound now, after everything that happened. He checked and saw that the text was an image attachment sent from an unknown number. Perplexed yet curious, he decided to open it. His curiosity soon gave way to a kind of melancholy nostalgia when he saw that the photo was of his and Carol's favorite cafe in town. They'd spent many a morning there, back when she was alive, treating themselves to a nice cup of coffee and perhaps a croissant. Just seeing it again caused an involuntary smile to spread across his face. It never even occurred to him, as it probably would have to others, that this could be seen as a little creepy. He hadn't frequented the bakery since Carol died. How would anyone even know that this place held any significance for him? Was it a stalker, a ghost, or just a spooky coincidence? None of these thoughts even crossed Joe's mind. He was just grateful for the surprising reminder of the happiness he'd once had. For the next couple hours, things seemed lighter. He went about his evening, checking the photo every so often and smiling, until eventually he found himself in bed, still looking into the glow of his phone. It was such a beautiful little cafe. Then he froze. He noticed something in the picture. It'd been there the whole time, but only now he was seeing rather than just looking. It was in the corner, staring through the glass of the cafe's door. So faint, he almost wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light. It was a face. 
Well, not a face, more like a skull. Not a human, not anywhere near human. Long, slender, and canine, with protruding fangs and vacant white eyes. The pure white of the skull was buried in a nest of thick black hair. It looked like it was crouching behind the door, looking out and grinning, whatever the hell it was. Just seeing it change the entire tone of the picture. It was no longer a simple reminder of bygone joy. Now all that was radiating out of that image was a palpable sense of dread. Was someone playing some kind of awful prank on him? Just then he was jogged from his contemplation by another alert. A new message from the same number as before. With great hesitation, he hovered his thumb over the push notification and clicked. That's when everything got a lot worse. It was a photo of a bus stop. Not just any bus stop, of course. It was stop C16, the one that Joe always took to get to work. It looked like it was taken relatively early in the morning, but nobody was there. Well, not quite nobody. There was that figure again. It stood at full height, behind the partially frosted glass that makes up the back of the bus stop. The same large black humanoid shape, with a white grinning dog skull where the face should be. Something about it terrified him on such a primal level, like the way our lizard brain reacts to some ancient apex predator. And whatever this thing was, it clearly knew something about him. How else could it stage all these photos? Joe got out of bed and looked out of the window, down onto his dark front street. Empty, thankfully. But after this surprise nightmare, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed a kitchen knife from downstairs and placed it on his bedside cabinet, right next to his phone, with 911 on speed dial. Joe Lillis, a 43-year-old man, slept with the lights on that night for the first time in over 30 years. Sadly for him, the nightmare was just beginning. The next morning, Joe woke up unharmed, but he wasn't pleased to see that he'd gotten several more texts in his sleep. There was one taken outside of the local insurance company office where he worked. The strange creature with the skull for a face was looming around the corner, peering at the camera with its lipless grin, like it was mocking him. Another photo was taken at the local supermarket where Joe did most of his grocery shopping. The frame was centralized on the cereal aisle, bordered on both sides by walls of garish mascots endlessly repeated. Down at the far end of the aisle was a looming dark figure with that cold canine skull where a human face should be. There were a few more, but worst of all was the last one. It was taken at the cemetery. In the foreground, a headstone reading, Carol Lillis, beloved wife and daughter. Joe was horrified to see that skull-faced beast was rising up behind his wife's grave, long clawed fingers curling around the top of the headstone. That was the moment that Joe decided to go to the police about all of this, before things got even more out of hand. He called an Uber to get down to the station. He certainly didn't feel like he was going anywhere near his regular bus stop after last night. He showed the photos he'd been sent so far to an officer posted at the station, and they agreed that there was certainly something strange about it. While the behavior undeniably bordered on harassment, it hadn't yet delved into criminal territory, so he would sadly be on his own until then. The best they could do was stay in touch and kept abreast of any new developments. The only sage advice they could give him was not to delete the photos, as they could always be used as evidence in court later if things escalated. This was literally the last result that Joe wanted out of this. Considering how bizarre and threatening things were getting already, he really didn't want to find out what escalation looked like in this case. But what else could he do but carry on, just trying to exercise as much caution as he could in these strange new circumstances? He went to work and tried his best to stay productive, despite the fact that every three or so hours, a new photo would arrive. Places that he liked to sit in the local parks, stores he'd frequent, restaurants he liked to eat at. The nightmare skeleton dog thing would be standing in all of them, just mugging for the camera. On one hand, every time he looked at one of the photos, Joe felt like he was giving this freak exactly what they wanted. On the other hand, how could he possibly look away? What if he missed something that could save his life? It carried on much like that until later in the evening. Joe may have not been a genius, but he was no fool either. He'd seen too many of those seedy true crime documentaries about kidnapping to take his normal route home. He took a real detour, frequently checking over his shoulder the entire time. 
Much to his relief, he didn't see anything out of place. Good. When he got home, he locked every door and bolted every window. Nothing would be getting the jump on him tonight. That's when the next picture came in. A photograph of Joe's empty office cubicle, with the bony face of the creature looming over the divider with a grin. He could feel his heart pounding away in his chest just looking at it. How did this thing get around like this? How was it able to infiltrate everywhere in his entire goddamn life? Suddenly, he felt a smile spreading across his face. This freak had just messed up big time. Before all these creepy photos had been taken in public places, but the one taken in his office? Oh, this crossed the line into trespassing. The police would have to do something about it now. It had given him an ace up his sleeve. That confidence faded a few hours later when he received another photo. This time, it was the skull-faced monster just standing on the sidewalk. The sidewalk that Joe remembered walking on his covert alternative route. He could feel himself break into a cold sweat. It seemed, whoever this was, he really did hold no secrets from them. Now more than ever, Joe didn't feel safe in his own home. So you can only imagine how he felt when a few hours later, he received a photo of the skull-faced stalker standing right outside his own front door, staring into the camera. It sent him rushing to the window again to check outside, but of course, nobody was there. The next day, when he called the police and updated them on the situation, they told him that they were doing all they could. The best thing he could possibly do was to remain calm, but vigilant. He needed to keep an eye on the photos being sent to him, so he could notify them if ever he was in any immediate danger. This put poor Joe's paranoia at a fever pitch. Even when he went to work, surrounded by his co-workers, by witnesses, he could scarcely tear his eyes away from his phone. He was a slave to the photos, forever waiting for the next one, only to experience crushing regret when the photo actually arrived. It looked like it was taken moments before it was sent to him. Joe saw himself looking at his own phone in his office cubicle, with that huge skull-faced figure looming behind him. He screamed out loud upon seeing it, and turned to see if anything was behind him. But of course, there was nothing there. The police inspected the office, talked to potential witnesses, and analyzed the photo. It showed no signs of any photographic manipulation, but there were also no witnesses around the office who claimed to see anything strange that day. There was also no security camera footage in the last several days that showed this figure coming in or out. Joe Lillis started to feel like he was going insane, and perhaps he was. But that didn't change the tangible and ever-present feeling that he was in great danger. He didn't come into work the next day. He'd received more photos like that in the night, of himself, taken in real time, with that skull-faced freak looming. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go anywhere anymore. He just didn't feel safe out there. How could he, with all this madness unfolding? There was a time where he could have said something like, at least it only seems confined to my phone. He might have even suspected that it had something to do with that strange Mallow app he downloaded a few days prior that hadn't seemed to do anything. But this situation had evolved since then. He wasn't just seeing the creature in photos anymore. It was here. He kept seeing quick flashes of it on the other side of windows, in reflections, in the corner of his eyes, always darting away if ever he turned towards it. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was here just for him. He just knew. The police couldn't help. Nobody could help. Joe just sat in the corner of his bedroom, clutching his kitchen knife, afraid to close his eyes. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. We know one thing for sure. Joe Lillis never felt truly alone ever again. He always had his new friend waiting just out of sight. And if ever you're feeling lonesome and decide to download Malow version 1.0.0 yourself, then you'll never feel lonely again, either. Now go check out SCP-1025 Encyclopedia of Common Diseases and Worst Ways to Die SCP Edition for more SCPs that'll creep into your mind and give you nightmares.